Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the January 23rd, 2024 meeting of the Santa Monica City Council. And if we could stand and uh, Councilman, no, Councilwoman, uh, Vice Chair Negretti, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk, can we have the roll call, please? Councilmember Zwick? Here. Councilmember Parra? Here. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Tarosis? Absent at the moment. Uh, Councilman De La Torre. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete. Here. And Mayor Brock. Here. Okay. Next item on the agendas of the Levine Act. Um, City Attorney, do you want to read that into the record? Yes, Mayor. Uh, this is a new item now. Uh, this item is required to appear on the council agenda now at near the beginning of the meeting. Under government code section 84308, city officials must disclose on the record any campaign contribution, which also includes loans, exceeding an aggregate of $250 that a party or participant to a proceeding involving a license, permit, contract, or other entitlement has made to them in the 12 months prior to the proceeding, prior to uh, today. Uh, officials must recuse themselves from a proceeding if they have willfully or knowingly accepted, solicited, or directed a contribution exceeding an aggregate of $250 in the prior 12 months from either a party to the proceeding or their agents or from a participant if the official knows or has reason to know the participant has a financial interest in the proceeding. And I intend this to be a one-time thing. We won't be repeating that every time. Thank you. Would I now ask any council members if you will be recusing yourselves from any items on the agenda in accordance with the Levine Act. Great. Okay. Then I'll now call public input. Public comment is permitted only on items not on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. State law prohibits the city council from taking any action on items not listed on the agenda, including issues raised under this agenda item. And it looks like we have... Uh, about ten, nine, eight people to speak, but I think there's a duplicate here. So I will call the first five names on the, or I'm sorry, three names on the list. Uh, John Medlam, Jill Hawkins, and Maria Espinoza. If you could all just line up next to the podium. Are we ready? Yes. Happy New Year. Congratulations, we all made it. 54 years ago, I worked with people who put their lives on the line to run for office or vote. I never thought I'd see that here in this country. So we now have guard dogs, increased police protection. It's a sad day in our history, but we go forward. So, Mr. Mayor, city council members, city manager and clerk and city attorney, it's time for my broken record. Again, what is the number one priority of all governments? Public safety. What is the number one priority of all governments? Public safety. So I'm gonna add two more little gizmos to my little speech today. What if we had district voting? So instead of having to spend $50,000 of your own money, it might be only 10,000. Think about that. You know, we've had a, a recent cities, they did drop their chart, they did drop their case, and so now they're going to have district voting in other cities. So again, what's there to be afraid of, seriously? What's there to be fearful of public voting by district? You know, there are very few cities in this, country, in this state that do not have district voting. So let's go ahead and do it. Finally, my third little item, which we've been hearing constantly of, I've been here for 27 years, and it seems almost like another broken record. I think you use the phrase homelessness. When I first considered living here, and this is in 1987, I came over to what is now called Reed Park. At that time, I had young children. And I was thinking about moving to Santa Monica in 1987. It was then called Lincoln Park. I came over on a Saturday 
I said, there's no way in the world I'm bringing my children over here. So I came back in 1996. It had improved. So I moved here, and I've been here for 27 years. Reed Park has improved the last two years, so congratulations. Thank you very much, Mr. Medlin. I appreciate it. Next speaker is uh, Jill Hawkins. Hold off. I have a video that was going to play, so if you could wait to start my time. You want me to start the video now? Yeah, that'd be fine. And you know, I realize this, this is stuff that you guys can't do as a city council, but I want everyone to be aware of this, so maybe you can reach out to Senator Allen about this. But this is the video, and then I'll talk afterwards. You do realize that the video is part of your time? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Peter. What are you doing home from school? They sent me home. Measles. That's either measles or a strange case of red freckles. You have got a temperature. They told me 101.1. What's the record? Never mind. Oh, are you sure it's the measles? Well, he certainly got all the symptoms. A slight temperature, a lot of dots, and a great big smile. A great big smile? No school for a few days. Say hello to my dotted son for me. Tell him I'll bring him some comic books and I'll see you later, dear. Okay, honey, bye. Boy, this is the life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. If you have to get sick, you sure can't beat the measles. That's right. No medicine. Inside or out. Like shots, I mean. Don't even mention shots. Yuck! <laughs> measles, measles, measles. Well, all the kids have now had the measles. So have I. Well, I had them years ago. Looks like the Bradys are finished with the measles. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it. You're not through yet. Alice, don't tell me you're coming down with the measles. Oh, I hope so. I'd hate to think I was just learning how to blush at my age. <laughs> so this is what, what we thought of measles. Death rate of measles in 1960, when you guys all had it, is 1 in 500,000. We're discriminating and segregating against healthy, unvaccinated kids. Um, you know, everyone should have the right to, you know, get the measles, natural immunity that lasts longer. And, you know, if people want to take a shot and they think it will lessen their symptoms, but we can't, we got to stand for all individuals. We cannot be segregating, discriminating based on vaccination status. Products need to work for the person using them. So I'm asking you, please reach out to Senator Allen. I've had a meeting with him recently and he would love to hear from you. Let's just get the kids back in school. We have hepatitis B and HIV kids um, in school have a right to go to school and there's laws protecting them, but we're kicking out healthy and vaccinated kids for, that are not vaccinated and not carrying any illnesses. So I just want to get these kids back in school and, you know, treat everyone the same. Thank you very much, Ms. Hawkins. Our next speaker is Maria Espinoza. And before you start, Ms. Espinoza, I'm going to call three more names. Uh, I will be doing translation, so she will read her statement and then I'll translate. Correct, and she'll receive four minutes. Uh, Jonathan Foster, Jerry Rubin, and Mike Russell. Hold on one second. Buenas tardes, Consejo Municipal. Mi nombre es María Espinosa y he sido trabajadora en el JW Mario Lemerigo de Santa Mónica por 17 años. Soy residente en Santa Mónica. El sábado pasado, trabajadores y miembros de la comunidad formaron un picket line en el Meridian Delfina, aquí en Santa Mónica, y circularon una petición instando al Consejo Municipal a actuar según las recomendaciones de la Comisión de la Verdad sobre varios temas de los hoteles de Santa Mónica, celebrada en noviembre pasado. Como sabrán, por Los Ángeles Times, Le Meridian Delfina es parte de un escándalo que involucra el uso de refugiados sin alojamiento por parte de los hoteles para reemplazar a los trabajadores durante las recientes huelgas. El Delfina y otros hoteles son actualmente objeto de una investigación por parte de la Comisión Laboral de, de California y el fiscal del distrito, George Cascón. Instamos al Consejo a tomar medidas sobre este asunto. Thank you, María. Good evening, councilmen and women. My name is Maria Espinosa, and I have been a housekeeper at the JW Marriott Le Marigold for 17 years. I'm a renter in Santa Monica. This past Saturday, workers and members of the community picketed the Le Meridian Delfina here in Santa Monica and circulated a petition urging the city council to act and on the recommendations from the true commissions about various issues at the Santa Monica hotels held last November. 
As you may know from the Los Angeles Times, the La Meridian Delfina is a part of a scandal involving hotels use of unhoused refugees to replace workers during recent strikes. The Delfina and other hotels are currently the subject of an investigation by the California Labor Commissioner and District Attorney George Gascon. So we urge you, the council, to take action about this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Espinoza. Jonathan Foster. Hello, it's, does it work? Does it work? Hello, hello. Uh, it's Jonathan Foster. I have to make two corrections starting with this. I had two, you, last uh, one Sunday and one on Monday asked me if I was Jewish. I didn't say a word back because I, after 23 years of being asked, I said, no, they, they walk away from me. I don't mean a damn thing when I am not Jewish all of a sudden. And I still love them. Some guy got hit with a belt buckle in Beverly Hills. And what they should do with this guy is take him to the back of the police station and fucking shoot him. I don't care. This guy, anybody hurting Jewish people? So that's what I said. I wanted to be clear. I didn't mean the Jewish guy that got hit with the belt. I meant the 44-year-old who was arrested and released on no-cash bail, Jarus J. Salagi. Uh, the Beverly Hills Police Department says he's homeless. And I, I just think this is despicable. But then I thought about, well, what would Jesus say? Did Jesus want to shoot him? Or would Jesus forgive him? I think Jesus would forgive him. So I'm, I'm admitting I'm wrong. The next thing I want to say, though, maybe someday I'll talk about that if I got a few seconds here. I made another mistake. I had forgotten that uh, Lana Negretti had come by my drum set. We changed, exchanged elbows. She also came by on Tuesday the 26th after Christmas. I forgot that David White also came by. We talked a couple different times. So, of course, Phil has been here twice, and we, he came to my drum set and spoke to me. I thought it was very nice. Also, past city manager Rod Gould said hello, the guy that triggered the Oaks Initiative scrutiny stuff. And I, I wrote down here, I wanted to say, God bless the mayor of Santa Monica, and I'm willing to try you out, and we'll see, you know, how you do. But I'm willing to, uh, you know, uh, be positive and supportive. You, you've been you've been great, and I uh, stick my foot in my mouth. So, uh, welcome to be mayor and the vice Thank you, Mr. Foster, and Happy New Year. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jerry Rubin, but Jerry, before you start, I'm going to cross the last names on the list. Uh, Rebecca Russell and Brian Gobin, or Gobin. You can start now, Jerry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you, uh, Mayor Brock, Vice Mayor Negretti, Honorable City Council members, City manager, city attorney, city clerk, all the city staff, and fellow Santa Monicans. First of all, I'd like to say I'm very glad that the uh, Fairmont Miramar and the union have come together with a tentative agreement. I support them both. I hope other hotels can work out win win solutions because it's very, very important. Second of all, I uh, do want to uh, announce that we'd love to have people coming to the Urban Forest Task Force meetings, as well as all the other task force and board and commission meetings, because they're really important and we should support them. The next meeting will be at the multipurpose room of the Santa Monica Library tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. And hope people can come out and show your love for our trees. And the other thing I wasn't planning on saying, but I do want to say now, I'm glad uh, my parents uh, got me vaccinated against polio when I was a kid. And I think it's very important that we listen to the medical people and we take care, and I'm glad that we're doing that. And the last thing I just want to do is wish my loving brother, Martin Rubin, who worked to help close the airport, it's his uh, 77th birthday today, and I wish, publicly wish him a happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. Happy New Year, and happy birthday to your brother. Next speaker is Mike Russell. Uh, thank you. Um, and my wife actually donated her time to me as well, so I don't know if that was reflected. You actually can't donate time for okay. um, 
for number for public input, general public input, only for other items. Okay, um, I'll try to go quick and she may finish my talk. Uh, thank you guys very much for giving me a chance to talk. I'm an orthopedic fellow over at UCLA, came here from the heart of the Midwest, uh, so a bit of a shell shock to come to the big city of LA, the bright lights here. Missing the cornfields and my deer hunting a bit, but really enjoying life here in Santa Monica. Um, in terms of uh, this transition, we've really loved being able to walk from our apartment. This is Adelaide, by the way, and this is Everest. Um, you can say something in a sec. Uh, we love being able to walk from our apartment down to the beach to do our shopping without ever setting foot in our car, to visit our friends via a quick bike ride. Um, unfortunately for us, we've been here six months, and it really wasn't long before this. Uh, I'll give you this child, uh, Becca. It wasn't long before this utopian ideal that we pictured here was completely disrupted and really revealed its dystopian side. So I wanted to chat about that real quick. Our first week in Santa Monica, we're walking our one and three year old daughters down the Third Street Promenade, so the prime shopping area here. We were greeted by the sight of a fully naked man masturbating on the sidewalk outside of Lululemon. When asked by the public safety officer to cover up and move on, it became extremely aggressive, causing most passerbyers to be quite nervous about the safety of their surroundings. I wish I could say this was a one-off experience, but this is quite tragically not the case. I've personally seen a tourist at Santa Monica Pier be punched in the head completely at random and his belongings stolen from him when he stumbled to the ground. I've had an actively psychotic homeless man spit in my face and attempt to cost my family and I on the Santa Monica beach, leaving my daughters and wife in tears and afraid of their safety at a spot that we had previously cherished. We pay a good portion of our salary each month for rent for a pretty humble appearing two bedroom apartment and yet, in spite of this, routinely wake up in the middle of the night to homeless men and women roaming our alleyway, screaming obscenities as they beat against our parking garage door. As I walk from our apartment on 9th and Wilshire to the UCLA Santa Monica Hospital, you routinely encounter fresh human feces littering the sidewalk, and the smell of urine is almost omnipresent in the doorways of abandoned business fronts. Talking with my friends and coworkers, my experiences are certainly not unique, and these stories have opened a great... Thank you, sir. Your time is up, but your wife can carry on. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Oh, okay. That's okay. You go ahead okay. and talk. Um, yeah, I wasn't planning on speaking, but it's just really hard having a three-year-old who's scared to go outside. And we love being here, and we love the people, and I know that everyone has a hard story, and that... Life is hard, and I care for those who don't have a home, but it's just so hard every time we walk outside, and my daughter is crying and doesn't want to go outside, even to the park. So I would just love for you guys to be having conversations of those who are just screaming and yelling profanities, and people who do try to attack my husband and my daughter is crying. Um, just something that could be put into place for those people who are really just verbally aggressive. Thank you. The only thing I'll add to her, I did a survey. Sir. Sorry, I, I did a survey of our neighborhood. Um, I surveyed political affiliation, voting ideologies. Ninety percent of people said that the homeless situation is unacceptable. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Brian Gobin or Gobin. 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 Tell me when you're ready. You're ready. All right, great. So uh, my name is Brian Gobin. I'm a resident here. And the common theme is public safety. So I want to start on three items, cost, coverage, and service. So I looked at the numbers. We are nine square miles, actually less. It costs $100 million for the police department. That is $11 million, over $11 million per square mile each year. And that's pretty high. That is incredibly high. And when I look at salary levels, I see sergeants making $350,000 total play plus benefits on top. That's an extraordinary amount of money when you compare it to the, I would say, almost 600 school teachers in the district that are making, on average, about $120,000. The sergeant's making three times more. His education is far less. And again, I have respect for all of the officers. I have officers in my family and plenty of military veterans as well, including my father and my grandfather. But again, this cost is incredibly high. We're starting off with base salaries of 120, but by the time every officer comes at the end of the year, it comes out to about 200 on average. $200,000 when the median household income is only 108,000 in Santa Monica, and per capita is 89,000. 
So the officer, average officer, B cops, 200,000. Now let's talk about coverage. What is not covered? The promenade's not covered. The pier is not covered. The two busiest places in Santa Monica are not covered. The neighborhoods are not patrolled. There are no beat cops walking our neighborhoods. There's no deterrence. Zero. Zero. It's a safe place. But there's zero deterrence. And for the homeless situation, again, it'd be nice to have people walking the neighborhood and finally serviced. In my own case, I got arrested for complaining about the level of service that I received when I was told that we don't enforce the penal code. It's optional here in Santa Monica. Don't call 911 for penal code. You will not get any service. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Govan. That concludes public input for general public input. Before we move on to the next public input um, session, I would just like to ask Council Member Tarosas if she has any recusals to make uh, pursuant to the Living Act for this agenda. Oh, you're not. I do. You do? I do not. Thank Thanks you. for asking. Item two, public input for agenda items under closed session, special agenda items, consent calendar only. No public input is permitted on ordinances for second reading and adoption. And we have two public speakers for this item, uh, Silvamon and Denise Barton. Could you please come up to the podium? Good evening. Honorable Mayor, congratulations to you. City Council, good evening to you too. This is Layla, my grandchild. I'm a 40 year resident of Santa Monica. I've been here a long time. This is a great city to live in. I'm a father of four graduate children, and this is one of the six children, grandchild. Um, Rosa Parks, Cesar Chavez, Martin Luther King Jr., happy birthday Martin, the city council, you are great city council people because I've been very successful in this city and I work very hard. Don't forget the homeless and the disabled. Today is a great day because it's a count, homeless count day. They're out there on the concrete. I'm on my bed and I'm feeling cold and somebody is sleeping on the concrete with so many blankets. He doesn't do it. So don't forget that while everybody is feeling warm and still complaining, there are people out there who are shivering and sometimes they die on the sidewalk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suleiman. Denise Barton. Good evening. For the consent calendar item 5J, I'm glad that you're giving people the opt-out option, but it does nothing for people who live in apartment buildings. I also have to take issue with your rationalization to electromagnetic radiation frequency exposure. Due to neither cell phones or microwaves are on for 24 hours, 365 days a year. As well as using these devices are the choice of the person using them and not being forced upon them. And how many devices emit emitting electromagnetic radio frequency radiation is safe? Do you know? Because the smart meters for electricity are already installed and the parking meters emit electromagnetic radio frequency radiation. Or what about the, e the 5G internet transmitters? Or is the city being paid to run an experiment to see how much electromagnetic radio frequency radiation the body tissue can take? Next on item 5H, I can't understand why you want good guard security for anywhere else in the city, considering the city's really not getting its money's worth at the structures. There are many versions of this. Good guard is parked in the driveway or near the structure, not going into the structure, so GPS shows them at the site, although sometimes someone gets out of the car and taps by the elevator, then goes back into the car. If this is the kind of service the city wants, I not only have to question your vision of keeping the city safe, but again, the city's not getting its money worth from good guard security presently, as well as the businesses, residents, and other property owners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barton. 
That concludes public input under that item. And I'd like to call forward Randy Lockhart. Mr. Mayor, did you want to do agenda management first? It's on your mayor's I, I apologize. Hold on one minute, Brandy. Yes, you're right. I uh, want to inform everyone that item 8A and item 10D have been withdrawn at the request of staff. If you're here or coming to City Hall for to comment on either item, either 8D or 10D, they have been withdrawn at staff's request and will not be heard this evening. 8A. 8A. What did I say the second time? 8A and 10D. Thank you very much for correcting me, council member. Okay, let's move on. We have a proclamation and an exciting proclamation for a very important month in our city and our nation's history. Good evening, Mayor Brock, Mayor Pro Tem Negrete, City Manager White, esteemed council members, city clerk and staff, invited guests and members of the public. My name is Brandi Lockhart. I am a 10 plus year employee of the city of Santa Monica, currently working in the housing division. I joined the Black History Month committee um, back in December 2019, and I am proud to co-lead this year along with several hardworking individuals. When I mention your name, department, and or organization, please stand or wave to the audience briefly. I want to give a special shout out to Taryn Bishop. She's not going to say it. <laughs> and Alvin Ho, who have been meeting with, emailing, teams messaging, or talking to practically every day since December. Thank you to our committee members and other advisors, Kathy Taylor, Cheryl Shavers, David Garnier, Aaron Carr, Fila Diaz, and Lisa Parson, and to Delena Benacama, the former founder lead of the BHM committee, who has been a wealth of information during this passing of the torch. Keep in mind that the staff participation in cultural events, monthly observances, and affinity groups is always optional and primarily a volunteer effort. We would not be able to successfully organize these events without the support of our partner affinity groups, local businesses, and city departments. City Hall, city manager's office, where we'll be kicking off the month on February 1st. We're going to have dancing, food trucks right out front, and the Office of Communications, and of course the Equity office has always been um, very helpful. Public Works, there will be another food truck event, February 7th. Big Blue Bus, February 15th. Cultural Affairs office, who's been super helpful and um, very instrumental in putting on tonight's presentation. Santa Monica Alliance of White Anti-Racists, always the first in line to volunteer. We appreciate you. Police Department, um, Fire Department in 1109. Santa Monica Library, look for their events and film. we're going to be showing the film The Wiz two times on February 29th. The Print Shop and Building Bridges at Bergamot Station. If I forgot anyone, I sincerely apologize and please, please do not hesitate to reach out to me so I can acknowledge on the website. Also on the city's website, you will see a calendar of all our events as well as others around the area as they are announced. We will soon add a video compilation of some of the black organizations here in Santa Monica and their thoughts on this year's Black History Month theme. We still have some slots for Friday available if you want to get on the schedule with Jordan Ellis, our videographer. Invited to collaborate on this project, and if you're here, you can stand or wave. SMC Black Collegians, Parent Connection Group, Santa Monica Black Lives Association, African American Parent Students Staff Support Group, BAYPAC, Black Agenda, and also members of the Ethiopian community. This year we wanted to bring something new, unique, to the City Council meeting and for those watching online. So I want to introduce to you, um, with us today, we have a very special guest presenter. We have actress Jennifer C. Holmes from the Emmy-winning television show, This Is Us. Jennifer was nominated for an International Online Cinema Award for the Best Guest Actress in a Drama Series for her role as Laurel on the show. Thank you for joining us this evening, Jennifer. Good evening, City Council members. <laughs> My name is Jennifer C. Holmes. Tonight, I will be presenting the proclamation of February as Black History Month in the city of Santa Monica with the theme of Black Media and Arts. 
Before I do that, I would like to say a few words about how the arts have impacted my life. When I was just a little girl and watching movies, I was inspired by the faces that look most like mine. From the legendary Cicely Tyson to the iconic Angela Bassett and Holly Berry. Seeing these beautiful and talented women on TV made me feel something that ignited a fire to want to do what they were doing on TV, um, to what they were doing on that screen. And then that want grew into, I must make people feel. I must push humanity forward. I must change perceptions and stereotypes. I must open dialogue. And I must show to any black and brown little boy or girl that anything is possible and no dream is too big just like those women before me. And I'm so grateful for my mother, I think she stepped out with my daughter, um, who poured into me um, so much and supported that dream. The powerful thing about art and media is that it does just that. It provokes emotion, thought, and change. It is my mission to be that change for our future. So I am honored to be here tonight to present the proclamation for 2024 Black History Month. <laughs> Thank you. So we do have some um, performers tonight. Um, so before I present the proclamation, I would love to introduce Devin Daniels. Devin is a saxophonist, composer, arranger, and producer who hails from Inglewood, California. He has performed in a variety of venues, including the Hollywood Bowl, the, Blue, the Blues Note in NYC, the Roxy Theater, Corner Hall in Toronto, Club Nokia Live, Catalina, Catalina's Jazz Bar and Grill, Grumman's Chi Chinese Theater, the Blue Bell Jazz Club, and the Central Avenue Jazz Festival at the Dunbar Hotel. Daniels has worked and performed with artists such as Herbie Hancock and Miguel Atwood Ferguson. He was one of seven other musicians to participate in the Focus Year group held in Basel, Switzerland. Devin obtained his master's, master's degree from the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz in May 2023, 20, and he is currently an artist in residence at Santa Monica's own 18th Street Arts Center. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Devin Daniel. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
next person go back to like two, 2010 2010 um, Gary started tap dancing in 2002 and is originally from Pittsburgh uh, Pennsylvania he graduated from UCLA anybody else from UCLA in here okay has a master's Brilliant. degree and is a certified massage therapist so I mean it's I mean he's already winning um, your boys are bored out there Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I'm just, I'm not even going to say anything else. I'm going to let Gary speak the way he's going to speak. Uh, a temporary one. That's awesome. bringing Jennifer Holmes back up and she and Mayor Brock will close out with our proclamation. Thank you. <laughs> Recognizing Black History Month in Santa Monica Whereas the vision of Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, to launch a Negro History Week of 1926 to celebrate Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass birthdays while teaching black history is alive and continues today. And whereas the first official national observance of Black History Month was established by Gerald Ford, referencing Mr. Woodson and his founding of the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History. And whereas the city of Santa Monica continues to advance equity and inclusion efforts in the city departments and throughout the community. And whereas the city of Santa Monica remains committed to equitable access to educational, employment, economic resources and opportunities 
regardless of race, class, gender, disability, or other identities. And whereas the city of Santa Monica recognizes that black history is not one dimensional or, limit, or limited to only the African-American experience. And whereas the city of Santa Monica celebrates the collective contributions to media and arts by diverse individuals of the African diaspora. Thank you. Now, now therefore I, Phil Brock, mayor of the city of Santa Monica, on behalf of the members of our city council, do hereby proclaim the 1st of February through the 29th of February, 2024, as Black History Month in the city of Santa Monica, and further declare that the city proudly supports the 24 theme, Black Media and the Arts. Congratulations. And and as I walk down to present this, uh, the one thing I want to say is it's wonderful to hear music and see dance in City Hall, and I hope to see more of it throughout our city this year. Thank you. If you can come up and we'll take a picture. Come on down. Where's the saxophonist? Did he leave it? Item 3B, City Manager Report, Santa Monica Fire Department, 2023-2028 Strategic Plan. City Council used hold on, to Chief, hold on one second. Said if they had to recuse themselves back in the day. Mayor, are you ready? Correct. Yes. I'm not the mayor. No, no, no. I didn't realize we were ready. Oh. No, I, good evening. Let's I a, welcome. I have a few comments before inviting Chief Canavia. So, uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. And, of course, uh, with a tremendous amount of excitement, Happy New Year to everyone. It's 2024. Um, my updates will be brief tonight as uh, I'll be introducing... Uh, Chief Kanabi up and Chief Clem up to present the Fire Department Strategic Plan. Um, but before I do so, first and foremost, um, you've seen a number of officers in City Council Chambers this evening, and I want to extend my deepest gratitude uh, to all of them and Police Chief Ramon Batista for a tremendous amount of support over the past 12 hours uh, in ensuring that we were prepared for the City Council meeting tonight. So I just want to especially extend my gratitude to every single member of our police department in here with us this evening and supporting us. Um, their presence means a lot to all of us. So thank you very much. I do want to take a moment to highlight some important progress we've made already this year on our priority of addressing homelessness. A couple weeks ago, we had two tremendous announcements that well spotlight our keen focus on broadening our work and deepening our work on this important crisis. Two big, initiatives, two big initiatives that have been in the works for quite some time, both launched in the second week of January, 
and I want to thank our staff for all their work on these efforts. On January 8th, the city launched a therapeutic transport program in partnership with the LA County Department of Mental Health, in partnership with LA County. This program will allow for more targeted and tailored responses to 911 and non-emergency calls focused on behavioral health care, while also expanding first responders' capacity to address other emergency calls. Its launch is a great example of the kind of regional collaboration that we need and we in Santa Monica demand. And it's the culmination of an incredible amount of staff effort and cross-departmental collaboration. A huge thank you to our Chief Resiliency Officer, Lindsay Call, for her leadership in getting this project across the finish line. She was tremendously resilient in getting this done, and I appreciate her. And on January 10th, we had a soft launch of the Shelter, Treatment, and Empowerment Program known as Step Court. Step Court is a community-based prosecutor-led collaborative diversion court that focuses on resources rather than criminalization. And for those of you that attended the Chamber uh, event last September, you may recall that Rand pointed out that one of the key ingredients that we they wanted to see us bring forward in our work to address homelessness was this very effort, the Diversion Court. It will operate once a month in Santa Monica, overseen by a Los Angeles County Superior Court judge. Resource navigators will help program participants access available resources, including but not limited to obtaining identification, mental health and substance abuse treatment, housing voucher applications, and transportation to regional housing authorities. At the soft launch, five individuals were screened for services and four accepted the program. I want to extend my deepest appreciation to Jenna Grigsby for her leadership on making Step Court a reality here. Thank you to our city attorney and his team. I'm thrilled with the tremendous forward movement happening on this key city priority. We're going to continue to work with utmost urgency, and I hope to share many more efforts like these in the future. On Sunday, February 4th, Big Blue Bus will offer free rides system-wide in celebration of Transit Equity Day. Transit Equity Day is a national day of action that honors the legacy of Rosa Parks by highlighting the advancement of a fair and equitable public transit system for all. My only other update before inviting up Chief Kanabi is to remind everyone to please save the date for the annual State of the City address on Thursday, February 29th at 5 p.m. at John Adams Middle School. More details to come soon. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chief Kanabi and Deputy Chief Clemo to present the Fire Department's strategic plan. Thank you. Yes. Um, Council Member Tarosis, you have a question of the City Manager? Um, yeah, before the fire, I, I'm very excited about the Fire Department strategic plan, but really quickly related to Step Court, can you just tell us um, how we are uh, relaying the information about Step Court to the county um, health services and mental health vis-a-vis uh, -vis their implementation of Care Court, and is there a way that we can use um, some of the best practices? I mean, obviously, it's just started, but it sounds positive. Can we make sure that folks know that we're doing this? of our own accord and hopefully feed into any efforts that are going on regionally. Sure, and I'll defer, Doug, if you want to take that um, since it's centered out of your office. Um, Actually, as best I can get Jenna down here to address it. Okay. Yeah. I don't need to. She has um, the details. I guess I'll just say in a comment, hopefully in the future, we, you could come back to us and let us know how we're working regionally to make sure that we're garnering enough resources for this if it's successful and that we're also kind of elevating this if, it, if again, if it's successful. as a, and Again, the data that you sent us already looks promising, but just making sure that we're coordinated as a best practice um, with, with other folks who might be able to support our efforts. We'll do. Okay, thanks. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, thank you very much. Wolfgang Kanabi, your uh, interim fire chief, and I have Deputy Chief uh, Tom Clemo here with me to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, it gives me great uh, pleasure to present this uh, strategic plan to you. It's been a lot of hard work and a lot of efforts uh, by many involved. And I think I have my button here, right? There we go. Um, why do we have the Fire Department strategic plan, it basically reinforces our mission, our values, and um, our vision for the department. And it communicates the intent, the leader's intent, to all the members of the community and the fire department uh, and, and the stakeholders, basically where we're going. It sets a common path, and it gives us the ability to establish that framework and forecast the resources we need in the future. It serves as an ongoing communications tool 
uh, for future leaders, uh, stakeholders, and personnel as, as things change, everybody's on the same page. Um, our stakeholders, everybody had input to this, uh, yourselves included, and it was a tremendous amount of input, where we're, what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong, what we should be doing in the future. So there were key community leaders, uh, city council, key city staff, uh, our local 1109s, our, our labor group, and a wide spectrum of, of fire department staff across the organization, uh, led by Chief Clemo here, who, who did a lot of the heavy carrying on this. The process is we got uh, uh, input uh, uh, from the community, from the stakeholders, provided uh, status on our department, uh, the views and needs of our fire department, review current projects that we have, policies, uh, programs that we're running, what's working, what's not working, what we can do better, identify immediate versus longer term needs for us, align with council strategies, which is very important. I know the, the homeless situation we're very involved in, and we'll talk about that a little, little later. Uh, alignment with fire service best practices, so we're not just doing things on our own, we're doing things nationally uh, that, that other departments are doing that are working. And then we're also preparing ourselves uh, for accreditation, having a national accreditation for our department, so Santa Monica Fire can be one of the few departments in the country that will have this accreditation. Uh, the outcome, what we got, we have a five-year plan here from 2023 to 2028. And it's, it's, it's pretty aggressive. We have uh, uh, 14 strategies, 38 objectives. Uh, we do have this, the, our, our strategic plan on the internet, so it's on our department. Uh, and I know you've, you've received a copy of it. It's, it's pretty lengthy, it's 70 pages or so. Um, so we have uh, currently 15 objectives that are under implementation for 23-24. And um, we have monthly meetings uh, to check off all the different issues that we're doing so that we're staying on top of this and it's just not another report that's put on a shelf somewhere. We're, it's truly a living document that we're going to be working with to, to make sure that it gets done. Um, and it's in direct integration with uh, the council goals, our city work plan, and then our CIP requests. Um, so now the outcome is uh, ensure that we have the resources uh, to provide quick emergency response to our community. That's everybody's ultimate goal, right, for us to get there uh, as quick as we can to, to help our community and the members that need. Ensuring we have the resource to address homelessness. Thanks to you, and uh, we now have an EMS division, and uh, our EMS division chief actually oversees our homeless liaison and handles things, as, as the city manager mentioned, uh, the therapeutic van, and we also have a part-time social worker to uh, help us to for house individuals so they don't become unhoused. I see that expanding in the future. It's just a, a, a great program. Um, establishment uh, of this division was critical in, in, in our strategic plan. We also have an alternative, we're looking into an alternative ambulance plan being researched, and uh, that's because in this day and age, uh, ambulance companies sometimes don't provide all the service we need at a given time, and there are a lot of issues, so we're looking into uh, those kind of things to make sure that we're, we're solvent for the future. Um, we do have a couple stations that need replacing, big dollar items, <laughs> putting it out there, uh, uh, at Fire Station 3 and Fire Station 7. And then the apparatus placement program that you've approved uh, long ago is working wonderfully, and we really appreciate that. That's why we're able to get to where we need to be on time. Uh, lastly, community outreach for DEI, including an Explore program that we're starting. Um, I just feel uh, it, in my history is, is as we mentor young individuals and to, to get a diverse department, we, we need to do it at a young age so that everybody's given that education, that opportunity, including at-risk youth. Um, myself, I grew up in foster home, so I know what that means. So to have that opportunity is tremendous. Uh, and also for recruitment efforts for future fire department, uh, cadet programs, things of that nature. And I know it was really quick. Um, I could have got into the minutia for you, but in time permitting, I just wanted to get to the nitty gritty for you to uh, answer any questions that you may have. And uh, Chief Clemo is here also. Chief Clemo, uh, you have anything you want to say no. that? I, uh, I think. Uh, mayor, members of council, we have found that if we write it down, that we're successful. So uh, I know it's a it's a rather lengthy document. There's about four 
key pages starting on page 62 or 63 that lay out those objectives. And they're, they're issues and items we've been working on for years. And now they have a much more formalized plan and process moving forward that allows us to manage by objective, which is kind of how we all grow up in the fire service. So I'd encourage you to reach out if you have any questions or now if you have any questions about the plan and kind of where we're headed as, a, as an organization. Council Member Tarosas. Yeah, thank you so much for this. Really appreciate it. Love your mission statement. Um, so all this is great. I, I did notice on page 20 you have several unmet organizational needs and, and without delving into a budget discussion because we know that if we allocate money one place, we, we take it away from somewhere else. But um, can you just talk to us a little bit about like your fire facility capital improvement plan? What do you need to complete this new training facility? Like how, how what's the gap looking like? And maybe that's a city manager question, I don't know, but tell us how we can support you. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. If you were there six months ago, compared to where we are today, we've come a long ways. We've cleaned up the site, we've we auctioned off the trailers, we're running a 13-member academy as we speak oh, wow. for the okay. next 16 weeks. We're in a brand new building and facility. What is left is a lot of remediation on the grounds in and around the tower, refurbishment of the tower, replacement props. We've had estimates that have, that have ranged all over the spectrum. Uh, Public Works has helped us with that effort. And we've placed a CIP request in the process this current year, Great. which will provide a, a tremendous amount of detail about where we are with that. Great. Um, An additional thing also is just because that training center, uh, th thanks to city manager, uh, HR finance, we will for the first time uh, with these 13 members will be fully staffed fire department uh, in probably over 20 years. Yeah. Thank you. This is great. Great progress. Thanks a lot. Council member Para. Hi there. So thank you so much for um, the strategic plan. Um, a lot of really great information and objectives in there. I recently just went through the same <laughs> with with the department that I work for. Um, one of the things that um, I was I was looking for, and I saw a couple references to it, but I wanted to see if you guys collaborate is regarding mentorship, and that actually was kind of the the topic of conversation during our strategic planning, and it ended up being. Um, quite a few objectives for us. And we talked about objective, we talked about mentorship top down and bottom up. And so that we can build leadership and leaders. Um, so we can build chiefs, you know, basically within our department. And so um, what are you guys doing as a department? Is that part of any strategies? Um, just really quick. I mean, you don't have to. Absolutely. As we currently speak, we've had several promotional exams, each one of them uh, handled by somewhat the mentorship involved in those uh, classes uh, that each individual members will, will uh, go aside someone and say, hey, I need help in this and be the mentors for them. Also in our academy class right now, the 13 individuals that are going through academy class, they will have mentors identified for them that they can go to, they can discuss things and, and have somebody to, to talk to in that regard. And also a formal program uh, in policy where we will uh, spread out the whole mentorship program that's in development. Yeah, that's great. Appreciate that, thank you. Yes. Council Member De La Torre. <laughs> Not so much a question, but I just wanted to, uh, I had the opportunity to visit our sister city uh, in Mazatlan, Mexico. And, uh, you know, it, very interesting. They, they, they had a, a volunteer force. And just three years ago, uh, they started having paid staff uh, for their, uh, you know, fire department. Uh, but one of the, one of the um, uh, catalysts uh, for, to professionalize, you know, uh, fire services and the fire department in Mazatlan was the donation that uh, this fire department made of uh, two fire trucks uh, that are in operation and working well. Uh, and I just wanted to relay that information that beyond just the improvements you're making uh, for the city of Santa Monica and the department here, uh, your uh, you know support for the fire department in Mazatlan is saving lives as well over there. So thank you. Thank you, sir. And we had the contingent from Mazatlan uh, up here with us at our fire station, and uh, they showed a video of the station uh, and going in response. You were, you were there on that, and it was it almost brought a tear to your eye 
because of what they're able to do now and the lives they're able to save in Mazatlan, um, you know, like you said, Councilman, it's just, it's uh, we're all in it together. Yes, thank you. Council Member Zwick. Thank you so much, Chief, for this uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to just, um, uh, first again, send my thanks for the strategic visioning process that you guys have undergone, and then um, just um, ask if you might expound a little bit um, I know the fire department has done some restructuring in terms of the personnel it's devoting to issues around homelessness. And you mentioned a social worker now and, and, uh, and other resources. And I'm just curious if you could comment um, for a minute or two on how the current um, iteration of the program is going and where, if anywhere, you might see it building to, as you referred to. Thank you, council member. Um, I, I would tell you that uh, there's, there's quite a bit of surprise as to the success that we are finding with the case management type approach that we have taken. So our EMS division, uh, through our folks that are on the floor de uh, delivering the service, have identified several power users of the system. And we take those and we, we meet with them directly, uh, we manage them directly, and we plug them into the services that they need. And we have already started to see reduction in calls for service from certain uh, certain users. It's been really successful for us. The other component that has been quite successful is having a chief officer assigned to EMS with a focus on the bigger EMS picture, our service delivery from an EMS perspective, ambulance service delivery, and our homeless service delivery has really grown within our organization. It's created a level of connectivity that we've been missing, frankly, because we haven't put as much uh, personnel horsepower behind it like we have now. We appreciate the support to make that happen. And uh, Councilman, also, I think it's really critical, you know, thanks city mm -hmm. manager, and we have a, a uh, homeless strategic plan that we're all involved with, and I think that is hitting nail right on the head. I've been in many cities involved with the homeless uh, situation, and to have one group that's going to have a strategic plan, and we're going to be intimately involved in that, uh, I, I, and somewhere, uh, probably in the future, maybe a, a, our community response unit type thing again going however we see that going. But together, uh, the, the city, all the city departments working together, shout out to Heather and her, her department for that. That's, uh, I, I think that's going to be great for us in the future. Thank you. I, I just want to ask the question. I want you to go back to the beginning, and I don't know if it was you or City Manager White that mentioned you're a Class 1 fire department and you're looking for national accreditation. Where does that put you in the pantheon of American cities if we're accredited as a Class 1? Less than 0.01% of the fire departments nationally are both accredited with Class 1. And then on top of that, uh, does that still... Uh, see a reduction in homeowners fire insurance and the and people in the city uh accreditation typically no but uh, has a class one department has class one absolutely yes so you're providing extra value to our residents and i just want to say personally that i've always been so proud to see santa monica firefighters and when i was i think three or four years old i had my little firefighters hat from santa monica so I, I, I believe every resident, every visitor, every worker in the city should be proud of seeing our fire department each and every day. Please thank our firemen, not when they're saving someone, but afterward, or as you see them uh, taking a break from their 24-hour shifts. Firefighters. firefighters. Firefighters, sorry. Yes, and we want more f female firefighters on our streets. Thank you for that, council sorry, member. And Mr. Mayor, if I, if I may, just we, we had a recent incident where it's sort of uh, an anomaly, but uh, there was a hospital that needed tra transportation to Long Beach uh, for a person that had an aortic aneurysm, and they couldn't get any medics or anybody to transport, to do that interfacility transport, and we had one of our engines do that, and when they got to Long Beach, the surgeon there said, if this person wouldn't have got here within the hour, they would have been dead. It was because of your paramedics that went that way out. So as Councilman Del Torre said before, we're all, you know, we're all in this together where we are. And that's the kind of firefighters that, that we have. And, and we have a, a fantastic, great department. I think the best and that, that accredited, that, uh, you know, accreditation is going to be a cherry on top. 
Thank you so much. And I think we all applaud our fire department every single day. Thank you. Um, wanted to go back words a little bit. Um, yeah, thank you, Chief. Um, wanted to go back a little bit. Uh, Council Member Tarosas had a question uh, about another program earlier in the city manager's report, and we happen to have the assistant city attorney uh, with us to answer those questions. Do you want me to Attorney Grigsby, come on up. Sure. Come on down. I, I had just asked how STEM Corps um, was being kind of publicized or communicated to our county partners and if there's a way that that puts us at the front of the line for care court and or if there's a way that that could be integrated with anything that's happening at care court. So just to clarify, the, the city can't refer to Claire Court, sure. Care Court. Yeah. So it is a one of those kind of interesting situations where we have folks who definitely would qualify for Care Court, but that needs to come from different kind of uh, referral system. So what we're looking at at a step court is those who are directly on our streets and haven't been able to utilize the programs that we have here in the city because it's hard for them to get where our court is at airport court. So the connection I think that we can use for the county is through our exodus contract and with the case management that they'll be providing is being able to access what other programming, whether it be DMH, whether it be the EBT cards, you know, some of the other programs that are helpful, not necessarily in a care court setting, but just on how can we elevate this person who's unhoused or having a mental health crisis or substance abuse to get them into a situation where they're able to access those resources is easier sorry so you're saying that you know again I'm not the expert on care court but you're basically saying that in order to be referred into care court you need um, well I, I understand that you have to ha be hurt your case has to be heard at a, at a court that is currently in doing care court and I think there's only like one courthouse in the county that's doing it right but um, I was more asking, like, if there's a way to elevate the work that we're doing of our own volition, not because we're doing care court, so that folks around the region know what we're doing and we could potentially get additional resources and or potential referral opportunities down the line. So we are working with our communications team okay. to do some rollouts. They did put out a press release before we started. I think they're working to try to see when the best time is to have someone come and witness and experience what our step court is like. We're still in the kind of initial programming phases. Mm -hmm. You know, we applied for and received from the federal government some grant money to get it started. So I think once that becomes, um, you know, some substantial programming has been put in place, we'll sure. be able to do more of the publicity and make those type of connections. And then you said that you need help being um, get, getting like EBT enrollment, et cetera, or you have that? So we have that through our contract with Exodus. The case okay. manager is going to be able to figure out what the person needs. That's really why we like STEP the most is because, you know, I play a social worker on TV, but I'm not actually a sure. social worker. Mm -hmm. So having the case management there on site and ask those questions to be able to find out what this person needs to better make them eligible for housing or make them eligible for a rehab bed, Exodus can provide all those services on site. Great. Congratulations. I'm very excited about this. Thank you. We are very hopeful that February will also be a success. Does anyone else have any questions of Attorney Grigsby? No, I okay. see none. Thank you so much no for problem. coming down. Thank you. And with that, we move on. Closed session. Item 4A is a conference with labor negotiator, agency designated representatives, our city manager, David White, acting human resources director, O.S. Gordiv, and human resources manager, Sarah Riebensdor. Bargaining units are supervisory team associates, oh, sorry, association, and California Teamsters Local 911. And then we have seven existing litigation items. Um, Christina Choi and others versus the city, uh, Black Lives Matter and others versus the city, Alejandro, I'm sorry, Alejandra Garcia and others versus the city. Uh, Cheyenne Robinson and others versus the city. Paula Rosado versus the city and others. Sean Singletary versus the city and others. Uh, city of Whittier and others versus the Superior Court of Los Angeles County and others. And then we have two report outs um, for existing litigation, Dennis Lindenmeyer versus the city and Yossi Shim, I'm sorry, Shimshi versus the city and others. And um, 
Attorney Sloan, what time do you believe we'll be returning to Chambers? Let's shoot for 8 o'clock. It's going to be at least that long. Okay. So we are going to adjourn. We will be back at 8 p.m. Thank you so much.
There's one over there. Oh, magically it was done. Hi, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> we are back in session, and uh, does the city attorney have a report for us? Yes. In the closed session, all matters were heard, all council members were present. Nothing to report out from today's closed session, but from prior closed sessions, I'd like to report out in the Shimshi case. Uh, the council approved a settlement on December 19th. Five were present, uh, and it settled for $190,000. Also in the Lettenmeyer case, uh, that's a personal injury case. The council approved settlement authority on November 28th, and it settled for $225,000. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, so our, our esteemed past mayor, Mayor Davis, each meeting started off the meeting with uh, a look and an animal in need. Um, of a permanent home at our that was housed temporarily until one of you took him home at the animal shelter. That included rabbits, uh, which I wanted, um, uh, cats, dogs, etc. Uh, I still absolutely recommend that you visit our animal shelter on Ninth Street. They have they take fantastic care of animals in need, and we hope that they don't have to stay there long because. One of you listening, watching, will take that animal home and give it a loving forever home. In the meantime, this year we're going to change up a little bit. And I said in my first meeting that I wanted to focus on Santa Monica's culture and history. So the Santa Monica Conservancy has graciously provided us with a uh, something that's near and dear to everyone's heart on the west side and um, and we'll have unfortunately an in memoriam at the end of our council meeting about uh, Ernie Marquez uh, the video now will be about the Marquez family cemetery in Santa Monica Canyon a drop outside our jurisdiction but you'll find that both Ernie Marquez and so many of the family existed in Santa Monica, including my high school Spanish teacher whose ashes are spread over the Marquez Family Cemetery, Forrest Freed, a Santa Monica high school teacher. We have volume. Can you pause and rewind and see if we can get volume on this? Thank you so much. And this is brought to you both by the Conservancy and the Santa Monica History Museum. And we thank them both for the effort unless I have to provide a voiceover. Did you say the sound works somewhere else? Oh, it's just like we play it maybe it's time to start with the sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does Okay, Gilbert may have it on a different computer, and maybe he can blend the sound just by giving it to one of us on our iPhones or iPads. And we could simulcast it, as they used to say in Los Angeles. Okay. 
this is an inauspicious start. Susan, could you ask Gilbert if there was sound? He's he was in the office when we walked down. There was sound. That was when my staff tested it earlier, and it was sound. So I'm not sure what the issue is. Yeah, I don't Sorry for the delay, folks. Do we want to move to another item and then come back? See if, if Gilbert and other staff member can work on it, and maybe we can show it at the end. If you've never been there, thank you. And I, I know when we listen to it online, I'm sure everyone will hear volume then. It was a little bit weak here. Uh, and especially pay attention to that the ending in memory of Ernest Marquez, March. Well, it faded right then. But, um, but we will do an in memoriam to him at the end of our meeting. He sadly passed away less than two weeks ago. So. Uh, every week we'll try and acquaint you with Santa Monica history, and in this case, uh, the history of the rancho that once 
this parcel was part of in Santa Monica. Okay, let's move on. We have the consent calendar. Has anybody, uh, clerk, has anybody uh, removed any items for further discussion? Actually, Mr. Mayor, before we get there, um, I would just like to ask if any council members have any reports on travel since our last meeting. I happen to. Does anyone else? So <clears throat> I attended the United States Mayor's Conference last week in Washington, D.C. It was uh, a fantastic, terrific, amazing experience. Um, over 300 mayors attended. There were seminars starting at 8 a.m. each morning uh, that went on till 6 p.m. every night. It was a graduate course in being a mayor. And uh, the seminars on subjects like the distribution and proliferation of fentanyl, the seemingly unlimited supply of unhoused humans that every city in the nation is dealing with. Uh, the need for increased public safety was a dominant theme. And increasingly, and I was very pleased to hear this, and it went in to um, our new mental health fan that had just been inaugurated the week before. Uh, there were several discussions on mental health, and uh, those discussions were wide-ranging, uh, <clears throat> leading from Senator Fetterman, Senator Murphy on loneliness, Senator Fetterman on uh, suicide, on uh, drug addiction, a lot of other things. Uh, it was powerful. And um, while each city had possibly a different twist on issues, many of us came together talking about solutions to our shared problems from really 7 a.m. at breakfast all the way to 10 or 11 p.m. at night. Uh, it was wonderful, A, being able to share, but also hear solutions from cities that had uh, come up with uh, new ways, innovative ways, best practices on solving some of the problems that we share in Santa Monica. Uh, we heard from six cabinet members, the vice president. We went to the White House, uh, sat in a press conference with President Biden who also talked about fentanyl, talked about immigration, talked about uh, public safety, and talked about uh, getting help for homelessness to our cities. So uh, the uh, mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Bass, included me on, uh, and I thank her, on the mayor's task force on homelessness. Uh, that was very important as well. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, ways to combat homelessness, ways to do better, and ways to go back to Washington, D.C. and talk to our elected representatives further about providing more funding directly to American cities to help us uh, and help all of our residents work on uh, unhoused humans, mental health crisis, all those things. But there are also boilerplate things on police and fire departments and things like that. So we heard from six cabinet members, two senators, the vice president, the president, um, and I thought it was an absolutely extraordinary experience, which I'm really still digesting because it really was graduate school for mayors. And I know that last year um, Mayor Davis came back and I, I could just see the pride in her experience. Uh, the pride she had was sharing uh, everything has a representative from Santa Monica. And I, I now share that with her. And uh, it, it was great to see us received um, from Santa Monica when a lot of the cities we were talking to were big cities in, in America. But we share the problems and share sometimes the lack of solutions. But it was very worthwhile. That's my report. Consent calendar, all items will be considered and approved in one motion unless removed by a council member for discussion. In accordance with Charter Section 615, the adoption of all ordinances and resolutions shall be by reading of title only unless a council member present dissents. No public discussion is permitted on ordinances for second reading and adoption. And I have a request from Council Member Parra to remove item 5A and a request from Mayor Brock to remove item 5K. 5I. I'm sorry, 5I and 5K, I'm sorry. <laughs> But Councilmember Parr's 
removing 5i. Councilmember Brock is removing 5k. Do we have a motion to approve the other items on the have, consent a calendar? Couple, a couple more uh, items that I'd like to pull. Uh, item uh, five. Were you, were you able to notify staff in advance? No, no. I, I just questions that I have right now. That, That's that fine. Won't be long. Five uh, H and five K. Actually, are those? Is, is that already being pulled? Five K is being pulled. Okay, five H then. Do we have a motion to approve the other items? So moved. Second. And we need a roll call vote. Moved by De La Torre and seconded by Mayor Cortez. Uh, Vice Mayor Negretti. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. Councilmember Torosis? Yes. Mayor Cortez Negretti? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Parra? Yes. Councilmember Zwick? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. Item 5I. i will just get there. Award bid to Good Guard Security Incorporated for Transit Safety Officer Program for Big Blue Bus. Wait, sorry, do we do it in order? Because Delatory pulled 5H. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot he pulled 5H. I'm sorry. No one said A. I thought I heard it. Okay. Item 5H, award request for proposal number 357 to BBC Research and Consulting for a procurement study to explore barriers to equity and inclusion. Would you like a full report on that? Not, not a full report. I, I just, uh, I just, I just wanted to uh, thank staff, you know, for bringing this forward. I think it's uh, very important, and um, something that I think, you know, later in the agenda, you know, we talk about how do we make uh, equity real, you know, and and how do we how do we practice sort of inclusive practices to expand economic benefits, you know, to all. And I think you can't have racial justice without economic justice. So I think we're this is a very important item for us. And I wanted to highlight that, you know, because it could easily get lost <clears throat> in terms of uh, the agenda today. But one of the questions that I have is, uh, in terms of baseline data, will we'll, uh, are, are we requiring now, like, to understand sort of our procurement practices? Yep. Um, are we are we requiring now sort of a box, you know, check where people can identify, self-identify? Uh, race, ethnicity, gender, um, and so forth. Yeah, we we do not. We don't. So do that, that. that's one of the things that we're hopeful that will be brought to light, so that we can implement these things. We're not. Done. Okay. Yeah. So right now we wouldn't be able to say, for example, you know, eighty percent of all you know vendors that uh, that contract with the city are of one group or another. We can't do that. No, right no. Now. But part of the study is the consultant is going to do that. Pull our contracts. Um, you know, the ones that we've executed, look at subcontractors and then identify that information as well. Okay. As well as to do um, an availability analysis of seeing what else is out there that could we, we could be kind of okay. tapping into. Great. So the, the, the good news is that we're going to begin sort of collecting that data to have some baseline data to understand where we currently are as an organization on, on the questions of equity and procurement Yeah, practices. I'm hopeful that we, that's, I mean, that's what we're expecting from this, this analysis, that they not only bring those ideas, but other ideas that we haven't thought about. Um, they're going to look at other agencies what's been successful so that we can implement also in-house. Because I think one of the things that we want to do is we may have blind spots, things that we're not seeing. We think we're doing a good job at what we're doing, but there's uh, opportunities for improvement as well, okay. which I think will come from here. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. Just yeah. wanted to acknowledge uh, staff and, and, and the city for, for taking this very important step to uh, expand access and opportunity, you know, to, uh, to business in the city of Santa Monica. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Tarosas. Okay, well, since you pulled it, um, I'll, I'll just take a moment to say uh, in my professional capacity, I think you probably know this, but uh, we've actually established an Office of Strategic Contracting Equity within the County of LA, and I would say that I would be disappointed if this actually takes two years to figure this out because there's a lot of information out there about what local um, municipalities are doing wrong and what they could be doing better with respect to um, equity and in, in contracting with the city. I don't know if um, I probably knew it at one point, but what's our annual um, spend that the the city of Santa Monica has? I'll come back to you with that actual spend because I, I think I that have the number. But I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah. I mean, like we're a fairly large market participant here in this region, right? And so. I would love to see us establish like a 25% utilization goal uh, in a preference program for local small business enterprises. Would love to see us do um, potentially even look at like social enterprises where there's a public benefit to the the work that the institution, uh, the, the um, business is doing. We obviously know because of Prop 209, we can't um, 
for any uh, non-federal funding, we can't do community business enterprise. So like for, for those, I'm sure everyone knows, like minority and women owned, we can't do that on anything unless it's federal funding. But at the same time, like are there um, technical assistance programs that we can put in place? Can we do cash advances to s small firms that are obviously can't wait 90 or 120 days to get paid by the city? I think there are a lot of ideas already out there that have been reported on. I would also just say that the Center for Nonprofit Management has been leading this work regionally, especially for our smaller nonprofits to help them access these contracts. Um, and I'm happy to be a resource and a partner if, if that's something that's helpful or not. Um, I, I, f I feel very deeply that this is important. So thank you. Definitely will be helpful. Um, one of the requirements that we had from the consultant was that they pull information from the county. Um, we got an email from you giving us some information, so we're going to do some of that too. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Delatory, uh, would you like to uh, move this item? Yes, uh, uh, so moved. Council Member Tarosas. Second. There you go. Okay, <clears throat> um, can we have a roll call vote? Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. Councilmember Tarosis? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Parra? Yes. Councilmember Zwick? Yes. And Mayor Brock? Yes. Item 5I, award bill, uh, bid to Good Guard Security Incorporated for Transit Safety Officer Program for Big Blue Bus. Good evening, Mayor Brock. Uh, Hi. Mayor Good to see you here. Council members. My name is Lisa Gisad. I'm the Transit Safety and Training Manager for the Department of Transportation. And questions? Uh, count, uh, Vice Mayor Negretti. You pulled it so you guys Well, do you want to go? <laughs> yes, <please>. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Lisa, um, so much for coming. I, I wanted to start off by um, thanking you guys for bringing this forward. Um, I've been pretty vocal about my concerns about safety on public transportation. And, um, you know, we've had like numerous conversations around parking and the removal of parking spaces and alternative modes of transportation. And I have been the one that has said, like, until we feel safe and until our residents in our community feel safe on public transportation, um, it's not, it's not okay, you know. And so this was something that I've been waiting to see. Um, come to light and come to fruition. And so um, some of the questions that I have and also that people have asked about had to do with, and they were answered already, but I wanted us to talk about it so that other people can hear um, the responses. And so it was what this model is going to look like. So um, how many people are going to be on shift at any given time? Um, you know, is it going to be, you know, and are they, are they, staffing or the guards, officers, I don't know how you're calling them, the, the transit. We're calling transit safety officers. Safety officers. Are they going to be paired up? Um, and uh, is it going to be a 2-4, you know, like seven days a week, I should say? So if you could tell us a little bit about how you anticipate the program rolling out and what it's going to look like. Sure. Thank you for asking. So um, our goal is to get um, as much coverage throughout the system as possible um, based on the security incident data that we receive from our operators. So um, we gather this data, we determine um, the areas that have the most uh, type of incidents, whether it be, um, you know, like right now we have a lot of incidents on the Route 3, for example. Um, based on the data that we get, we can say uh, what times of the day we're having such incidents, days of the week. Um, as of now, we're going to be doing um, different shifts during the weekdays and weekends. So weekdays, we're going to have two shifts. It's going to be nine hour shifts, eight working hours. Um, four guards per shift. Um, we're going to start them early in the morning is when we're having the majority of the incidents. We have them pretty early in the morning, starting at about 6 o'clock in the morning. Mm. So we're going to have the guards um, riding on and off buses. Um, we have a plan where we kind of let them know where the problem areas are and like what, how to get on and off the buses. Like you're going to go here, you're going to get off at this area, you can take this bus to this direction, come back around. Um, and so we're going to have uh, four guards on the first shift, four guards on the second shift um, during the weekdays. On the weekends, since our service is uh, reduced, we're going to have uh, just one shift of eight, nine hours, eight working hours uh, with the four guards riding on buses. Um, they will be paired up. 
uh, depending on the assignment. So if we're going to have them, um, for example, we had reports of certain problematic bus stops within the city. Um, so uh, we have taken care of those issues for now with the help of the Santa Monica Police Department. Um, but say we have those incidents in the future, we can also focus our efforts with the guards and say, okay, um, in the mornings, you're going to be at the stop at 4th and Colorado, make sure that, you know, the buses get off and rolling safely. Um, and then from there, your assignment shifts to something else. Um, so that's what we have for the program uh, now, and then we can revisit it um, as we get more data. It seems like it's not a lot of guards, you know, four guards riding on and off the buses. Um, that's the funding that we have for now, and we're hoping that um, it will make a difference as far as um, we plan to do a big, um, like, public information campaign to let the public know that we are going to be having these guards on there, uh, not only for their safety, but the safety of our operators. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to be doing a campaign talking about, um, like, our code of conduct, just so that the public is aware of the type of conduct that's expected on the buses. Um, and um, we're hoping that that's also going to increase the perception of safety for our passengers, because we also do get, as I'm sure you get uh, complaints from the public about disturbances on the buses, we get those as well. And so we're hoping that this is going to alleviate some of those concerns. I appreciate so. that, because I understand just based upon um, your report, it says that they have been incidents or security uh, related incidents have increased uh, since 2019. And so, and I know that the incidents have not only been against bus operators, but there's also been incidents, you know, amongst passengers and other types of disturbances, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And so um, the contract is with Good Guard, which is uh, a vendor or uh, that we are currently have a contract with, correct? Yes, GoodGuard is our vendor for the parking structure security um, that began last year. So we've been, um, they've had a contract with the city for about a year now. And so they'll be clearly identifiable in their, yes. their, their GoodGuard security uniforms. Okay. Okay. Yes, they will have um, the uniform that we're going with is a general, like a black uh, uniform, um, says security. Um, clearly marked that it's not City of Santa Monica, but a contracted security. Okay. Um, just going through my notes. Um, I think that's all I have for now, but uh, thank you so much for, for bringing this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Vice Mayor Negretti. Hi. Okay, so this question may or may not be for you or maybe more for procurement, but I was just curious why we're, you know, just coming off of the last item we were talking about um, and trying to diversify who we work with and offer city contracts to, whether it be smaller or minority-owned businesses. I was just curious why we have a five-year contract. I know we always have the option to cancel a contract at any time. Say we decide in a year, it's so effective that we feel we can reduce services or withdraw completely. But I was just curious why we're doing five years instead of maybe two or three years with options to renew, because how can we give other smaller businesses a, an opportunity or, you know, diverse businesses an opportunity if we have these really long contracts? And that may not, I don't know who makes that decision, if it's procurement or? Yeah, um, well, I, I can answer on, on our end. Um, uh, we had initially uh, requested a three-year contract uh, with the option to extend it for two years. And we're told that the city is kind of going in the direction of doing five-year contracts. I don't know if that's, uh, <coughs> or if the procurement is here and would like to yeah, address that. Yeah, so we have, we follow best practice of going out to market every five years at a minimum. minimum. So that's kind of behind the five-year um, um, term that we have. And so, um, we can't get out of a contract with, uh, I think it's a 90-day notice on our agreements. And so that's, that's something that's up there. Um, but I think it eliminates some of the administrative burden of having to modify agreements when we know that we, we're probably going to, you know, ex keep it for the entire five years. And when we know that we can exercise an, an option to, to kind of uh, pull out of the contract. But anyway. to be clear, the, I don't know what the contract language is, but to be able to pull out of a contract, it's probably, I would assume it's because we don't need it or something has changed and not simply because we're looking to explore, you know, if something's effective, but we'd like to explore being more diverse and offering a contract to, say, another company, that's not probably a reason why you would 
in the middle of a contract and exercise no, that no, no, contract. So that's why, um, you know, every five years we conduct the solicitation because it's just, it's, a, it's an administrative burden, right? It's, it's not only do you have to go out to bid, that you have to spend time interviewing, reviewing uh, proposals, come back to council, seek for the approval. So we kind of use that as a baseline, the five years. I'm not, a, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question though. I know, I feel like we're unfortunately yeah, kind of going, we're kind of going back to the other item, unfortunately, but I think this is probably a conversation we should have maybe offline because this is the problem, right? If we keep doing these really long contracts, then how are we giving people an opportunity if we're using best practices because it's a lot of laborious work to go out well, to bid every time? The, yeah, part of it laborious work, but it's also uh, best terms, right? At times we get a better price by um, having a longer contract. So that's also a benefit to the city. So. I, mean, there's I think a lot of people want to work with the city of Santa Monica. I'm not sure, but um, I'm just putting it out there. I was just curious for this, but um, I do understand that at any time we can pull out, given we don't need the services anymore, um, and I'm assuming you know we just have to give ample notice. But I was just curious why I've seen other uh, contracts where we do you know a shorter term with the option to extend. Definitely. Um, so just curious if we can look at that as opposed to just, and I'm ask, actually asking specifically because there is a minority owned company who, who um, came in too late and asked about um, bidding on specifically this and some other, um, um, and there was another company about something else in the city, but specifically this one came up and they had missed the opportunity. Um, and when we looked at it, I was like, well, it's not for another five years that that's gonna go out to bid, so. Definitely, and so, you know, we'll, I guess we can, part of the procurement study, We'll make sure that it get, that gets addressed, but also in, in reviewing the stuff that comes to you, we'll make sure that we ask that question of, you know, three years, can we do three years of renewals? If maybe that's a better way to kind of do the contract, um, we can definitely do that. Um, for us, the intent was if we have the terms and we have um, good pricing to the city through a longer contract, we would like to execute those. Yeah, more creativity. I think we could secure a five-year price with options to renew, but we can also give an opportunity to go out and see if we can diversify our portfolio. Definitely. Thank you. Yep. Council Member Davis. Thanks. I really, you mentioned my line. I ride the three pretty regularly because I go down to El Segundo. <laughs> so, You're probably familiar with it. <laughs> so, yeah, um, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, but, but it did raise a question in my mind because in my experience, and obviously it's just my experience, it... There may be incidents on the three, and you said they're in the morning, and I'm not a morning person, so I may not be there to see them. But but the three goes through a number of cities. It goes through Santa Monica. It goes through County Land and Marina del Rey. It goes through Westchester, which is part of L.A., and then ends up in El Segundo. So in terms of these security folks, as they... Um, are on the When they're on the bus, obviously, they're on a Santa Monica bus. But in terms of problematic bus stops, because there are a couple in Venice, I'll just say that, um, they don't really have any jurisdiction there because that's not Santa Monica. Would that be correct? Or, or are they going to, I mean, I don't know. I'm just wondering how you're going to deal with that because I actually don't feel unsafe on the three. I ride the bus fairly frequently and I don't feel unsafe. But I do notice sometimes some of the stops are a little problematic with people hanging around and stuff like that. So I'm just curious how we're going to handle that situation, if at all. I mean, it's not our, not our circus, not our monkeys in a way, because <laughs> Venice is city of L.A., but I'm just curious. So on, on board the buses, um, that's not going to be an issue because we're basically going to follow the same protocols that our drivers are following right now. So there's a disturbance on the bus. The guard will attempt to de-escalate. In the meantime, the driver is going to be contacting for law enforcement response. Um, as far as bus stops, I don't believe that there are issues as far as jurisdiction, but I can get back to you on that because I, I have not actually... Yeah, it's, it's not whether, super important, but it just dawned on me when you mentioned three. It goes through effectively four different jurisdictions. Right. You know, going from Santa Monica to the county to the city to El, city of L.A. to El Segundo. And, you know, to the extent some of the stops might be problematic, but just a thought. But yeah, you mentioned three, so I felt compelled to speak because I write three. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't have an answer on the jurisdictions as far as being at the actual bus stops, but on board the buses, it's not an issue. But I can get back to you with that information. And I'm okay. not sure what the means are to do that. But Yeah, no, that that's fine. I was just kind of curious. It piqued my curiosity. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Tarosas. Thank you. Um, 
Sorry, not to uh, belabor this point, but I think that you can achieve the same outcome with doing a three-year contract with two one-year extensions as you can with a five-year, because in effect, you could have that, con that person under contract for five years with giving us some options. And if we are going to undertake this procurement equity study, I think I hear what you just said, like, oh, it's easier if we have larger contracts. It's easier if we have these contracts, uh, these people under contracts for a longer period of time. Um, I think we have to make some decisions, you know, internally about trade-offs on, on staff time. I get that. But I would strongly encourage us to think about unbundling. Um, I know that that probably is uh, more onerous for staff, but these smaller firms who want to get in with the city are not going to be able to take on huge contracts right away, right? So I think that's part of the, the what we need to be looking at to um, Vice Mayor Negrete's point. Um, and I also think it would be important for us to forecast. Like if we know that something is coming up for re-procurement in three years, let's start getting other folks in the pipeline now. We can't just expect it to happen when we put out something to bid. Like we've had, we have to have potentially forecasted what we are procuring in the next several years and what kind of firms we're going to be contracting with and then who those folks are and how do we get people ready to compete for our contracts. So I uh, sorry, I know that's not what this item is about, but because you mentioned it, I, I feel like I just have to like reinforce that I, I would agree. Um, I, I don't know that I'm totally satisfied with the answer as to why we're doing five year, five year um, um, terms. Thanks. Not to say I'm going to oppose this item. I just would say that I'm giving feedback. Thanks. Thank you. I have a few questions as well, seeing nobody else in the queue. Um, first, at our peak, how many Santa Monica big blue buses and little blue buses um, and giant articulated buses are on the road at any one time at peak hours? Peak hours during the week is 124 buses, and on the weekends it's 64 buses. And there were 300 and some odd incidents last year, if I recall. Uh, no, I think to total incidents, we had two in 2023, uh, 208 um, security related incidents. Oh, okay. So. And, and this is just incidents that are reported by the operators that um, cause a service disruption. So I'm sure the numbers are a lot higher, um, but. I'd rather they be lower. I, so, I would as well. So <laughs> my, my, I have a couple of questions about this. Uh, I like uh, my fellow council members are concerned about a five-year contract. Uh, Good Guard has done much better in our parking garages than the previous security firms did over the previous couple of years. But they're unproven on our buses, correct? Correct. This will be the first time that we so have an onboard program at all. I, I'm curious of why we didn't do like a six-month contract or something to test uh, test them on the routes. And I'm also curious about why four guards, if we have 120 buses on some days, and we put, we're put we putting one guard on per bus? No, so they'll be riding in pairs going So they're on, always in pairs. Off buses. So in other words, out of 128 buses on at a peak hour on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. only two buses will have extra security. Right, on and off. So it, they'll be getting... Well, getting I, I understand that, but at mm -hmm. one time, two buses time. will only have security and the other 126 buses are the same boat as we are now. I want to make sure this isn't just a PR response, that we're doing a real response that will reduce or eliminate incidents on our buses. And then the second part of that, I know I just gave you more than I should have, but the second part of that is on Route 3, what is the percentage of incidents in the city of Santa Monica and the percentage of incidents uh, further down the road. I don't have that information on me. I can get that information for you, but I don't. I don't have it on me because we just do them for routes total. Um, I could say that uh, as far as ranking them, the three is the one that gets the most incidents, followed by the one and the seven. Um, but I don't know how many of those incidents are only within the city of Santa Monica because the data that we get is for the entire route. And, and the guards will never be gain off the buses to ta to work with anyone at a bus bench regardless, correct? They're only they're there to keep our bus riders and drivers safe. So the actual 
Uh, Council Member Davis mentioned bus stops in LA, LA County, and well, LA and LA County. And so my concern was that uh, she mentioned the bus stops, but I would assume that our guards would be prohibited from getting off the bus. Or am I wrong there? Outside of Santa Monica? Yeah. Uh, so I have to check on the jurisdictional issues because I'm not, I don't know if that's an issue or, or not outside of Santa Monica. I know within Santa Monica it's not, it's not an issue. Um, I don't believe that it is because we have, for example, um, LA Metro has the transit ambassadors that travel throughout the county and they don't have any jurisdictional issues. So I'm going to guess that it's not, but I don't want to say that definitely and be incorrect, so I can get back to you with that information. Someone's but our, lurking behind you who also oh, wants to be like, No, 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 go ahead. Was, Please. Good evening, uh, Mayor Brock and Council. Thank you. I'm Anuj Gupta, Director of Transportation. So I just wanted to um, address, if I could, uh, your first question, Mayor, uh, with regard to sort of the, the nature of the deployment and the scale, right? Um, it's a really important question, and understanding the scale, obviously, of the operation of our service area um, and the you know level of resources we have that we're proposing before Council. What I wanted to emphasize, which um, Lizette shared earlier, is that we are using the data uh, based on our motor coach operators, based on passengers, based on security incidents, to deploy these resources kind of where they would be the most effectively used, right? So this was never intended, and, and frankly, it would bust our budget to have a security guard or two security guards on every single bus at all times. And frankly, part of the reason why Lizette and her team train our exceptional motor coach operators is to be able to be that frontline response, but we don't want them to have to deal with all of the issues, especially the types of issues that we're seeing. And so we're gonna use the data on where are we seeing the most incidents and then deploy the guards to those routes. And then as she also mentioned, right, it's gonna be, the guards won't be just kind of standing on their own. So we're gonna also be educating our, our public, educating our writers about our code of conduct, right? And actually this is something that the library has done very effectively over the years developing a code of conduct, publishing a co publicizing a code of conduct, and then making sure that our LSOs will be kind of enforcing that and ensuring that folks know how to behave and what kind of behavior is not tolerated. And by doing that kind of comprehensive information campaign and then obviously strategically deploying these guards where we can, we also want to have some broader deterrence, right? So that folks who might have bad intentions, who may be looking to not pay a fare, get in a fight, will know that, you know, if particularly on particular routes, there may be more people there to intervene. Now, obviously not a guard on every bus, but I think that will inform how we deploy a limited resource in the most effective way. When we're, what, what is the uh, difference in police response when a big blue bus operator needs urgent help between Santa Monica and the services in Los Angeles. Is there a difference in the response time between LAPD and Santa Monica PD? It's definitely a lot quicker in the, within the city of Santa Monica. LAPD response times for incidents and even collisions, things like that are a lot longer. Five minutes longer, 10 minutes longer? Does it put our bus operator in danger? So, or a passenger in danger? Yeah, so for example, today we were talking about responding to uh, when passengers break the doors on the buses or windows, What, how, how we're going to respond to that, talking to the supervisors about that. And we said, anytime that happens, we're going to contact um, law enforcement, wait for a response. And they are saying, if it's within the city of Santa Monica, we get a quick response. But if it's outside of Santa Monica and we have to wait for LAPD, they're going to take hours to respond if it's not something that's an immediate threat, right? Or if, if it's just like a disturbance on the bus, they'll say, well, is a is a person still there? Are they getting off the bus? And they got off the bus and then they never respond. So it's a lot longer. I don't have data on how long, but just anecdotally from the supervisors and the dispatchers that make the calls, it's significantly longer. Let me longer. ask both of you a question. Yes. Don't sit down yet, Anuj. Uh, my question is, in an ideal world, if you were snapping your fingers, how many uh, good guard or another company's security forces would you have on your buses during the daytime, during a prime shift? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, this is your future budget question. Don't fall. Ah, that was so, just deflecting. <laughs> uh, Mayor, uh, I personally, and I mean, I don't know if Lizette has a number in mind. Uh, what I would say, I mean, I, and I think it's an important point to sort of layer over this entire discussion, 
um, is that if you look at, and you know, Lizette provided really detailed numbers um, that you know I can share a few highlights for, but if you look at the overall incidents, you know, not not to minimize the seriousness of them, but if you think about, we have you know prior to COVID, you know, 10 to 12 million riders, now closer to 8 million riders, um, and as you said, 124 buses operating throughout our service area every day. Um, the overall number of um, sort of physical security incidences um, was, I think, in the 20s um, in terms of reported over the so year. very, very low. Two, yes. And so I think what, the point I wanted to make broadly is that our system overall is an exceptionally safe system as a transit system. It's exceptionally safe, I think, also relative, you know, to our peers that we have seen and observed and obviously work with Metro every day, but it's a very different situation experiencing a big blue bus in terms of the overall safety, cleanliness, passenger experience um, on the big blue bus. And I think we're very proud of that. And that's thanks to Lizette and her team, our operations team, our training, our maintenance across the board, right? And I think that's really important to, to underscore. Now we're in a really challenging environment and we have challenges that, that you all um, as a council wrestle with every day. And those are reflected on our buses. But I think, you know, just given the trade-off, if you ask me, I would rather be able to, of course, if we can find them and hire them and onboard them, you know, have a lot more operators, a lot more buses to expand our service than to have two guards on 124 buses. And, and in a world of limited resources, right, I think that's, this is a strategic move to support safety, support our operators. And, you know, um, and, and I mean, it, there is a, a public relations component, right, to, to cite your earlier phrase, but it's not a PR campaign. It's we're educating our customers educating the community in general about our safety and our customer experience in the Big Blue Bus. So I go back to the first thing I said that I'll move on because I know two other council members want to speak. But um, my first question really had to do with good guard and the length of contract, especially when even though I said that they provide a, a good service in our parking garages, I still hear three, four times a week that um, the service, while no service is perfect, that the service could still be improved. So will they have adequate supervision and will there be an opportunity to switch course if we need to quickly? Because I think one of the big things is for us to be nimble. Absolutely, and we, we will be monitoring the implementation of this program uh, from the start. And Lisette and her team will be working closely with our operations division to make sure our, our operators are trained on how to work with the good guards, if we spot problems, if we spot any challenges, we'll be on top of that. And then, as with all of our uh, contracts, of course, we do have a termination provision if necessary, but we certainly intend to manage it um, so that we never get anywhere close to that. Vice Mayor Negretti. First of all, I just want to highlight what you just said. I think we had 200 incidences, and you said there's 124 buses. So overall, um, safe transit system, and I think this is a testament to our response to what's happening, not just for our passengers, but also for our, our bus operators as well, to keep everybody safe and help them focus on doing the job that um, they're there to do, which is get everybody to and from um, safely so they can focus on the road. So I appreciate that we're doing this, and I think we should highlight that. I mean, this isn't this is more about the fact that we're, I don't know what other cities are doing, and I don't know that they're doing anything at all. So um, I appreciate that we took the time to do it. Um, but I do have one more question about the contract with Good Guard, because I was just doing the math roughly, and you said there's four guards, right, working eight-hour shifts, and at this 7.4 million, it's roughly like 123,000 a month that we're spending. I'm assuming there's administrative costs in there, but otherwise that means these guards are making 30,000 a month, and I will be leaving today and signing up for that <laughs> job if that's the case. No, no, no. So the, the, the contract, the total contract is for, there's, there's two components to it. There's our campus security, which is more than okay. half of the... Uh, contract amount, and then the other part is the transit safety officer program, which is what what your questions are about. But um, more than half of that contract is for the ongoing campus security that we have for the BBB facility and for the Gosamo Center. And if I'm correct, the campus security is 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day, um, and we also provide security at the Gosamo Center. And are those different types of securities, like in terms of what they carry on them or what level? They're all going to be unarmed. Okay, so they're all like the same. And do we, do when we pr procure these contracts, do we look at, you know, like best pay practices and things like that? Of course. How, what they're paying the security guards, obviously, I'm sure you know that hourly rate. Thank you. 
we know the hourly rate. Um, we don't have control over what the they bid. I mean, a lot of the contractors, I think, try to go for like the lowest bid. Um, this was all calculated based on hours as opposed to what what the total bid right. was proposed for. Um, but uh, I mean, we you know the city has the the living wage or ordinance, um, which is better than most cities, I would believe. But but there's no um, difference in in the um, pay for the campus security and then the safety officers that are boarding the buses. So what is this program costing? Do we know that number specifically out of the 7.4 yeah. million? Sure. So uh, for the first year, the just the, the transit safety officer program is about 755000 And then the campus security is 812000 That's just a... Uh, but is that is that and that cost that seven hundred fifty thousand is is just for the four guards or is there other costs? It's eight guards a day um, during the week and then four guards in the um, on the weekends um, okay. per day and then um, the guard supervisor. So there's always a supervisor okay. on site. Okay, makes more sense. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Council members, Wick. Thank you so much. Um, I, I too was just looking at the numbers and, and trying to make sense. Um, there's a there's a breakdown on the last page that indicates the two different contracts, I believe. Um, um, it's it's not the two different contracts. It's the two different accounts. Okay. So yeah, we already had an existing account for the campus security, and then there's a separate account that was added for the transit safety officer program. So, so it's not a, a split between both the programs. It's just the accounts that were allotted by finance. Okay. Um, the I'm just trying to understand the 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 twenty three twenty four numbers. If you took them out by five, they they wouldn't be as big as the ones that say future years amount. And I'm just trying to understand: is there like an escalating rate that's being uh, factored in, or or for twenty three twenty three twenty four? Well, I see the twenty three twenty four, yeah. and then it says future years amount. I'm just trying to understand what that is in relation to the first. Yeah, sure. So the twenty three twenty four is just a calculation of what we have um, left for the end of the fiscal year. So it ends on June 30th. Uh, okay. So that's what we anticipate that we're going to pay from whenever the contract is enacted, which we're hoping it would be March okay. till the end of the fiscal year. I see. I see. Okay. And then is the 1.5 number that was bid, is that is that the actual number that we'll be outlaying annually? Um, so for the first year, our costs came to about one, yeah, one point. One thousand five hundred sixty one million five hundred sixty seven thousand. Okay, got it. Um, for, for both uh, campus security and the safety officer. That's for both programs. Yes, yeah, for both. Programs. Are, are they? Um, how are they comparable in terms of hours, like man hours? Uh, for the campus versus the so our big blue bus facility has twenty four hour security. Um, we have uh, three different shifts. Uh, three guards, four guards on some shifts, depending on the time of day. Um, and then the safety officer program is just, um, we're doing 16 hours a day, weekdays, mm -hmm. eight hours a day, weekends, I guess and then as supervisor. Got it. I guess my question is, like, how much were we spending prior to this on the prior uh, contract annually? Um, I think our numbers for this year were in the uh, I think we're going to end up paying. I, I don't have those numbers. It's going to be about seven seven hundred thousand oh. for the under the existing contract. Roughly half. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, but I I, I don't have the exact numbers. Okay, that's okay. Um, it, it's in our budget yeah. though, so it's within. And are these accounts? Um, are the money that's being used to pay for this? Is it is it just unencumbered? It could be used in any way throughout our uh, DOT or the funds from any specific place, or is it just? enterprise funds that could be used for any purpose. Well, I think one thing, Liz, out there, yeah. news you may want to clarify is the part of the motivation for this contract actually comes from um, the bipartisan infrastructure law. So you may want to explain the context for why um, we're sort of pushed yeah. into a position of having to do this. Sure. So um, as part of uh, President Biden's um, bipartisan infrastructure law changes, part um, of those requirements um, 
uh, have in them that uh, transit agencies have to provide uh, mitigations to reduce assaults on transit workers. Um, it's part of 49 USC section 5329 if you're interested in looking it up and it changed the requirements for our um, uh, public transportation agency safety plan. Um, so uh, we are required to provide mitigations for transit operator assaults, especially if we see that the number of assaults on operators are increasing, which we have been seeing in the past few years. Um, so that's part of the reason why we're also implementing this program. To so are some of the funds also potentially coming from this um, from the Federal Infrastructure Act? I'm not sure where the funding is coming from. Good evening, Council Member. Um, so no, the, the, these are all sourced from the BBB Enterprise Fund, but they're not, the funds aren't sourced to the Infrastructure Act, but the requirements that was that referred to in terms of um, enhanced safety for operators are uh, part of the funding requirements going forward for FTA funding. Okay, and um, I mean, those requirements, I imagine there's some latitude in how we would interpret the, that, that sort of ruling that was just uh, spoken about, or is it sort of say that you have to hire private security, or I'm just not sure. It's not that prescriptive, no. It's, but it's, it speaks to enhanced operator safety, enhanced safety on transit systems, but it doesn't say do it this way. Got it. Um, and uh, I guess just speaking to the numbers that you mentioned earlier, uh, Luceth, uh you said there was an increase in uh, assaults or other other disruptions. Um, can you speak to the numbers in that regard? Sure. Um, so as far as operator assaults, um, 2023, for example, um, and the assaults include physical assaults as well as um, any threats. And this is per the FTA's definition of what is considered a reportable um, assault on an operator. So these are issues that we have to report through the National Transit Database. Um, so for that definition, in 2022, we had 22 assaults on operators. In 2023, we had 27 assaults on operators. And then as far as just disturbances, um, and the disturbances are incidents that happen on the buses that require us to um, pull the bus over. It's a service disruption, call, contact law enforcement. In 2022, we had 75. And in 2023, we had 83. So not huge numbers, um, you know, considering the size of our system, but we are seeing increases gradually. And is this something also that bus operators are citing um, to you? I'm sorry? Is this also something that bus operators are citing that they w are, are asking for in any way? Or, or Oh, they, or, yeah, they definitely appreciate the um, efforts that we're making to, to keep them safe, to add added security to the buses. So, um, you know, previously they were asking for um, law enforcement officers to ride on the buses. We already went through that and we're not able to um, get officers on board the buses. There's a lot of restrictions to that, you know, jurisdictional and all that. So then this is the next option that we have. Got it. And I, I assume we're going to be um, monitoring the effectiveness here with, you know, if, if we see that we've been spending an extra, you know, half a million to a million dollars a year and these numbers aren't changing, we can, you know, review yes. that. <laughs> Definitely. So some of the performance measures that we set for Good Guard were we want to see at least a 10% decrease in security incidents. Um, and then we're going to factor in uh, revenue service hours and ridership to make sure that, you know, if one year, um, you know, as we're seeing our service increase, our ridership increase, that's probably going to, we're probably going to see a rise in incidents as well. So I want to make sure that it's um, even. Um, they're also going to be distributing um, resource cards to uh, people on the buses if there's persons um, experiencing homelessness. Um, part of their um, process is that they want to distribute resource cards to see if we can get people connected to services. Um, so we will be tracking that, how many cards they're giving out, things like that. Um, and then we're also doing a survey with our operators. Um, uh, at the next round of safety meetings, which is February 12th, um, just getting their sense of um, security on the buses, any recommendations that they have, areas that they want us to focus on, and then doing a follow-up survey with them after six months to see if there have been any improvements in their sense of safety while on board. Thank you. That's great. Well, thank you. I have one last question, and then we can call for a vote. Yes, sir. Uh, what is the total amount of buses in our inventory? 195. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. How do we have 200 and whatever at the peak hours? Uh, it's 124 at peak. How many? 124. 120. <laughs> Sorry, I was totally 
lost there for a minute. Um, Council Member Parra, would you like to move this? I would like to move it. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Parra, a second by Negrete, and a roll call vote. Council Member Zwick? Yes. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Council Member Tarosis? Yes. Council Member De Villa Torre? Yes. Sorry. Mayor Brock? Yes. And that motion passes unanimously. Item 5K, award bid to Unisur Facility Services for Citywide Contracted Custodial Services. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Rick Valtier, Director of Public Works. And I believe there are a, a couple of quick questions on this. Um, and would you like to start or should I start? I think Councilmember Parra, Councilmember Negretti. No, it, yeah, I think Councilmember yeah. De La Torre. Sorry. So, uh, so. similarly to the uh, last discussion on 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 the on on contracts and selection, um, I had a, a concern. I know that that we require a living wage, which is good, you know, for workers um, that we have that. But beyond li a living wage requirements, is there anything else in the criteria? that staff is looking at to ensure, for example, like um, I, I didn't see anywhere, I didn't, I didn't read that they're a unionized um, uh, business, are they? are they? Are they a union or not? They're not. Uniserv is not a unionized uh, firm. Okay. And um, do we know if there's any like unresolved worker complaints or anything, uh, any issues with any um, uh, you know, unionization efforts that, that that have, you know, met some sort of confrontation from the from the vendor. I'm not aware of any uh, issues with the unions with this vendor. No. Okay, and in terms of our, in in our criteria, we don't assess for that. I mean, I saw that we we uh, we look at CEQA. Uh, there was like a a CEQA analysis to see if there's an impact to the environment, but we don't. We don't generally look at sort of worker type issues like wages, benefits, and so forth in, in assessing uh, these vendors. Uh, Kyla Johnson with facilities maintenance. That was one of the questions that we asked with regard to any unionized issues. And we asked all our vendors to submit the response and the incumbent Uniserv, no. Okay. Okay. So I just, yeah, I wanted to make sure that, that we look at that. Maybe in the future we could, council can have a discussion around sort of more specific criteria to guide this process so that we ensure that all of our contractors, these are long-term contracts and they're, you know, $5 million plus. They're not small contracts. They're, they're, they're large contracts. And so we just want to make sure that we're doing right by the workforce that, that uh, you know, that's the foundation of, of these businesses, right, that we're contracting. So thank you very much. Thank you. Vice Mayor Negretti. I know, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, city manager, I think you sent me a response, but I didn't get to see it by the time I got to it. Um, can you just, exp we were, I was asking questions earlier about outsourcing, which is fine, but ver versus doing it in-house. Like, what's the cost savings to us? Um, it's roughly $800,000 a year, uh, okay. wages alone, um, but then that doesn't include the cost for vehicles, uniform, equipment, uh, supplies, potentially office space. So it's a significant cost increase if we brought these services in-house. And then the other question, I didn't get to read the answer because I think I got it late in the afternoon before I came here, which was, I think it was asking about the breakdown of pay or like how the, because you guys put these large numbers out and then it's hard to tell like, you know, 38 people and then it's got this multi-million dollar contract. I'm assuming there's, a, I know there's a couple supervisors in there, but it's a little bit hard to gauge like what people are getting paid at the administrative level with these companies versus what we're actually paying the people who are coming in and doing the work. So if you're interested in, I think the hourly wage for these folks, I think it was 20, 28. 20 hour. an hour. So they're above the, the living wage, right? I mean, same comment just goes towards, I see that there's multi-year renewals, just, I know this is a major company that's, you know, but we're, we're hoping to look at other companies that, um, to give other companies an opportunity. So just the same comment about, you know, give, looking outside of the, 
of giving contracts to companies that you know may not have all the big large contracts but are still capable of doing the job and maybe it's being pieced out I don't know how that works or if that works maybe it doesn't but just something to consider we'll definitely keep that Thanks. in mind thank you council member Tarosis. yeah um, do you know if this was a low bid contract it's always best best bidder um, but we awarded it to the lowest most responsive bidder right in this case yeah, so I think that like inherently we might want to think about whether that makes the most sense um, in all different contracts. Because, for example, um, when we're talking about like facility services, these are a lot of the types of jobs that a lot of folks who are operating social enterprises work with. I know that there's a couple of folks on this list who responded who actually do workforce development programs um, for folks to get into these entry level jobs. And when there are career ladders such as opportunities in unions I think that that's really important so I would just echo I mean obviously there I don't I didn't see that there was a protest there's nothing inherently wrong on, on the face with what you're presenting but I think for the future it would be important for us to look at what we're evaluating and like what makes the most sense beyond just like a low bid contract thanks thank you uh, would council member delatory would you like to move this item and do we yes, have a second? Uh, so, so move. Do we have a second? second? We have a second by Vice Mayor Negretti. The motion by Council Member Della Torre. Can we have a roll call vote? Council Member Zwick? Yes. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Airport Tim Negrete? Yes. Council Member Tarosis? Yes. Council Member Della Torre? Yes. And Mayor Brock? Yes. That item passes unanimously. And we move on. To items, go ahead. I'm sorry. Item six, public input for remaining agenda items only. Public comment is permitted on ordinances for introduction and first reading. No public discussion is permitted on ordinance for second reading and adoption. And just a reminder, uh, items 8A and 10D were removed from the agenda, so no public input will be heard on those two items. We have 26 speakers in the queue. Um, the first, I'll call the first three names if you could please light up against the wall. Denise Barton, Jerry Rubin, and Angela Scott. Yes, okay. we, we heard your name called. Okay. And Ms. Barton, I, you're signed up twice. Do, uh, can I, have I, a, I have a 10 item and a 16 item. Right, so can I ask you four minutes for uh, total? Okay, thanks. Good evening. For item 10A, Article 11 Election Code. My question would be, wouldn't the candidate statement of qualifications fee seem a little excessive, especially since the county hasn't taken final action? In addition, you're almost saying you're gouging the candidate by the statement of, the city shall refund the excess amount within 30 days of the election. This action wouldn't be so the city can make a little more interest, would it? Or would this action be so so that due to income, not everyone can participate in running for office? Are you planning on have, to have some kind of low-income fee waivers so that everyone can participate? Or would this action be a way of trying to control who can run in the 2024 election? Oh, and does the city still use the many voting machines? I ask in case you didn't hear about how a judge sealed and covered up the results of the investigation of Dominion voting machines in Georgia. The report confirmed that votes uh, can be altered on the Dominion voting machines with just a pencil and that the Dominion software is vulnerable and can be hacked. So does Smur have a hacker? And the city has a depart an IT department, doesn't it? Just something for everyone to think about. Maybe in the upcoming election we should do go back to paper ballots. But again, the candidate's statement of qualification fee does seem excessive. Also, isn't one of the city's purposes to run elections? Then why are you trying to charge extra for it? Next, finally on item 16F, I'm confused as the city council members, are you supposed to represent everyone of all races and not show preferential treatment to one group over all others based on race? I mean, if you want to give $10,000 to the Santa Monica High School Black Students Union, that's fine. But shouldn't you need to give all the other racial student unions such as this one the same amount? It just shows how unequal your version of equity inclusion really is. 
And did council member Zwick Davis and Teresa's miss the fact that you have many account funds to repay as a result of the settlement for the Powell lawsuit? Or are you planning on not repaying those funds? I, ha I hate to think that you're baiting the black community reparations for the upcoming election. And didn't you bait the black community with reparations during the last election? I mean, since the city doesn't really have the funds for any kind of reparations project, right? Thank you. Question. Looks like Jerry's gone. Um, Angela Scott. And Angela, before you start speaking, I'm going to call the next three names. Awesome. Uh, Abrielle Gomez. They went home. Okay. She Jillian Gomez, too? Yep, mom went home, too. Okay. Erica Leslie. And Denny Zane. You can go ahead, uh, Ms. Scott. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Brock, Mayor Pro Tem Negrete, Council Members Davis, De La Torre, Tor uh, Tarosa, Zwick, and Para. I'm speaking on item 16F. Um, I come to you today as president of the African American Parent Student Staff Support Group, and I stand on the shoulders of ancestors such as Robbie Jones, Maurice Maxwell, Dr. Shirley Compton, and Louis Alexander. Many of them are former Samo High alumni and understand the importance of supporting our next generation of thought leaders, innovators, scholars, and elected officials. We can only effectively prepare our Black Student Union when we have adequate financial needs to promote student leadership development, camaraderie, and engagement with peers at Samo High, as well as throughout the California United Black Student Union, which I am a product of, and it's celebrating its 50th year in existence. We have at Samuel High an exciting group of 70 plus students that meet every Wednesday to connect, to build, and to grow together. Following the COVID-19 global pandemic, we are seeing kids struggling physically, emotionally, and socially. And we are centered on black joy and empowering these students for the road ahead. Every child deserves a place at school where they feel included and that they belong. We are cultivating communities of including, inclusion and belonging. It's our job through the parents and BSU to cultivate spaces such as that. Your generous support helps us in doing so with programs like the Rites of Passage, which is going into its 27th year, thanks to Robbie Jones, as well as Apollo Night and the Black College Expo. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Okay, so once again for this mic, if you guys could just break it up just a little bit. <laughs> With this height discrimination up in here. <laughs> We're actually working on it. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to. Once you get six feet, that's it. Listen, I'm the vice chair of the African American Student Staff Support Group. There is nowhere else that you see students this much on fire. There's nowhere else where you have black culture celebrated. These children are on fire because they can learn about their culture. The rites of passage in its 27th year, I remember when my son graduated in 2017, that was the last year that they celebrated through junior high and high school. This is something that our children look forward to and they're excited to be a part of. We need a place where they can belong and it's not a problem to be black. They need to be included. Please support us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Leslie. Jenny Zane. I don't see him. I'm going to call the next three names. Harvey Etter, Anya Baroff, and Amy Gottstein. Howdy. My name's Harvey Etter. I'm speaking for myself and for the Public Solar Power Coalition. I'm speaking on 10B, and I'm opposed to it, and we need more time to go over everything that's coming down here. Uh, number one, 
a common sense exemption to CEQA. I don't know what that is. I should know probably, and I don't know why it's being used here. I, I smell a rat when I look. You're trying to get around environmental laws. Okay. On the on number two, you've got tenants protection and t housing anti discrimination code, tenants harassment code, and the one I'm really concerned. All of those are concerned, but tenants buyout agreements code. Okay. There is two and a half million dollars housing and community development in the next six years by 2030 that's going to be built in the state, okay? At an average of a million dollars a unit, which is not unheard of, that's two and a half trillion dollars, a million times more, okay? Now we're talking about a lot of money, okay? In the city, they're talking six to nine thousand units, and a million, but we're talking five to ten billion dollars, okay? It says 40% of that has to be distributed to very, very low income, very low income, and low middle income. That's a lot of money right there. Okay, I called housing community, I'm talking to policy people, and I want you all to do the same thing, that we have got to set, we want the $500 grants, we went to that equity thing, we're gonna try to organize and talk to homeless people that have top priority. Also, there's other ways of financing, there's the tax credits that are go down, we can take those crackers, they're marketable, okay? Also, that there's tax exempt property that gets sold for pennies on the dollar, we should have right of first refusal on all these programs for the very low, as according to need, and this stuff about to the well-informed and the influential, to hell with y'all. Enough is enough. This culture's got to change. I will incorporate by reference Piketty's books on, on uh, capital in the 21st century and capital in ideology. Two thirds of the country has seen no interest in equity or, or interest in the productivity's gone up to one tenth of one percent. Thank you, Mr. Green. 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 Thank you, Mr. That's okay? Yes. Okay. So you'll have, you'll have four minutes okay. total. Okay. My name's Anya Baroff, and I grew up in Santa Monica. I went to Samo High and graduated with degrees in neuroscience and education from Harvard. And I believe that tenant protections and safety measures should be inclusive for all constituents, especially those with disabilities who have statistically higher rates for discrimination with rent control ordinance, um, especially with corporate landlords. Mm -hmm. An equitable housing right should support measures for, inclus for inclusivity, especially for domestic violence survivors who have statistically higher rates for unstable housing, according to reports from local Santa Monica DV shelters, and more unhoused women. Um, there are more unhoused women than there have been historically, and we need to implement further initiatives to support DV survivors to remain safely housed. Um, additionally, those with disabilities and DV survivors should be prioritized um, to be able to leave unsafe living conditions and be supported by the city and peace officers. Um, okay, and then for 16E, for the Disability Commission accountability, um, I believe that advocacy, inclusion, and continuously showing up for the disability community is important to create sustainable change, and people on the commission should uh, value their significant role with respect to that. And this requires people who are dedicated to sustainable change and care deeply for the disability community and have experience working within the community in many capacities. And this is especially true when groups who identify with disabilities come forward to the police to report crimes. Recently, according to the Disability Rights Law and Policy Center, 30 to 50% of victims with disabilities are subjected to uh, use of force by police unnecessarily, um, which is really unacceptable. And there should be extra inclusionary measures to provide resources that allow for non-discriminatory practices. And empathy rather than criminalization should support di the disability community at large within Santa Monica. One recent example that I want to bring to your attention that could use reform are for police officers who, for those who have at least three instances of abuse of power on their record within the Santa Monica Police Department, and City Council should be made aware that there should be more uh, learning opportunities for these police officers with misconduct on their record, um, especially when they're 
potentially mishandling crimes um, that have been reported to internal affairs is one example is a victim that came forward was handcuffed and placed on a 5150 is a form of retaliation for speaking up about their experience of misconduct and this is not acceptable for people with disabilities to experience um, especially when victims are brave enough to come forward to report crimes they should never be accused of filing false police reports they should be listened to and respected. And I believe that trauma-informed care rather than criminalized methodologies for those with disabilities would help equity and inclusion measures within the city to reduce unnecessary use of force by the police. And the city of Santa Monica should adopt a criminalized survivors program as a part of the survivors first program, which has already been adopted by LA County by Mayor Bass in the DA's office. Um, and this includes protections for HIPAA and Marcy's laws um, as basic human rights for those with disabilities. And I look forward to substantial changes to support the disability equity and inclusion measures within the city and ongoing advocacy within the Disability Commission um, as it's important to have people on the commission that deeply care. Thanks. Um, Ms. Amy Gottstein? No, Ms. Gottstein? Okay, I'm going to call the next set of names. Carl Hansen, Brad Ewing, and Peterson Lofton. Uh, good evening, Mayor Brock and Council Members. Uh, Carl Hansen, uh, Santa Monica Renner. Um, Co-chair Santa Monica Forward, uh, former housing commissioner, um, speaking tonight as co-chair of Santa Monica Forward. Um, we strongly support the uh, tenant protections uh, proposed in item 10B. Um, our current housing and um, our, our current housing crisis and homelessness crisis um, are, are truly, truly like the tragic um, issue of our time. Um, I think. People not familiar with the complexities of the homelessness issue often think um, that nothing's getting done um, in this because they don't see the, the problem shrinking. Um, but when you get into it, you see that city programs, county programs, nonprofit programs are, are getting people off the streets and into supportive services. It's just more people are, are losing their, their housing and uh, th then we can take off, off the streets. Um, and because of that, like one of the best ways to address homelessness is to prevent it before it starts with tenant protections um, like you're considering this evening. Um, tomorrow night is the homelessness count. I've been doing that for 10 years with many other Santa Monicans and, and others volunteering. Um, hope you'll move this forward tonight and this along with other things can help actually block those numbers uh, in the near future because this is uh, horrible and we can't let this go on and lo love to see this proposed and please move it forward. Thank you. Brad Ewing. I'm going to speak on 10B and 16G, but I'll try to keep it to two minutes. Okay. You'll have four. I'll give you the four. All right. Thank you. Well, good evening, Council. Happy New Year. Good to be back. Uh, I'm Brad Ewing, the other co-chair of Santa Monica Ford. Uh, I'm here to urge you all to support, uh, and I'm also a rent control tenant. I wanted to highlight that. But uh, we want to uh, urge you all to support all the recommendations that are outlined in the staff report uh, on 10B, uh, including the proposed charter amendments to be put up for a ballot in November. Uh, look, many of the homeless on our streets today are there as a direct result uh, of an eviction and preventing unjust evictions uh, is a necessary step to tackle the homeless crisis. And I think as Carl pointed out, a lot of homelessness isn't, it's not static, it's people flowing in and out of homelessness. And so in the county of Los Angeles, we, uh, you know, every day about 220 people fall into homelessness every day while 200 people get out. And so the only way that we can sort of start to make progress instead of, you know, trying to fight upstream is to stem the tide of people falling into homelessness. And on 16G, I'm speaking in support. I'd like to thank you, Councilmember Parra and Vice Mayor Negretti, uh, for bringing this item forward. It's really great to see acknowledgement that downtown is overparked and that we should be putting people over cars. Our oil rink, I think, is the exact sort of activity that we need in downtown to help revitalize our uh, our community. And I hope you all will support that tonight. Have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Yeah. Thank you, I'm going to call the next set of names. Sure. Robbie Jones, Natalia Zernitskaya, and Michael Soloff. Great. 
Thank you, Council Members. Um, I was here about three or four months ago to speak to you about the proliferation of oversized vehicles in certain residential neighborhoods of the city. Um, there's proposed amendments uh, on the agenda today, uh, enacting some common sense reforms, which I'm very supportive of. Anuj and the rest of the Department of Transportation have proposed some very common sense amendments, both to allow residents who have oversized vehicles to park them, but also to prevent non-residents from abusing these privileges and also uh, residents from parking their vehicles in other neighborhoods where they don't live. Um, he's going to present. You'll ask him questions, but just wanted to come and register my support for the changes that are on the agenda. Thank you. Robbie Jones. Good evening, everybody. Happy New Year. Glad to be back. Glad to be seen. Glad to see you all. Um, I missed the Black History Month tribute. Uh, hopefully I'll catch it online, but thank you for that. Um, I'm here to support uh, Council Member Tarosis, Zoic, Gleam, Davis, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's wonderful that we are moving in the right direction, considering it's been a minute since we did the Black Apology. Um, I appreciate um, <clears throat> all of the efforts that are happening and that are in your proposal to uh, give the money to the BSU. I think that's great. Um, I think that putting the plaque out front is a wonderful thing. Uh, reading the apology every year is good, but action is key. So I think that as we move forward, you know, CRJ sent a laundry list of things from the community that we can do. So I just am happy to see some of those things happening. However, um, in regards to Samo High, creating the African Parent Group in 1992, um, I've been on that campus. I've seen parents and I've spent definitely a lot of money out of my own pocket to make sure the kids have the black graduation, to make sure that the parents are getting trained and know how to do everything that they need to do to keep their parent group going. And I think, you know, the kids going to black college fair is a great precursor to going, deciding what college they want to go to. So putting some efforts towards those things are very important too. So 10,000 is good. Is there next guy? Because I'm speaking on 10B, um, uh, 16F, and 16G, but I'll keep it to four minutes. Okay. So Santa Monica has long been a leader and an example to other cities on tenant protections. And as a majority renter community, uh, tenant protections are absolutely key to protecting our city's residents and preserving our city's diversity. I recently got to experience Santa Monica's very strong tenant protections firsthand um, because my apartment flooded in September when a pipe burst in the apartment above mine. Um, and it took about six hours from when I first reported it um, to the landlord or to the emergency property maintenance line and about seven hours from when it started leaking uh, for the plumber to get there and shut off the water and start repairs. Uh, and I was actually displaced for about three months. Without going into too much detail, I would just like to share that I'm incredibly glad that I live in Santa Monica and not somewhere else uh, because all of the departments and individuals that I've had to call on for guidance and assistance have helped me personally to feel like we not only have strong tenant protections on paper, but that they're also enforced. However, even though I personally have had a good experience and a positive experience with the, the city's efforts to enforce tenant protections, thanks to code enforcement, building and safety, rent control department, now the consumer affairs division of the city attorney's office, the city manager's office, um, there's still a lot of folks who are falling through the cracks and there are still a lot of work to do to make sure that our tenants are protected. So I 
do highly urge you, strongly urge you, I should say, strongly urge you to please adopt the staff recommendation. Um, but I will note that with the regards to the suggestion to explore uh, the city charter amendments, I recommend that you utilize the expertise and guidance of our rent control board who are duly elected to help protect tenants. Uh, prior to adding any potential charter amendments to the ballot, the rent control board should at the very least be consulted and preferably should be part of helping to craft any sort of proposed charter amendments. On 16F, um, I will try to be brief because a lot of folks have already said a lot of really great things and I echo um, what many of other folks have said so far, I urge you to please vote yes on it. Um, while I did send in written public comment, I did want to verbally express one suggestion um, that when the city manager is exploring installation of the Black Apology outside of City Hall, maybe also Belmar Triangle, um, it would be really impactful if it could be installed in different languages. We know that not all Santa Monicans are English speakers. We also know that the African American community in Santa Monica is not a monolith, and there's lots of various groups, including our uh, Ethiopian Santa Monica community, um, who speak other languages like Amharic. And also Santa Monica is an international travel destination. We have visitors from all over. It'd be cool if they could read it in their own native languages. <laughs> 16G, thank you so much, Council Member Para and Mayor Pro Tem Negretti, sorry, Vice Mayor Negretti, uh, for bringing this forward. I think a roller rink would be amazing there. I think it would be fantastic if it could be there in the summer when kids are out of school and when there's tourists to drive more folks to that end of downtown. I really appreciate you bringing this forth to help support our economic recovery um, and also to you know have that land be a good use of space when it's not ice. Thank you guys so much. Um, have a great rest of your evening and look forward to hearing your discussion. Thank you. Thank you Natalia. Mr. Uh, Michael Soloff and before you start Mr. Soloff uh, I'm going to call the last two speakers Ellis Raskin and Barry. Set. Good evening, Michael Soloff. I'm here as co-chair of Santa Monica's for Renters' Rights. SMER for the last 45 years has fought to have the strongest possible protections for renters in our city. They make up a majority of our population, and if we have any hope of maintaining diversity of all types in the city, we have to maintain those controls. Recently, the city and county of LA have moved beyond where we are as a city in terms of those protections, and we really appreciate the council directed staff to come back with an ordinance to try and catch us up to the city and county of LA. Um, and it's important that you pass that tonight. Apparently, a critical part of this, which is the protections against eviction, can't be done by ordinance. If we're going to look to change the charter, Smur respectfully requests that that be directed to the Rent Control Board. They also have 45 years of experience dealing with what's in the Charter, um, and that's the group that should be drafting any language and bringing forward recommendations to you of what to put on the ballot. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Soloff. Ellis Raskin. Thank you, uh, Mayor Brock and uh, members of the council. I'm also going to speak uh, briefly on items uh, 10B and 16F. Uh, I'll join my, vo my voice with a chorus of folks who are supporting the renter protections as part of 10B. I myself am a renter in a rent control department, and honestly, I wouldn't be here in Santa Monica were it not for the decades of hard work that community members have put into protecting tenants, and we need to continue that work with the common sense amendments that are put before you tonight with respect to the municipal code. Uh, I will say, however, that the amendments to the charter should be put before our elected experts in that field, the Rent Control Board. They're specifically elected by the people of our city to make sure that our tenants in rent control buildings are protected and to pass charter amendments without their input and without their expertise would be a disservice to our community. Uh, with respect to 16F, I'll again join my voice in the chorus of folks in support of this. Uh, words are important, uh, but actions do speak louder than words. Uh, obviously, no amount of money or no amount of actions we take now can undo the past harm. 
uh, but we need to start. Uh, supporting black students is crucial. Uh, supporting black members of our community now is also crucial. Uh, and I uh, really like the idea of, of uh, writing the plaque in, in different languages. I think that's a fantastic idea, and I'll add my voice to supporting that. Uh, thank you all. That's all I've got. Barry Snell. Thank you so much. And Mr. Snell, I have you down three times. Are you speaking on three? That is items? correct. Uh, 10B, and I think it's 16G and 16F, if that's okay. Do you okay. want two, two minutes per item? Please. I don't think I'll need to take all that time for council. Um, Good evening, Mayor Brock and City Council members. Barry Snell here. My first item is item 10. I, I'm very much supportive of the city's tenant protection laws. Uh, I've read the adopted recommendations, and I strongly, strongly recommend that council take a look at it. Uh, you've heard from many people tonight that support it. One of the amendments, which I think is really important, where we add and define the housing status to the protective clause class, it's really important. People that are unhoused really have a difficult time finding housing if they have to talk about their present situation when they're applying. So I think that's one important rule. And I support the I support the resolution to amend the city charter with respect to that also. And I also with respect to this protection, with all these amendments, enforcement is important. If we can't enforce these items, then the words that we put on this amendment don't mean anything. So enforcement, I strongly recommend. With respect to 16G, you heard from many African-American parents. I will also, when my children went to Santa Monica High School, I was president of the African-American parent group. It was an amazing program. I think for our African-American student, it really gives them um, a feeling of being belonged in this community. It shows uh, them identity, shows them respect. So I strongly recommend um, the adoption of the statement outside for the apology, I think that's important to, for it. Just shows that we, as a community, care about our African American um, students. I also am appreciative that we're going to allocate ten thousand dollars to the organization. It's really important. Many of these students come to our school with not the resources to be able to apply for for house, a school. You know, I'm a trustee for Santa Monica College. I see it every day with our African American students about having to fund things. And so this is really important for our high school students. And then finally, I really like looking at reparation and coming back in 180 days with some kind of proposals to our city council members. It really makes sense. This is where the state is going, and I think that we need to be leaders with, with representation for Santa Monica residents. And then finally, I've been on the downtown Santa Monica board for 10 years, uh, a long time. We've gone through an enormous amount of um, changes, um, and we're coming back after COVID that, to reactivate downtown. And I'm really excited that we're looking into how we can activate our parking lot. Uh, and the idea about Lot 27, whereby which we look as a temporary basis in August, a two-month program to be able to do roller skating, which will fall right into our ice skating rink. And if anyone went to our ice skating rink this year, we was amazing. I just want to let you know, we really did a great job coming back out of COVID. Uh, our support from our from our investors were, were, was great. I haven't seen the numbers yet, but I do believe, and I've been out there many nights, it looked beautiful. I mean, those of you that went out, the night was looked beautiful. The roller rink will bring back and activate our downtown, which is really important. We need to come back. We need to activate our community. And to, to roller skate is an amazing thing. So I just love what's happening tonight, and I support everything that council is doing. So thank you very much. And that completes public input for tonight. Great. Thank everyone for speaking. And let's move on. Member 8A has been pulled by staff, will not be heard this evening. And we're on to ordinances. Ordinances. Public comment is permitted on ordinances for introduction and first reading. No public discussion is permitted on ordinances for second reading and adoption. In accordance with Charter Section 615, the adoption of all ordinances and resolutions shall be by reading of title only unless a council member present dissents. Item 10A, introduction and first reading of an ordinance updating Santa Monica Municipal Code, Article 11, Elections Code. 
Um, good evening, Mayor Brock and Council Members. I'm Maria Dakenai, uh, Acting Assistant City Clerk. And uh, it has been this office's practice to review and clean up the election code as we prepare for the upcoming election. So the three amendments before you are, uh, number one, to include the new candidate statement and initiative fees that were adopted with the fiscal year 2023-2025 budget. The second one is to make a, a small clerical change regarding the candidate guide that our office publishes. And uh, the last one is to delete references to obsolete uh, state election codes. So this ends my very brief presentation and the uh, interim city clerk and I are available for questions. Second. I move. She seconded. <laughs> I'm sorry, Negrete and Tarosis. Thank you. Council Member Zwick? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I had a, a question yes. on this item. Um, the cost has risen only if you want to be included in the county booklet. Is that true? Um, has risen? Well, um, I mean, it, it depends on the... Or it used to be covered by the city. It used to be covered by the city. And uh, what do we anticipate the cost is to the city if we continue to cover it? And uh, can you explain why the county cost is as high as it is? Um, so we are proposing um, 1100 for city council and rent control board ca uh, candidate statements and 1200 for college and... Uh, school board um, and it is um, it, it, it is uh, this is based on the county's uh, most recent estimate um, so I, I think it's just based on their overall cost um, and I'm sorry I think there was a second question that I don't remember so my, my questions were how much of that cost is it are the um, people who are running for election paying for the entire cost, or is there still some subsidy? Um, this is the cost uh, that we propose that the candidates pay. Um, if the county's uh, next estimate is higher, then the city and the other agencies would absorb the cost. But um, based on uh, past estimates, this is what we think. What is, is in the fee. consensus in LA County out, out of the 88 cities, how many charge um, people who are running for election, how many cover it? Uh, very few. Very few, few cover? Yes, most um, charge uh, the cost back to the candidate. Okay. And do we have any type of program if it is a low-income person who wants to run for rent control board or city council that we will still cover based upon need part of that expense? Because that's a lot of expense for somebody unless they're out raising money. Uh, we don't have a program, but I think I should clarify um, the candidate statement is optional. Uh, so it's not something that's required of all candidates. So you can still run without submitting um, a candidate statement. Um, we will offer to all candidates to post their information on the city's website. So if there is a, a website or a social media page that we can link back to, that's another way to help them with their campaign. It's just printing it. Do we have any type of needs program that we could institute? Um, I mean, not at this time. This was something that was approved uh, with the last budget. Um, so I, um, I, I would, yeah, I, I'm not sure if, um, I mean, we're just proposing um, that this ordinance, I mean, it's a, this fee be in the law because a recent resident So this was is an optional cost. You don't have to go into the county voting pamphlets. No. Okay. All righty. Thank you. We can call for a roll call vote if there are no other questions. Okay. Just to confirm, maker was Negrete and the seconder was Tarosis. Mm -hmm. Council Member Zwick? Yes. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Council Member Tarosis? Yes. Council Member De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Brock? Yes, that motion passes unanimously. Next item is item 10B, um, introduction and first reading of an ordinance amending the tenants, um, city's, ten, city's tenant protection laws and discussion of potential resolution for charter amendments for additional tenant protections.
Good evening. Um, for those I haven't met, my name is Romy Ganshaw. I'm the Chief Deputy City Attorney for the City Attorney's Consumer Protection Unit. Thanks for having me this evening. So um, there's quite a lot in this tenant protection ordinance. So uh, I've prepared a, a PowerPoint to try to review some of the, the key um, elements of this ordinance. So um, the, the tenant protection ordinance really does works in five different areas in our current municipal code. So the first series of amendments are to the tenant relocation code. Um, and the first primary amendment would be to uh, require a payment of a permanent relocation fee to any tenant who chooses to move after receiving a large rent increase. And the large rent increase really is defined as uh, a rent increase of 5% uh, plus inflation or 10%, whichever is lower. So this is the amount that's currently uh, the maximum amount, maximum amount that a landlord can increase rents for um, units that are subject to the State Tenant Protection Act. If a unit's not subject to the State Tenant Protection Act or rent control, and a landlord seeks to increase the rent by greater than that amount, the tenant would have the option to receive permanent relocation fee rather than staying in the unit and trying to afford this large rent increase. Um, the second series of amendments to the relocation ordinance have to do with other types of constructive evictions that tenants might face. Um, just like uh, a large rent increase might constructively evict a tenant, so might other types of um, these other types of situations, including a tenant being uh, kept out of their unit for an extended period of time due to um, temporary relocation because the unit's not inhabitable, um, a determination that the tenant was forced out because of an illegal lockout or landlord harassment, or a determination that the unit's not habitable, won't be made habitable, or cannot be permitted. So this is, again, uh, to address situations where a tenant is forced to move through no fault of their own. They would also be eligible for permanent relocation assistance. Uh, the second series of amendments has to do with our buyout offers and agreements code. So currently the um, buyout code addresses or um, is, is housed in our tenant harassment ordinance. The amendments would move those uh, that code into their own chapter within the municipal code. And it would also expand the protections to apply not just to rent controlled units, but to all units that are subject to local just cause eviction protections. So when the, uh, the buyout ordinance was initially adopted in 2015, we did have uh, just cause eviction protections for most multifamily uh, housing in Santa Monica. But as of 2020, many of those units that also that had just cause eviction protections now also have limits on how much the landlord can raise the rent due to the State Tenant Protection Act. So a number of those units now have a version of rent control that applies to them. So many of the reasons why the initial um, buyout agreement ordinance was passed applied to those units as well. So these amendments would expand those protections. Um, in addition to expanding the protections, the uh, amendments would uh, require that any buyout agreement that's reached be for at least the permanent relocation fee amount that a tenant would receive if they were to be um, evicted for no fault of their own, and provide that a landlord's failure to file a buyout agreement with the city could be raised as an affirmative defense to an eviction if the tenant's evicted. The uh, ordinance would also require new written disclosures be provided to tenants before engaging in buyout negotiations. So there's already a requirement to provide certain written disclosures. Um, and this ordinance would add to those uh, a notice to the tenant that if they tell their landlord they don't want to be uh, consider a buyout agreement and the landlord continues to offer the tenant buyout offers um, within a short period of time after that, that could be tenant harassment and also a notice to the tenant that they're entitled to at least the permanent relocation fee amount and what that amount is. Uh, the next series or the next amendment is to the Tenant Protection Code, um, and this would um, introduce a new affirmative defense to a tenant who's not subject to rent control, so there's no legal limit on how much the landlord can raise the rent. But again, many of these tenants do have just cause eviction protections in Santa Monica. And so in, if a tenant who has a just cause eviction or is, is protected from being evicted without cause and their landlord increases the rent in, uh, excessively, which is, means substantially in excess of market rent, they do so in bad faith for the purpose of circumventing the requirement that they actually have a good reason to evict the tenant, the tenant could uh, raise a defense to an eviction based on that notice. So again, this is going to apply to tenants who have just cause eviction protections, which is tenants in uh, multifamily housing for the most part, um, but don't have other limits on how much the landlord can raise the rent. Uh, we also have a number of um, proposed amendments to the Tenant Harassment Code. Uh, so the first series of amendments just sort of clarifies and adds to some of the defined uh, acts that constitute tenant harassment, including self-help eviction, refusal to accept rent, 
excessive or unlawful rent increases and retaliation. We also add some examples of um, unlawful intimidation and coercion. Um, again, repeatedly offering to buy out a tenant and also refusing to cooperate with a tenant who is requesting to replace an occupant uh, with a subtenant, which most tenants have the right to do under local law. But if they don't get cooperation in that process, it can be sort of the means to drive the tenant out. Uh, the ordinance would also increase the maximum potential civil penalties from ten dollars to $20,000 per violation. So this would be to uh, courts would have a housing discrimination, anti-discrimination code. Um, so as been noted, the, uh, the proposal or the amendments would add housing status as a protected classification. So they would prohibit a landlord from refusing to rent um, to a person on the basis of their housing status or representing that housing isn't available to someone because of their housing status or making any sort of statement that indicates a preference for individuals of a certain housing status or not. And the code proposes to define housing status to mean someone who's currently or formerly experiencing homelessness, living in transitional temporary sh or shelter housing, or lacking a residential uh, housing history. Uh, the code also specifies that if a tenant lacks a rental history or rental references, the landlord would offer the tenant an opportunity to provide alternative evidence of the tenant's uh, ability to be a reliable tenant, and the landlord would consider that. So this would prohibit a landlord uh, express, you know, uh, declining to rent to someone because of their housing status, but not prohibit the consideration of other evidence or information about the tenant's ability to be a reliable tenant. Um, in addition, the code would clarify that um, a form of Section 8 discrimination that's prohibited by the code is a landlord's refusal to make basic minimal repairs that are required by the Section 8 program in order to cooperate or to participate in that program. And those are all of the proposed ordinance has been mentioned. Uh, the staff report also talks about some potential charter amendments to effectuate some further eviction protections. Um, and this is in direction to council's uh, direction to, to draft some eviction protections, also in keeping with the protections that had been adopted by the city and county of LA. Um, so if council were to direct the, or wanted to consider this, uh, placing this on the November 2024 ballot, uh, we, the city attorney's office would certainly in consultation with the rent control board, um, consider drafting charter language to amend the charter to prohibit rent increases under a certain threshold, under a certain amount. In the city and county of LA, or certainly in the city of LA, they've set the threshold at 100% of fair market rents. In Santa Monica, council may want to consider 150%, given that rents are higher here. Um, but again, we would work with rent control with the rent control board to uh, to, to draft the appropriate language on that. Um, and the similarly um, to consider amendments to uh, the charter provisions related to the rent control uh, units and non-rent controlled units um, related to evictions for uh, breach of lease, nuisance, or illegal use based on a tenant's uh, having done uh, alterations to the rental unit that may have been authorized or permitted by the landlord or perhaps even the former landlord, um, and then a subsequent landlord or the landlord later seeking to evict the tenant on the grounds that the, the um, alterations were not permitted by the city. This is actually a situation that we've seen a few times in the city, um, and so these protections would, or this eviction defense would protect in those situations. Oh, yeah, I also want to highlight the, um, there are a couple of typos in the ordinance that was prepared. Um, the first series of typos is just on the first page in reference to the specific code sections that would be amended. Um, so that is reflected in a red line that I think is on um, everyone's seat. And then there's also a typo on page 20, um, which relates to the increase of this potential civil penalty. Uh, the, the former amount of $10,000 civil penalty for tenant harassment violations was not, the strikeout didn't come through on the original version, but it's included in the red line. Does that conclude your report? It does, thank it you. It does. Uh, we'll entertain questions from council members. And I'm... Oh, sorry, you're wrong button. Ah, council member Tarosis, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. I uh, just wanted to clarify uh, some of the commenters referenced consulting with the rent control board. Obviously, any ordinance that we draft would apply citywide, correct? 
all the all of excuse the me would apply to all tenancies, not just rent control tenancies. Correct. Certainly, all of the ordinances would apply to. Um, most of the ordinances apply to all tenancies. Uh, the buyout agreement ordinance applies to rent controlled and uh, rent controlled tenancies and tenancies that are subject to our local just cause ordinance. The charter amendments um, okay, that are proposed. Yeah. 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 So charter those amendments. would specifically apply to rent control tenants and tenants tenancies that are also subject to our local just cause ordinance. The only tenancies that are really exempt from those are mostly single family homes. For right. Those and and so given that this has implications for the rent control board's charter. Would it be possible to do anything in consultation with them? Oh, absolutely. We would we would absolutely consult and bring it this. forward to their board before bringing it to council. Absolutely. Okay. Um, secondly, I just wanted to highlight something that I think I read in the um, staff report. Uh, it appears that there's been over a 300 percent increase in evictions in Santa Monica from 2021 to 2023, based on the data that you put in the staff report. Does that sound accurate? Th that is based on the number of reported evictions that landlords are filing with our office. We don't have a great idea of how representative that sample is and also how many landlords might have learned about the filing requirement later, um, and that might be accountable for some of the increase. But would it be fair to say that that might not even include like informal buyouts that aren't being registered with you? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Council Member Davis. Thank you for the report. Um, a follow-up on Councilmember Tarosis's last question. So I know that um, we may not have accurate numbers here in Santa Monica, but isn't it true that right across the border in the city of Los Angeles, we're just seeing a tremendous amount of buyout activity? I mean, the LA Times has done article after article about how landlords are repeatedly pressuring tenants to take buyouts, right? That's right. And, and they've certainly seen a number uh, an increase in the number of buyouts, and they too have a buyout reporting um, ordinance. Is that correct? That's right. But I think I read in the Times as well that um, the city controller is concerned that a lot of the buyouts aren't being reported. Um, and so, you know, it's sort of the tip of the iceberg thing where we know it's already a problem that's growing, but it may be much bigger than we know because there's a whole bunch of unreported buyouts, right? That's right. So, I mean, since we literally are right across the border, it's likely we have somewhat the same situation here in Santa Monica, even if we don't have the same kinds of reporting records. That's right. And I, I think in from data from the rent control board where tenants are, or landlords are filing uh, buyout agreements already indicates an increase in pr over previous recent years, certainly from the pandemic. All right. And then the, the one thing I want to do is talk about the proposed city charter amendment, because I think it's important, um, you know, we, uh, that even though we might be amending the city charter to uh, provide affirmative defenses to evictions, the amendments don't necessarily completely hamstring uh, landlords and what they can do if they have a tenant who's not paying rent or something like that. They may not be able to evict them, but they have other remedies they can use to collect rent and things like that. Is that right? That's right. So, I mean, it, it, the idea is, and it goes to what some of the speakers said, which is the problem we have with homelessness now is it's a funnel where we're trying to solve homelessness down at the bottom, but more people are being funneled into homelessness. By preventing evictions, we can prevent homelessness, but to the extent that people have other options, a landlord has other options. You know, for example, they could sue in small claims court for unpaid rent or something like that. They're, they still would, they, in other words, we're not, it's is not sort of all on the landlord's back. We're just taking away evictions as a remedy to try and keep people housed, but they still can try and collect money due and things like that, or damage done to a unit or something. Exactly. Okay, great. Thank you. Council, um, Vice Mayor Negrete just took herself off. No, uh, <laughs> Council Member Delatory. No, I didn't take myself She's off. Oh, you didn't? I just turned my mic on. Go ahead. You announced me. Um, okay, uh, just to dovetail, I'll begin where um, Council Member Davis left off that um, there are still laws that protect landlords as well because obviously we received um, a flurry of emails of people. I don't know why this caused so much grief, and um, but... Obviously, if there's somebody who's destroying a unit or, you know, uh, creating a nuisance, there's, there's things that are protecting, um, landlords to be able to remove, 
um, tenants, either for um, unlawfully unpaying for whatever reason or whether it be other issues um, damaging the property or whatnot, correct? Certainly. Um, the, the eviction protection that would, again, be a part of the charter amendment process for non-payment of rent um, you know, does not limit a landlord's ability to collect that rent. It's not, it would not be a cancellation of any rental debt. The very limited eviction protection for tenants who have made alterations to a rental unit, to the extent those alterations have impaired the, the value of the unit or have caused the landlord any other sort of damage, would not preclude any other remedies the landlord has, just wouldn't prevent a, a tenant from losing their home over something. I just want to be clear. So when you talk about, because um, I live in a rent-controlled unit and have made, um, had to do some of my own repairs. So, for example, if somebody's made alterations where they've taken down drywall or destroyed a unit, obviously the landlord has um, the ability to remedy uh, money to put the unit back to where it was before, right? Right. Okay, so that hasn't changed. We're not changing that and saying that someone could completely alter a unit and we're also not saying, and I just wanted to hear you repeat, that people, this is not a free-for-all so that people can just take advantage of the system and just not pay their rent because they decide not to, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, although I may not agree that this is the cause of homelessness, what I agree is that what has kept our city so diverse is our rent control. And I mean diverse by not just race and income level, but by um, our elderly population um, mixed in with our, you know, younger population as well. So for me, I think what it is doing is it's keeping people from being without a home in Santa Monica because people might be able to move somewhere else, but they may not be able to live where they grew up or they put their kids in school um, because of the rent increases. And I think we need to remember that we are talking about um, the ability to have a roof over your head um, and still feed your kids and um, still be able to do all the other things that we need to do to be able to live in a city like Santa Monica. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to know if we keep any data of all these evictions that you were talking about. If we know, like, how long those tenants were in there, and if there's a majority of people who are in these rent control, ten, you know, um, apartment buildings. And just because from personal experience of people that I know, because I've been here my whole life, mm -hmm. I happen to know a majority of people who have been um, pressured and under buyouts that are over the age of 70. And I'm just curious if you guys have that data at Rent uh, Control Board. We don't have that data. It's possible the Rent Control Board might have that data. Um, since they're, in terms of at least the... Um, the buyout agreements that are being that have been filed with the city for rent controlled units. Um, typically, you know, the buyout agreement might not actually include that information, but it might be possible to sort of cross reference that with other data that's available. Yeah, because I just want to remind people that may not be aware what often happens with these older buildings. I've been subject to it myself as somebody comes in, buys the building new, and they go with the lowest rent, rent, which generally tends to be not always the oldest person in the building and um, use, use tactics to pressure them with buyout offers. Um, on the surface at the beginning, it may look like, oh, they're getting this check to move out, but really they're being removed from the community that they lived in for so long. And often that money is never enough to even sustain, you know, a full year's rent somewhere else. Um, so just want to be mindful of that, that everything that we're doing here is not really out of the ordinary that the um, LA County is doing and that Landlords still have the ability to make a fair return, correct? So the increases are, if, if the landlord feels for whatever reason they can show proof that they're not making a fair return, they can still do so, right? That would be through the rent control. Process. Through rent control road. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Delatory. Yes, th uh, thank you for the report. I, uh, I had a, a question. In, in terms of the, um, the fees going up, you know, the 10,000 to 20,000 in fines, uh, they were increased in 2015. And, and I just want to know how, how you determine, cause it's like a doubling of the fines. And I wanted to know how, how do you, how do you determine, uh, that increase? So this is a, an increase in the maximum, maximum potential penalty that a court could award. Um, and so this is, you know, there's some cases where the city, the city or an individual tenant might file a tenant harassment case where there's sort of one instance of very egregious harassment, but there's only one instance of it. So this is just designed to give the court a little more flexibility, um, to impose the correct penalty in that situation. Um, when I, in 2015, when the number went up to 10,000, it had been sort of lagging for a little while, I think. And, you know, with inflation and those sorts of things, just trying to keep current with with it, having it be a meaningful deterrent and a meaningful punishment. Okay, so so you determine twenty thousand. So is is uh, let's say more appropriate than thirty thousand. 
so this is it would be a maximum of up to twenty thousand dollars per violation. It seemed like a you know it's a. It's a it's but why would reason. why not go to twenty five thousand or thirty thousand? That's an option as well. <laughs> no, I'm just I, I just want to know sort of how they determined that you know, but um, okay. So um, the other thing um, in terms of the the buyout, so we don't have data on buyouts, but we know it's happening. You said there was a report in Los Angeles that buyouts are are increasing. There was reporting in uh, the LA Times, I believe, um, and the rent control board does uh, gather information about buyout agreements that are filed for rent controlled units. Okay, so now with this change, we'll, we'll be able to document those buyouts? This is, that, is that the would, goal? Yeah, this change would also allow us to um, gather more information about buyouts that are being filed for non-rent controlled units as well, um, and you know, see what, see what information we can get from that as well. That's one of the requirements that you you presented. That yes. All buyout agreements have that to all yeah. have to be registered. So we'll know, for example, if even if uh, if the buyouts are more than what e is e is even legal. I mean, from from my experience, what I've seen is, you know, um, long term rent control tenants, they are they are offered more, you know, to th than than what's, you know, sort of, um, you know, the <clears throat> for permanent relocation. They're offered more. To incentivize their 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 re, their forced relocation. I mean, but they they accept. You know, people are accepting this, and and I, I'm I'm trying to. Um, one of the things that happens is people don't really understand. So they, you know, someone who's very low income, if they're offered forty thousand dollars, for example, it sounds like a lot of money, you know, mm -hmm. um, but forty thousand dollars in in the rental market in Los Angeles, what is it going to buy you, right? So, um, in terms of your your information and outreach to to the public uh, will that will you include sort of hey look you know be careful with a large a large offer you know for you to relocate because you know you you, you can end up that some people can probably end up homeless because they they take the forty thousand thing and it's a lot of money but in two years you know they they've spent it all and and it's over with and now they're having a hard time paying the new rent you know uh, are you going to include some some Community forums or just information on on this issue of buyouts because it seems to be more of a problem than than before. Yes, uh, the the buyout ordinance or the the ordinance does require certain disclosures be provided to tenants before a negotiation can start, and that can include some of that information. Um, but we will, you know, the city attorney's office maintains web pages about this and tenants' rights during buyouts. We host uh, community forums and would continue to include this information and uh, publicize this. Okay, great. Um, the um, the the charter amendments. Um, you know, I, I I remember you know growing up here on uh, on Sixteenth Street, and there was a you know the landlord was was not a very nice man, and uh, it was a uh, bad conditions. But we changed the carpet, and based on changing the carpet, he moved to evict us. Um, so I so so I remember that that was a very horrible thing, you know to. Uh, to experience, you know, growing up, um, and that and that somebody would do that, you know, like it's like we're improving the unit, you know, it's not like we did something that would be, you know, harmful to the unit. It was actually an improvement, but uh, based on that, um, it, it was a, a cause for eviction. And so I, I'm really glad that that we can um, address this issue. But but th this is more specific though to to permitted work, right? Where where somebody does something where you needed a permit. It's not. It, it won't. It won't protect uh, a tenant for doing something like you know changing the carpet. Is that is that my am I wrong? This particular protection may not apply to that situation if the permit wasn't required, but the tenant may have other protections under current law that you know that type of an alteration wouldn't be a material violation of their lease. They may not already. There may be that that type of eviction may not already may be prohibited by current law without this amendment as well. Okay. Yeah. Because I think it'd be very important to do that because. The permitted work, yes, I understand, but those are larger things, like to to change something, you know, like plumbing or something that you know is more with the with the structural, um, you know, the operation of the of the unit. But but um, I'd like to see you know protections around sort of removal of a carpet, you know, something that's not 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 well for the health and well being of the tenant. You know, it, I think it'd be important for us to look at that uh, as well. Um, and then the last thing I oh and. I wanted to just kind of understand sort of the uh, the subletting issue. I know that that's that's a big uh, you know I've heard I've heard different stories you know where 
roommates move in and then someone, they're going to move out, uh, someone's left in the unit. And so, so right now, uh, the, the, uh, the tenant wouldn't have the right to just sublet, correct? To bring somebody else in, you'd have to get permission from the, from the owner. Is that how it works? It, it can depend on what the lease says. Generally, under the rent control law and our just cause eviction law, if a uh, tenant moves into a unit with two people and one person moves out, uh, even if the lease says that the tenant isn't allowed to sublease, um, the tenant can still bring in a subletter, seek permission from the landlord for a particular subletter, and the landlord um, is the, the tenant's entitled to uh, replace the departed occupant on a one for one basis. Um, the landlord's under under the current law, you know, supposed to sort of participate in that process. Um, there's some cases where landlords are are not working with the tenant to sort of approve a subtenant. And so this amendments to the tenant harassment code would just clarify that when a landlord's doing that and a tenant's put in a situation where they're maybe trying to now pay a full unit's rent when it's really designed to be split by two people, that could be a form of bad faith harassment. Okay. And then there's nothing in there that talks about sort of um, one for one, I understand. So that's someone leaves the unit, you bring another person in. But in terms of the... Um, you know, I, I talked to somebody that said, well, what if, what, what if someone's going to bring another person in, you know, and then charge them more than what the other uh, tenant was, was paying? So instead of like $1,000, I'm going to charge this person 1200 That's illegal, correct? That would depend on what's, that could depend on what's in the tenant's lease with the landlord, their right to sublet. Um, but otherwise, often, you know, sublet relationships are sort of negotiated between a master tenant and a subtenant, much like a landlord and tenant relationship are negotiated. Do you envision sort of a, a process where the landlord and the tenant might agree, like, okay, you know, let's let's share the the the, the in, in, in the in the benefit sort of of leasing the the the, bet, the new room, let's say that just was was uh, vacated, where they where they might be able to charge more, let's say, for another tenant, the tenant moving in pays more, and and, and they can share that. Um, I, again, I think that would depend on the terms of the tenant's lease with the landlord and also any limits under the rent control law of the, the landlord to actually increase the rent to the unit. A new tenant moving in is not a basis to increase the rent. The okay. Rent. Yeah, because I, I think I'm trying to figure out how to have more peace, you know, in that situation between the, the remaining tenant and the, and the landlord. Um, yeah, no, no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Zwick. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation um, and for the really um, comprehensive work on on, on all these um, different sections of the ordinance. Um, Santa Monica, as we all know, has long been a leader in tenant protections, and um, I'm, I'm really happy to see that we are, at the very least, keeping pace with what the city and county um, have have sort of done in this regards. And and I'm really thankful for for what Councilmember Chirosis and the city um, you know have have pushed forward here. Um, one question um, related to the item that would potentially go on the ballot regarding a, a month's rent or perhaps 150 um, percent. It, it's my understanding that um, there are a lot of evictions or, or you know three-day um, notices given to people for for owing less than a single month's rent. Is that is there a date on that or? We don't have reliable data on that just because we don't in terms of the, the evictions that are Maybe not Santa Monica, but I guess I've maybe read more generally. But. To the extent there is data on this, this is a, is a challenge we have with getting data from the courts as well. Um, so it's a little, it's hard to know how representative that data is, but that's certainly happening. Got um, it. And um, so actually one thing I wasn't aware of, so this ordinance um, or the, the, the proposed language would say it's not about your rent, it's about some sort of median rent per bedroom in the metro area? That is how the city of LA's ordinance works. Um, so not based on the contract rent that a tenant owes, but a, a single threshold that applies to all tenants regardless of what their rent is under the lease. Got it. And, and the proposal of 150 is that we are in the same large metro area, but we are in a more expensive part of it. That's correct. For which there isn't like a subset of data that we would use separately. That's right. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member De La Torre. Oh, no, I'm, I'm done. Okay, I have a, a few questions. So let's go back to uh, what Council Member Zwick just finished with. Oh, I'll wait. Council Member No, I wasn't sure if we were starting the comment. No, I'm still asking some okay. questions, if I can. Thank you. Um, so the 150%, explain that in real layman's terms. 
So someone's paying two thousand a month for rent. How much do they have to be? be how how many months does the landlord have to wait before they can file an eviction if your tenant just stops paying rent? Is it, are you is 150% a month and a half? It, effectively, it's one and a half times the, uh, the so rent. So if your rent's 2000 a uh, tenant would have to be $3,000 behind. Uh, well, they would the one hundred and fifty percent. Sorry of the uh, of the fair market rents, average fair market rents for the area, which is a number that's published by HUD based on a survey of what rents generally cost in the Los Angeles, LA County so metro if, area. Here, so the fair market rate tenants been there for a while. Fair market rate is three thousand a month. I think she's saying these are the standards right here. It's not based on the individual. Right. Well, so, what, I'm asking your... specifically if a small market landlord. A tenant stops paying rent and he can't get an agreement with that tenant to find a way to pay that rent back. Mm -hmm. How long does that landlord have to wait until they can file an eviction? So if the tenant is in a one bedroom unit and you were to adopt the 150% standard, the tenant's in a one bedroom unit and that tenant's rent is $2,000, by the second month, if they haven't paid their rent, they would be over the threshold. So not paying rent for one month wouldn't cross the threshold, but by the second month it would. And I, yeah, I understand that. Right. Okay, that's fair. Um, how how similar is the LA County and LA City ordinances to what this proposed ordinance change is? It would be very similar, except to the extent, except for the number that they're using. So they are also applying the fair market rent, the, the fair market rent standard as opposed to the rent that the tenant uh, actually owes under their contract to the landlord. So, so the only difference is the, the threshold that would be chosen. Right. The danger I see for a, for a landlord is so now you're two months behind and it'll probably take three months to evict that person. So now that tenant ends up with five months, right, free rent. If, if uh, bear, bear with me, if the landlord is not going to necessarily collect in small claims court. So the question is, you're allowing that tenant to get five months behind possibly. How many months is the eviction uh, proceedings normally in LA in Santa Monica? Yeah, they really vary. I, I don't I don't know. I'm guessing three months. Something like that sounds about right. I mean, in this particular hypothetical, it's really one month more than if they were able to evict immediately. So it's five months total, but if they were to start the process immediately, it would be four months. Be four months. Right. But that's still a substantial burden on the landlord who may not be gouging tenants, may not be jacking rents up, and may not be doing buyouts. So I, I'm looking at a not the landlord who's sitting there trying to, you know, be daddy warbucks and trying to be greedy, but someone who's just small landlord, because that's who I'm always concerned about. The corporate landlords, they have bank. <coughs> the small landlords may not have bank. So that's my question, is we're hitting that extra month could be a tremendous burden, because then they'll probably have to take another month to get it habitable to rent again. So now that landlord has lost a half a year of potential living expenses. No, counsel? That's fair. That's my right. question. Romy, wouldn't there normally be a deposit too? Well, one month deposit is right. probably maximum. Right. Mm -hmm. Under current law. Right, I guess. Yeah, yeah, so there would be a deposit. And again, this wouldn't this wouldn't change, as you've as has been noted, the right to collect uh, through through a different collections process. It would it would push the initiation of the formal eviction process by a month or in some cases potentially more than right. that. And, and I guess I always want to be fair to tenants. So uh, as far as the buyouts, I want us to, as Oscar, I think, mentioned too, to be as high as possible to stop people from grabbing buyouts that then cause us to lose them in the community. And because they don't have their own representation, they may look at that pile of money and say, great, I'm taking and moving, and then they go to Lawndale, Hawthorne, Brea, somewhere else, and find out rent's still high. So I'm I'm all for higher uh, things on buyouts. I don't believe in the buyouts, but I am questioning on this on my scenario, an extra month may be a lot of money 
It may mean the difference between them having enough money to rehabilitate the unit to get it ready for the next renter. And instead, they just do a minimal. They keep that the, the carpet the tenant installed, all right, when they probably shouldn't have accepted that because, unfortunately, that carpet was bright pink or something. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess how do, we, how do we find a way to be fair to landlords as well as tenants? Well, I think I'm just using that as an example. This this uh, suggestion for consideration of 150 percent of fair market rents is one option, but there are other options that could be considered. Um, we were directed to consider an ordinance that would implement this prohibition on evictions for less than a month's rent, and in keeping with how the and I agree with that. By that. the way, anybody who would evict someone for less than a month's rent that's ridiculous. Right. That means you're just trying to get rid of your tenant and you're not bearing with your tenant. So I understand that as a business person, but I also worry about those small landlords who have been in business for decades in Santa Monica who may not be able to afford that because our rent increases have been very low over the years in, in relation to inflation and the amount of expenses they're, char- they're being charged to renovate units, to do plumbing, et cetera. So that would be my concern. What, so 100% is what LA and LA County are charging? I believe so, certainly LA and I believe LA County as well. Okay, are there other differences between the LA and LA County ordinance and ours that we should know about? I mean, the significant difference is that the LA County and City of LA ordinances, those are done in their municipal code and our eviction protections are generally charter. in our charter. So um, Ours are more long-lasting and ours and are difficult right. to change. I, That's I, a good thing for tenants. Right. Those are the, 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 main, uh, the main features. Also a requirement that the uh, any notice to pay rent or quit to a tenant state the number of bedrooms that are in the unit and what the fair market rent for that is so that the tenant can, can compare it against the, whatever the standard is that's okay. to be applied. So that gives a potential features. tenant who might be looking at a buyout more information on the neighborhood as well. That would be in the in the buyout process. Right. And that's a good thing. Right. Okay. And, and lastly, uh, if we were referring the Charter Amendment back to the Rent Control Board for them to work on and then boomerang back to us at a later date, would that be fine as an amendment? Well, That's council, you, you, the council can't direct the rent control board. You can direct our office to work with the rent control board. Fine. Okay. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Uh, you. Council member Tarosis. Sorry, I need some chocolate. Uh, I was not going to let you get a snack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have questions. Oh, you were on, you were on here. Okay, go ahead. Well, it doesn't have to be questions. Pro- oh, move to, no, move to comments then. Oh, wait. Uh, Council Member Negretti. You opened up that can of worms. So I just, I have a question about this 150% because I do understand that there are mom and pop landlords. And so how can our city attorney's office work with the rent control board? I don't know. I'm asking to really look at those situations when um, they're the mom and pop landlord. So my question would be like, let's just say then, does this apply to someone who maybe has a unit and is paying 750 for one bedroom because they've been there for a long time and then they have to meet that threshold so then that could be lots of months for that for that landlord right right the same threshold under this under this particular version of it the the same threshold would apply regardless of what the tenant's rent is so can we give the direction i mean it feels like those circum those situations may be you know much smaller i don't know i'm i'm guessing because we don't have all this data in front of us but I don't know if there's a creative way to work on, I don't know if it's looking at number of units, if it's five a five unit building or what really is the defining number of units for a mom and pop landlord that we're referring to. But is there a way that our city attorney's office can work with rent control board? Is that something to make sure that we're being fair to, I mean, it's obviously different if you own 50 units, 10 units, or that's. Well, we will definitely work with rent control, get their input. Uh, and then, of course, this will have to come back for the council for a final approval also. And I'm bringing it up because I don't, you know, look, on the same note, um, we have a lot of, we have people who are, you know, in their 70s and 80s that are living off of these, maybe these four or five units that they rent out. And so 
And just thinking about the same way we want, we want to protect people who are, you know, income burdened, whatnot, looking at it both ways. So I'm just throwing it out there that if there is a way to find some happy medium so that those people aren't kind of swept in as we're trying to protect people from kind of corporate, um, or not even corporate, just landlords who can afford um, the loss, not that that's, that's a loss that any landlord wants to assume in their business, but it's obviously very different for a mom and pop landlord. Is that is that something you guys will discuss? I guess. Yes, and bring definitely. Back? Okay. Uh, Councilmember De La Torre, do you have questions or uh, comments? I think we're, we're in transition to. Uh, and Councilmember Davis, comments. Comments. Okay, Councilmember Tarosas. <laughs> Huh? No, 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 it's you. Councilmember De La Torre, then. Sorry about that. I'm ready to go. Yes. I always look anxious. My natural state. Um, so we're in comments, so I want to make a couple of comments. Um, and uh, the, the first comment I want to make is every time we make policy, it's a balancing of hardships. Someone's ox is always getting gored. And I, I hear Mayor Brock, you talking about landlords and having to tolerate waiting four or five months for someone before you can evict them. But in a way, that's the whole point of this, is that the eviction of someone from their unit is going to be, in almost every instance, worse than the harm suffered by the landlord. Somebody getting put out on the street is a very bad thing. So, so while I, I, I don't want to be completely unsympathetic to landlords in the city, I think we need to understand that the purpose of this is to protect tenancy so that people don't end up on the street. And it, buying them, even if it's an extra 30 to 60 days to stay in their unit, especially if the reason they haven't been paying their rent is because of a medical expense or a blip in their income or something like that, buying that extra time can make the difference between a family becoming homeless and not. So for me, in all honesty, when I weigh those equities, um, to me, I fall on the side of the tenant. The other thing I want to say is, and I know we always use this term mom and pop landlord, and, and I, and I, again, I want to be sympathetic to the couple that 20 years ago for their retirement bought six units somewhere in the city and that's going to be their retirement. But the fact of the matter is, they're not, the rents are not the only thing they have. If you bought a piece of land 20 years ago in this city, it's worth, pardon my French, a hell of a lot more than it was the day you bought it. And so not only do they had a steady income, through rents, maybe not as high as they would like if it's a rent control building, but they've had a steady income from rents. They have had a tremendous appreciation in the underlying asset. And I think that's really important to remember. So again, when we talk about balancing equities, if I'm asking someone who, you know, bought a building 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it may be completely paid off. They not, may not be carrying any debt. Their property taxes are kept in reasonably low by Proposition 13. So what they are paying to maintain this asset that may have been worth just to pick a number out of the air, $200,000, say, in 1990, and is now worth $2 million, you know, it's hard for me to gin up a lot of sympathy there. So again, that's not to say I want to be unsympathetic to landlords, but it seems to me the point of everything we're talking about here is to try and avoid the situation which many of the speakers spoke about, which is how do we keep people in their units to the greatest extent possible? Because the second we give people the opportunity to say, hey, you didn't pay your rent, you know, or you harass them with, hey, don't you want to get bought out? Um, the fact of the matter is we're going to end up with people on our streets, which I think we all agree is exactly the result we don't want. I do want to talk about the buyouts because I think that's really one of the most pernicious things that happens is there's no limit on the amount you can offer someone. There's nothing in our code. If someone wanted to give you a million dollars to buy out of your tenancy, that would be great, I suspect, for some people. The problem is twofold. And the problem is, first of all, 
that for a lot of folks who are living in rent control units, if they're paying, say, $1,200 a month in rent and someone offers them $40,000, that sounds pretty good. But if they're going to go out and try and look for a unit that isn't rent controlled somewhere else, they're in for a rude awakening. There isn't going to be a comparable $1,200 unit out there. And that's really the issue with buyouts, is that people can offer what feels like a lot of money, but as Councilmember De La Torre points out, it doesn't go far in the Southern California housing market. And again, so what you end up with is people who may be temporarily relocated, but again end up on the streets because the reloc the buyout money has has run out. But even more pernicious than the amounts of the buyouts, and again we're dealing with people who aren't represented, they may not understand the real estate market, is the constant drumbeat of people who are trying to buy people out. I mean, I've talked to people, I, I have a friend who lives in a rent-controlled unit who literally every month when she pays her rent gets a note saying, we're offering you a buyout, here's the buyout. The amount of the buyout goes up marginally every month. But literally every month, they are looking to displace her because she's been in her unit for a pretty long time and it's a large unit and they could probably rent it for a lot more money. And at some point, it just becomes almost exhausting to have to deal with. And you're just like, okay, fine, I'll move. And then, again, pardon my French, all hell breaks loose. So, so I think what's really key here is to always keep in mind what are the equities that we're balancing. And we're always going to be able to sit up here and construct a situation where it looks like the person who owns the property is getting the short end of the stick. I'll put it that way. But when you consider that the other end of the stick is a potential homelessness situation, it seems to me that, again, making policy, we're never going to make policy that's going to address every single situation. And someone can always hypothetically come up with something like, oh, my God, someone will get screwed. But is that a reason not to change our policy when the overarching result of changing our policy is improving the lives of tenants, making homelessness less um, likely to happen to people and creating a situation where people are secure in their homes. And so I think it's very important for us to move forward with these tenant protections tonight. I understand that there are certain people who are opposed to them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, certainly they're entitled to do that. But, uh, you know, anyone who I think uh, has an issue with these kinds of tenant protections has to be prepared then to sit here and say, okay, fine, I am willing to tolerate an increase in homelessness. I'm willing to tolerate people living in marginal circumstances. I'm willing to tolerate people being more red burdened. So someone who's sitting on an asset that's appreciated exponentially over the last period of time is a little less inconvenienced or maybe even has to quite honestly, absorb a little more cost. So from my perspective, the equities are, in, you know, inescapable, and we should err on the side of tenants. Council Member Tarosas. Wait, are you still chewing? No, ha ha. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just asking. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone on the city attorney's team. Thank you to everyone at the rent control board. Thank you to all of the community members who gave feedback. Um, I think this is the result of a really robust process that we've been talking about um, for quite a while. So I, I'm, I'm very pleased. I would just say that with respect to um, the evictions for small rental debts, just to give some instruction, I would like to see uh, the, the city attorney's team consult with the rent board and come back to us with a recommendation whether it's 100% or 150% or can we do something else where we say it's literally one month of that person's actual rent. I'm not sure how that enforceable that would be. Um, and I know that that's not what the city of LA and the county are doing. Um, but I certainly don't think that there's an appreciable difference um, that would lead to such an expansion of time between 100% and 150% of, of uh, the fair market rent. Um, I also uh, think that we all know, and I'll just repeat it because I think it is worth stating, that uh, this is also an equity issue because eviction has been a pretty substantial driver of housing insecurity for our black and brown residents in this county and, and in this city. Um, because 
first of all, um, you know, white supremacy and, and redlining, but, but secondly, um, we know that black women in particular face higher rates, the highest rates of job loss during the pandemic, and they also have faced the most severe wage gap in the United States. And these are the same communities that have been most harmed by COVID. So if we're talking about not increasing the overabundance of, of black and brown people experiencing homelessness, not increasing the overabundance of seniors, which is our fastest growing homeless population, um, I think it's really incumbent on us uh, to try to stem the tide in with every tool that we have, and this is just one of them. Um, I also want to note that in the city of LA, because uh, the city controller has, has kept really good data, so I hope that this is our first step to starting to keep better data. Um, $3,760 is the average amount of rent that's been owed um, in the eviction cases that have been filed from February to November of 2023, and that 96% of the eviction cases have been filed because of non-payment of rent. So it's not a it's not 20 and 30 and 40 thousand dollars that people are owing in, in back rent. It's a pretty small amount of money. And again, like um, Councilmember Davis mentioned, it's not that uh, landlords couldn't ever get a civil judgment against someone to go then recover that amount. It's just that we want to keep people housing secure with a payment plan while they f they figure out their situation. I also would just say that I too weigh kind of like the balance of power when we're making these decisions. And I think that we know that 70% of the keys in our community, I, I say this all the time, are for our renters. Renters are 70% of our population. Yes, we have landlords, and yes, we have many sm small landlords and progressive landlords, and I dealt with all of them when I was at the rent board, but the number of landlords that we have far outweigh, excuse me, the <laughs> number of renters that we have far outweigh the number of landlords. Many of these landlords don't even actually live in Santa Monica. And so, yes, of course, it's important to protect small businesses, and, and I, I talk about that often, but I think when we're talking about who has the power in these relationships, what kind of resources they have, whether we're talking about literally like a home and a roof over people's head versus like a business decision and maximizing profit. Um, to me, it's more important to keep a roof over folks' head. I would also say that for all of the rent controlled tenancies, we know that we have uh, the rent increase petition process because when we go back to this thing about how landlords need to be able to make fair return on their investment, um, for the older units that we have in the city, uh, these landlords can avail themselves of that process. If we had a deluge of rent increase petitions, I would be concerned. We don't. Uh, successful rent increase petitions, we don't. Um, and then, of course, the other landlords are, are in, um, are the landlords to newer buildings that are more traditionally at like market rate rents where people are making a pretty hefty return on their investment and can increase their rent over and above um, the rent increase that we've mandated under rent control. So for all of those reasons, sorry to belabor these points, I think everyone here knows where I stand. Um, I think it's really important that we ad adopt these uh, protections immediately tonight. Uh, and I would just say that I'm, I'm open to suggestions from the subject matter experts here on how we deal with the non-eviction for small rental debts um, under a potential charter amendment. So thank you again so much. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Negrete. Um, okay, thank you. I just wanted to um, recap a few things that I mentioned before. Um, tonight, just tonight, and um, what we spoke on our agenda today, there was um, issues around diversity. We discussed um, homelessness slightly. We, we talk about it all the time. We're talking about closing gaps, um, equity gaps, um, whether it be in the procurement process. Um, and so we're constantly talking about those things in Santa Monica. And I think, although like I said before, do I think that I, the people that I see that are um, homeless on our streets today, at least the, the people that I walk by at night when I leave this meeting, the people that are in front of my business, um, do I think that they got there because they just were evicted from their apartment. I, I tend to think we have a opioid addiction and mental health crisis on our hands. However, I do think we have an affordable housing um, crisis for sure. And we talk about these, um, you know, mathematical uh, modalities of people spending 30% of their income on their rent. Well, people are spending way more than that on their rent. Um, and in Santa Monica, it's even worse. And um, I know this is repetitive, but it's like we have this natural diversity in our city, not just because of our visitors, but literally because, yes, we do have 70% of runners, and we've had a rent control policy that has kept people like my own family, um, myself included, in this city because 
the rents are affordable. Now, are there people that take advantage of that, that throughout their lifespan end up scoring an apartment and then making hundreds of thousands of dollars later could potentially move to move up, you know, afford to move out or buy a home? Probably. I mean, we can't capture every scenario, unfortunately, and, and that includes, you know, the scenario that is someone taking advantage of the um, non-payment of rent and eviction protections. Um, but I do think that there's due process, and I hope that the justice system and whatever due process there is for landlords will, you know, find in favor of landlords when people are taking advantage of that system. And I think our rent control board is also works with landlords as well. It's not just for the tenants. Um, again, I just want to reiterate that we talk about I just hope we don't, we're not, I, I don't want to be divided as a city or as a community around this because everybody's in agreement that it's so expensive to live here and it's ridiculous that hardworking families, blue collar families, people in that misty middle that really can't afford to be, um, they're not in the 1% that can afford everything and get all the tax credits, but they're not in the, the other percentage where it, that's eligible for, for help and subsidized housing. So a lot of these people, myself included, depend on things like rent control to keep the basic necessity of putting a roof over their families had affordable um, so that they can continue to be in the com community that we live in. So I hope tonight that this isn't about landlords versus tenants. I hope it's about our community. It's about how we live together in harmony and how, you know, it's sort of sad that we're talking about the need to be able to afford a roof over your head. Um, and I just want to remind people that we're 70% renters, but I can tell you as a renter myself, not every renter wants to remain a renter for the rest of their life. It's just the situation we're pitted in. Um, so we don't have an effective home buying program and hopefully we'll get there, maybe a community bank at some point in the future, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, for now, what we have is a strong rental force um, and I think we have to take measures to make sure that people stay in their homes. Um, not because I think that they might end up on the street the next day, I'm sure that is the situation for many people, but because I see our community getting less diverse over the years, gentrification, um, has been quoted by um, some in our community as a form of genocide and a lot of our community members have moved outside of Santa Monica because of exactly this. Um, being offered amounts of money to move out of your apartment um, and unfortunately I'm also seeing it now with our elderly population more than ever as well and we need to take care of our elderly, we need to take care of the diverse community that we have and this is one of the ways we're maintaining it so I hope we're all unified tonight on this council. Council Member De La Torre. Uh, yes, I, I appreciate uh, all the comments that have been made today by all my colleagues on the dais. I think it shows, you know, that this uh, city council, like other city councils in the past, are committed to the renters of the city, are, are committed to keeping people housed, are committed to a diverse city. Um, and rent control has allowed us to do that. And, and obviously, you know, uh, market forces have pushed things way high, um, and so we need to adjust. And I think all of these uh, suggestions are gonna be positive, you know, moving forward. Um, I just, uh, I, I, I wanna say a couple of things, just in, in, as we move forward, also thinking about charter and thinking about, you know, what what uh, we, we direct our, our, our staff, um, you know, to, to, to do so that we have a, 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 a well-balanced approach moving forward. Um, I want to say I want to say one thing um, that hasn't been said. You know, for government, you know, we 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 have ideology. You know, sometimes we have you know, hey, we want to help people, and that's what that's what government should do is we should be here to help people. But in terms of policies, right, where we say, well, who should pay for it? You know, is it is it should should it should we put it all on the uh, on one group of people, or should the government also take responsibility? And I think one thing that we need to do in order to keep people housed. Uh, we need to create a tenant eviction prevention fund. Like there should be a way for us to have, you know, a robust fund for people that are, because these policy changes right here are not going to help the person that took the eviction moratorium route and now they're, you know, they're looking at, you know, four or five months of, of rent debt and the landlord is pretty much not accepting anything anymore. Uh, because they, they want the unit because the person hasn't been able to pay and they're in a hole and they need to get out. Like we need to find a way to get help to those people like now, immediately. And if it's a loan program or something, because, uh, I know, I know of people that have called me, you know, just in the last two weeks that are 
experiencing that situation right there. That by, by March, if they don't come up with, you know, three, four months of rent that they owe, they're going to be evicted. And I don't want to see them leave, you know, our city. So we, uh, as government, should take the responsibility of also not just saying, hey, you know, landlord or, or you got to do this. We should also be mindful of like what we can do now to help our residents right now that are facing evictions because they, they fell in a hole. Um, by the way, the eviction data that I saw, I think it was 67 in the last year that were filed, you know, and, and, and previous to that, it was less. I mean, um, so it's not like, you know, we're not talking about hundreds, but it, it's, it's, it's definitely an issue. But I, I, I want to see us do that. I want, I want to see us take responsibility as a government, as a Councilwoman uh, uh, Davis talked about, the balance of equities. It's very important for us to consider that. Along those lines, um, how do we keep people housed? Well, here's one concept that I think is very important for us to understand. You know, uh, we need to keep the small mom and pop housing providers in business because look at what's going on. I mean, we're going to deal with an issue later on, but in terms of the density that we're seeing in the city, I'm, I, I, I'm just looking at, oh, one, one uh, project went from 10 stories now to 20 stories or from eight stories to 16 stories. And this is all legal now. This is not even going through the planning commission or even coming before us. And yeah, they have to provide, you know, 15%, 20% affordable housing. I just, you know, I don't even know exactly what that's gonna mean for very low income people. Maybe, you know, some people will benefit. I hope they do. But the reality of it is, is 80% of it is gonna be market rate. And those units are gonna be $5,000, $6,000 a month. And what that does is it puts market pressure and the small mom and pop operator at some point forget the tenant that's being asked, hey, are you willing to leave and I'll give you $40,000? You know, these large corporations are going to come to the small mom and pop operators and they say, hey, are you tired of the city of Santa Monica? What if we offer you, you know, $5 million when your building was only worth $3 million two years ago? And why can they do that? Because it'll pencil out for them with all the density bonuses that the state now has forced us to accept. So we need to be mindful of that in terms of balancing the equities. How do we ensure, because if we keep those small mom and pop operators in business, and I'm talking about people that own, you know, six units, maybe eight units, 10 units. I'm not talking about the person that owns 20 units. I mean, those, or 40 or 50, I mean, that's, that's something else. I'm talking about the, the small mom and pop operators that I know exist in the city of Santa Monica. And I know that if, if we don't find a way to keep them also in business to provide housing in our community, uh, and they're seeing all this go up and all the, you know, everybody's making a lot of money by going taller and taller. Eventually someone's going to come to them and make them an offer they can't refuse. And when they sell, there's going to be a lot of pressure, right, on getting rid of all the older tenants because it's not penciling out for the new owners. And on top of that, since they have all the money and they can build up, you know, 20 stories or 10 stories even, it's, it, they, they have the money to come in and say, look, I'll offer you $100,000 if you move out of your building. And they can, and they, and they can make it work out from their perspective. And $100,000, again, it might sound a lot, you know, I mean, to anybody right now in the city of Santa Monica, but definitely to a low income person who's lived poor most of their lives, $100,000 is kind of like, again, the, the uh, offer you can't refuse, you know? It's, it's something that most people are going to take and we're going to lose our diversity and we're going to lose those low income tenants forever, because they're never going to come back to Santa Monica. We might even lose them in the city of Los Angeles in three, four years when the when that $100,000 runs out. So anyway, um, I just want to make sure the direction is balanced like that. Like, how do we keep the small operators in business so that we we prevent that from happening? We Because we see the market forces are encroaching on our city in massive ways. I mean, you know, it's pretty incredible in terms of, like, what is being allowed now, you know? I mean, I, 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 I just, I, I, I'm like really kind of surprised on uh, that people are are, are 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 ready to go you know 20 stories and there's nothing that we can do i mean from everything i'm hearing there's nothing we can do that the city of santa monica has got its hands tied and so that's going to happen those market forces are real it's going to happen and so we need to be aware of how that's going to impact the housing providers in our city the small ones that are right now uh doing okay if for example they're able to, to balance it out. If they can stay in business, you know, uh, they, they, they have a, a, a tenant that left, one, they're, they're mixed, let's say, right? Uh, someone's paying a higher rent, someone's paying a lower rent, uh, they can make it work like that. But all of a sudden, you know, if they can't make it work like that, 
uh, what's going to happen to those operators. We, we, should, we should understand how those market forces uh, can lead to more displacement, and I don't want to see that. I want to... I want to make sure that we have a better city with the same with the same residents and the same neighbors. Um, so there's things that we can think about. You know, uh, I heard well some of these landlords they don't live in the city. Okay, well let's put a, let, let's think about supporting those that do live in the city. How about those that even live in their own buildings? You know, um, how about those that have rent control uh, units and they've, they've been there for a long time and they're actually good to their tenants, right? There's ways to figure that out if they've never tried to evict people that you know they don't have that kind of pattern of behavior. Uh, we reward the good behavior and we punish the bad behavior. I think that's the thing that we're not doing here. Like we're we're seeking to punish the bad behavior, and, and I get that. I think it's important to do that. But what about incentivizing the good behavior as well, so that we can keep those uh, businesses supporting those low income tenants, uh, supporting rent control in our city. So anyway, that's that's uh, that's what I want to say. Uh, but I'm proud. Um, I'm proud to live in a city that cares about you know our renters, especially low income people. And cares about the diversity of the city. Thanks. So, so Councilmember De La Torre, um, appreciate the comments, and I appreciate you uh, reminding us about some uh, additional work that we do have underway um, that we hope to bring to you later this year, which is twofold. One is um, to lift up what we can do in terms of firming up and strengthening our right to council programs, and that was direction that we received from council. Um, and then part and parcel with that as well um, is to develop. A flexible financial assistance program uh, for those at risk of eviction. So that is work that we do have underway that we hope to deliver um, as we move through this year and get closer to budget season so the council will have uh, options in front of them um, in terms of addressing these programs. So I just wanted to uplift that that work is in process at the request of council um, and we're moving in that direction. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, council members Wick, I see you've got into line. I'd really like to have the opportunity to make a couple of quick comments if that's okay with you. Is that okay? Thank you so much. So uh, I want to respond and, and focus back on the small landlords. And uh, I appreciate Council Member Davis's comments, but, you know, I know landlords in the city who barely get by as well. And yeah, they may have got a lot of equity in, but you're asking them to take out a new mortgage on their property to be able to cash out some of that equity or... They have to just give up and sell. And Council Member Della Torre made a huge point a minute ago. I certainly don't want any more corporate landlords in the city. If you're up at midnight, you see all these ads that say, hey, we'll buy your property sight unseen. We'll buy it today for cash. Well, we're getting the same thing with corporations in Santa Monica. And if they can combine parcels, and now with the new density and height requirements, our, our Pico neighborhood is going to be destroyed. Other neighborhoods of the city will be destroyed. I, I don't want to give, I don't want to give those corporate landlords who have plenty of cash and they can dig into their equity and put apartment houses together and yeah, be, they can do 16, 20-story buildings pretty much at abandon right now. That's frustrating to me. I want a tenant, I think a tenant has a better chance with a landlord who lives in the city, hopefully on the property, because then they can go to them, and they're not nameless and faceless. And I see this with uh, Nielsen Villas, some of our other units that are for seniors or for Section 8 tenants where they can't even find an apartment manager. The apartment manager has hours. I'm 9 to 5 Monday through Friday. Screw off on weekends. That's not fair. I'm sorry. It's just not fair. So I'm concerned about that, regardless of your idea that they can go out and take out a new mortgage on their property. Someone who's owned their apartment house for 30 years, they finally paid off their mortgage, and now... A tenant or two tenants haven't paid for months, and they have to wait five or six months just to be able to re-rent it. And, and honestly, if they can't make a deal with that tenant right then and try and do a, a you know payments every month for a year or two years, they're probably not going to get their money from small claims. And since we're now saying that the uh, UD registry may not be effective also, you can't really use that in terms of new tenants, 
then how do you know if your tenant just moved out of one building and he hops to a new building and you can't really find out what's been going on? So then he starts the procedure again. And I know that's extreme. That doesn't happen all the time. But the same as when we look at evictions in the city, I think Council Member De La Torre said there were 67 last year. I don't know how many apartments, I don't remember the exact amount of apartments we have in the city. Do you 47, have 47,000? 27,000. Or 36,000 or 15,000 or whatever it is, it's a lot. <laughs> my, my question then becomes of that is 67 evictions, if we're being data driven, we wouldn't even be considering any of this. But I absolutely feel that we should protect long-term tenants who have been in the city for years, for decades. I know some rent control tenants who have been in rent control departments here since 1979. Now their life is here. They don't ever want to move somewhere else. And that's why we have the pod program. And that's why we have other things to try and help them. And council member Delatore mentioned uh, a landlord fund uh, to help those tenants who are about to be evicted. I would vote for that in a second. And I understand that uh, David already said that's coming. But I am concerned still about those small landlords. So uh, I would like to move the actions on this, move this proposal forward, uh, adopting item one of the recommendations uh, in total. Item two, uh, drop the 150% to 100% on an owner who resides in the city who uh, has 10 units or less. That's in total in the city, not 10 units in that building and 20 units in another building but 10 units or less in the city of Santa Monica who resides in the city, they would have 100%. 100% on the eviction. You know what I'm talking about. The fair market rent. Fair market that rent. Would be the threshold. Okay. On three, um, I would like to slightly amend that to direct staff to, concur to work with uh, rent control if rent control so decides to want to work with on it. Um, and that is it. Everything else would be uh, has is. Mayor, can the motion reflect that this is for the uh, corrected copy you were provided? Yes. Okay. okay. And if I have a second on that. I'm asking for, well, I'm making the motion. I'm asking for a second. Your only amendments are to move it from 150 to 100%. For, for landlords who have less than 10 units in our city. Uh, the second was to have the rent control, to ask the rent control board and ask the rent control department to uh, work with the city council on a city charter amendment. I just have a quick question. Go ahead. Yeah. Can I, just... I just have a question about the motion because this isn't part of the staff's recommendation. This is just staff talking about what could be in the charter amendment, correctly? Right, so the items are the CEQA, the ordinance, and then the charter amendment. Got it. Right. And so the 150% versus 100% is the third item. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's, you're not voting on that we're tonight. We're not voting on that okay. tonight, so I don't but understand. But you'll have that for, right. So that would, that would right. come back. That's not an ordinance. As okay. As part of the proposal. Right. So I don't know why your motion okay. goes Okay, then I will take that part out. So now, well, how is your motion different than the staff recommendation? Uh, the only difference right now would be to ask the rent control board to provide assistance on the charter amendment. And it's moved and seconded. Uh, so, Council Member Zwick. Well, can I just be clear? Because I just want to be clear because sometimes we lack clarity on what we're voting on. So you are proposing the staff recommendation with the simple addition that we asked the Rent Control Board to assist us yes. in drafting the charter amendment. Yes. Other than that, everything in the staff report Correct. you're in agreement with. Okay, great. Yes, Thank you. Correct. As corrected, as corrected, yes, sorry. Yes, by as the corrected. adjusted copy. Okay, great, thank okay. you. Council Member Zwick. Um, well, that might obviate some of my comments. I know there was some proposal having to do with the number of units you have. Is that no longer a part of it? That is not part of it at this time. It okay. would come back. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, we're talking about um, a couple of things. Mayor Brock, you've mentioned that you know five or six months would be a long time potentially if someone was trying to recover a unit. It is a long process. It's currently a long process. This might add a month to it. it we can't say it. we're adding six months to it. That's what it often is now. Um, we're talking about whether or not it's worth evicting someone over a month's rent. And I think we've all said on this dais, including yourself, that less than a month's rent would, would probably not be something for which we would want to have to go through an eviction process and potentially jeopardize someone's tenancy. Um, there's been a lot of talk tonight about uh, corporate landlords and uh, mom and pop landlords. Um, corporate landlords and mom and pop landlords are landlords. They own buildings and they charge rents. Um, mom and pop landlord is a very popular phrase that is utilized by landlords to make landlords seem friendly. Uh, as opposed to like any other landowner what? that is trying to maximize the profit on their investment. Uh, there's no evidence that a corporate landlord is a better or worse actor than a mom and pop landlord. I've had corporate landlords. I've had mom and pop landlords. I've had really deadbeat mom and pop landlords who've refused to do a single repair for me for multiple years in the place that I've stayed in. I've had corporate landlords that were very responsive to things that broke in my house. There's no evidence that one is better than the other. You can look this up. There's also no evidence that one charges more than the other or one is greedier than the other. The only facts that determine how high a rent is charged in a given city are not the individual who is renting it, but how much the market will bear, how much supply there is of housing, how much demand there is for housing in that area. When the vacancy rate in a given city is less than 5%, you will guarantee that you will see rents skyrocket across the city, mom and pops, Corporates, they will all raise it to the hilt to the amount that they can get away with. When the vacancy rate is more than 5%, surprise, surprise, both mom and pop landlords and corporate landlords do not have the ability to raise rents because the uh, tenants have other options and they don't have the same market forces working in their demand. So if we're going to talk about this, the only market forces that are at play here when it comes to good or bad actors or how much people are going to be charging rent is how much supply there is of housing and how much demand there is in a given area. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't answer that. Okay. okay. Again, motion by Brock and seconded by Tarosis. Correct. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Council Members Wick? Yes. Council Member Parra? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Mayor Potem Negrete? Yes. Council Member Tarosis? Yes. Council Member De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Brock? Yes. And that item passes 7-0. Unanimous. Boom. Do we do like a Unanimous. go? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's Appreciate move on. Yeah, Item 10C, introduction and first reading of an ordinance amending Santa Monica Municipal Code Section 3.12. <clears throat> excuse me, 3.12.900, and overnight on overnight parking permits for oversized vehicles. There we are at 11 o'clock. Hmm? Phil, we're at 11 o'clock. You need to call That's for what a she was asking. Okay. Thank you. I was trying to hear her. Um, we, Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're continuing. Thank you from both sides of me. <laughs> I have a, uh, oh, there it is right there. Okay. Um, hello, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Council members, everyone else. Uh, my name is Zach Pollard. I'm the parking manager uh, for the city of Santa Monica. And I'm, uh, you know, prepared this with uh, the police department. And uh, I'm going to present to you the municipal code changes that we're proposing regarding oversized vehicle parking. Um, so first, I'll just explain the existing ordinance for overnight parking permits for oversized vehicles. Um, one of the first things, it defines what an oversized vehicle is. Basically, any vehicle that's either more than 8 feet in width, 8 feet in height, or 20 feet in length. Uh, most of the time, it's like what you see here in the picture, like a sprinter van on the left. It's like a big van slash small RV, or the RV on the right. Um, and the RVs can be up to 45 feet in length. You know, they could easily take up three regular-sized car parking spaces. Um, 
So any resident, as it is now, as the municipal code is written, any resident can obtain a free 30-day permit every 30 days. Um, and that applies to any non-resident can get a, a permit free every 30 days for a 30-day permit as long as they have a resident obtain the permit for them. Um, the vehicle does not have to be registered to the Santa Monica address, like I was just kind of explaining. You can get, you can get one for someone else if you have a visitor coming into town. Um, and they can park anywhere in the city uh, in the right-of-way subject to other parking regulations. And right now we have 45 to 50 active permits. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the complaints and problems that we receive uh, regarding these regulations. Um, between parking and police, we get about 20 to 25 uh, complaints a month in various forms, phone calls, emails, 311 complaints, uh, various other sources. So, I mean, that's almost every single day we're getting one complaint average about, about uh, oversized vehicles parking in the city. Um, they occupy high demand parking areas. Um, you know, they, they're long, they take up a lot of parking spaces. And parking is, uh, you know, it's in high demand in the city, almost everywhere. You know, it's, it's hard to find parking spaces. So these are taking up a lot of parking spaces, and that's a lot of the complaints. Um, you know, limited ability, infrequent turnover. You know, they find a spot and they stay there for a while, so it's hard for people to find places to park uh, for the regular vehicles. Um, and a lot, we get a lot of complaints about them not being um, anywhere near where the resident lives. Um, you could park it a mile and a half from your home, as the rules stand now. And uh, then the final one, non-residents of Santa Monica can obtain unlimited free storage of their oversized vehicles. Um, so these are just complaints and, and issues we have with the existing municipal code. So we're just proposing three simple changes uh, with this ordinance change. Um, one is that we make it so that oversized vehicles have to park within a two block radius of the resident's address who's obtaining the permit. And this is in line with the preferential parking permit regulations. When you have the hang tag in your car, the sticker, you're in one of those zones, you have to park within two blocks of your house. And that's been a good system that we've been doing for years. And we think it would be uh, a, a good practice to impose the same regulation on oversized vehicles. You have to keep it within two blocks of your house. Um, that leaves plenty of parking options still. And then the second one is to limit the oversized vehicle permit uh, for a non-resident to be seven days maximum per month. Um, you could still have a guest come into town in their RV and you could get them a permit for a week, but we wouldn't have the issue where people not living in the city can store their vehicles for free for an unlimited period of time. And then the third one is to authorize a city manager or a designee uh, to adopt further administrative regulations um, on oversized vehicles um, in case there are other minor tweaks that we need to make in the future. And that's basically it, short and sweet. Um, do we have any questions or comments? Or? <laughs> do we have any questions? Uh, Council Member Para. Hi there. Thank you so much for um, the presentation. Just had a quick question regarding the uh, the permits for um, the residents, uh, the getting of the permits for the oversized vehicle. Are they being charged a permit fee for that? There is currently no fee uh, for that. It's it's a free permit right now. So it's a free permit for how many days for the oversized vehicle? You can get it up to 30 days, and you can renew it every 30 days. So you can have it for free, um, or if you keep coming in every, every month, you can just keep getting a new permit every month. Okay, so I have a problem with that. <laughs> As someone that has to pay for <laughs> permits in a pre um, you know in a preferential parking location, um, I have to pay for them, and you know I'm a, we're a family of six in my house, and so. Um, and on my street, there's only 12 driveways. And so we all have to park on the street. So we're forced to park on the street. Um, 
And so we have to pay for them. <laughs> yeah, for the preferential parking pass, mm -hmm. yeah. We were forced to pay for them. And so for someone with an oversized vehicle, they can get a free parking permit every 30 days. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't uh, create a new fee with this ordinance, but in the future we can consider, um, once a year we do a fee study, we so we can that. consider uh, creating a fee for the permit uh, in the future. It'd be like every June we do a fee study. So we can consider that in the future, but we can't, we couldn't uh, have it in this municipal code change right now. Okay, thank you. Council Member Tarosis. Yeah, um, I thanks for everyone who answered my questions in advance on this item, but I just wanted to say, uh, to, to ask on the record, like how, what percentage of the vehicles do we think are folks experiencing homelessness? Well, a lot of the, uh, you know, I don't have a number on that. I mean, mainly we're just trying to take care of parking issues related to curb use management. Um, and we're just trying to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, um, responsibly using our, our public right of way. Um, so sure. this, these municipal code changes are mainly just about parking issues. Yeah, I would just say um, I wanted to make sure there's not some sort of unintended consequence. Are, are we, I just want to make sure that the people who are experiencing some sort of vehicular homelessness are aware that they could be impacted by this change. Because I'll just say anecdotally, when I did the homeless count last year, we certainly experienced folks that were. Um, in oversized vehicles on the street. Yeah, the city yeah, attorney. We would, could. Uh, oh, sorry. Was, oh, no, I was going to say, city attorney. Um, do you want to explain sort of this ordinance in relationship to people experiencing homelessness of what we talked about earlier today, in terms of its application? Well, several things. First of all, yes, the purpose of the ordinance is not to address people living in RVs. Uh, the Ninth Circuit has said that you know people may have a right to live in their vehicles. Uh, this is to deal with location and the appropriateness of anybody's use of an RV. Separate from that issue, uh, the Ninth Circuit has also said there are very limited times in which you may tow a vehicle, uh, and that's limited to the community caretaker uh, rule, uh, and not because they didn't pay a fee or they're even parked illegally unless they're in a place where the traffic needs to uh, go through. So yes, this ordinance is not directed at homelessness. Thanks, and I saw that you, did you also want to make you a have the police department, the homeless liaison we program. Oh my God, yay, love to hear that, okay. And uh, he, yes, Alex Mendoza, um, administrator with the Traffic Services Unit, which encompasses parking enforcement, and he gave me too much credit. Um, I don't deal with the homeless liaison program. Um, but I just to make some com general comments about that, I know you were asking about numbers or metrics. Um, so currently we don't track that. Uh, we don't track how many people we make contact, at least not the, tr the Parking Enforcement Bureau. Uh, doesn't track how many people we encounter that potentially may be experiencing homelessness and um, living in their vehicles. Um, however, you know, as, as you folks are well aware, um, people living in their vehicles isn't just to oversized vehicles, it's people living in just general sedans oh, yeah. or regular mm -hmm. cars. Um, so anytime that our parking enforcement um, officers make contact with people who are um, experiencing homelessness, um, we will provide them um, information for services. Um, there is Safe LA or Safe Park LA, I'm sorry. Um, we do get um, information and we'll leave flyers on their vehicles um, at times just to give them the information of where there's somewhere um, that they can park um, long term for them to also be safe. Um, and do we work in conjunction with our homeless or our help officers um, who come out and do enforcement or any type of um, or provide services to people that are experiencing homelessness in their vehicles. So um, this ordinance doesn't affect any of that. We will still continue to do our normal uh, due diligence to help connect people through services anytime they come in contact with uh, the police department. Thank you so much. I did get questions from constituents about that, so I just appreciate you explaining all of that. And then my last question is, I think obviously this is, I'm, I'm glad that we're, you know, updating. I, I definitely think we need to evaluate the fee situation in the future, but how are we communicating with the, like, is there a comms plan to let the public know about these changes? And are you all prepared to do that once we adopt this? Yes. And okay, yes. great. <laughs> um, if this is approved tonight, it'll come back for second reading, probably first uh, meeting in February. And then it would take 30 days before it would be uh, active and enforceable. <laughs> so we would, uh, you know, first off, we would change the parking administrative, uh, administration website to indicate these, the new rules for the permits. And then we could also use the city's social media pages, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, 
and uh, Instagram. Instagram, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and do a blast out to the public and kind of let everybody know that these are changing on March fourteenth. Okay. Um, so. I guess just if we're mailing anything else to home, like I know that I get mail from the city related to renewing my parking permits, et cetera, et cetera. I would just say like, let's think about non-traditional ways of reaching people. But um, thank you for, for this and I don't have any further questions. Okay. You're welcome. Council Member Parra. Sorry, I realized there was one question I forgot to ask. Um, for people that have oversized vehicles that are disabled and have, you know, the display handicap placard, um, are they required to also go through the process of getting the <laughs> the, the the permits or? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, did you want to? Uh, answer? And and yeah, they are exempt. People who have disabled placards um, are exempt because sometimes we have vans uh, or larger vans mm -hmm. uh, for people who are doing this. Um, we currently those people are exempt from having to pull a permit for uh, for the oversize. And even to include a recreational vehicle. Excuse me. An RV. Yeah, it's it's not an RV. It's it's anytime if a person has a, a disabled placard, um, they would be exempt from the ordinance. It's just a, a way that no, we because I've seen placards on RVs, so I just was wondering if correct. as well. Yeah, correct. Okay, okay. Yeah. They can park wherever they want in the city. <laughs> Sorry, so I just want so some clarification. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is they still have to abide to the rest of the parking rules um, generally. So uh, preferential parking, I think you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, people who pull, for example, pull an oversized permit, mm -hmm. um, they would also still have to have a um, either a visitor pass or a preferential permit. Oh, so they permit. still would have to, even yeah, though not, they have... The oversized permit only allows them to park their oversized vehicle in the city. Oh. Um, it doesn't exempt them from the rest of the parking rules. Yeah, but, if you have a, uh, but if you have a handicap placard... If you have a handicap placard, that exempts you from uh, prefer a preferential parking permit. Okay, so then they wouldn't have, but so then they wouldn't have to get an oversized vehicle permit if they have a handicap placard. That, that's correct. Okay, so that clarifies it. Okay, thank you. Yes, council. Uh, the issue of a permit fee was raised, and we could add language, some to the effect of Susan has some definite language here that there shall be a fee charged for the permit which shall be set by council resolution. You want to read the sure. complete? It would be subsection. You subsection. made sure you wait until she was chewing as well. <laughs> <laughs> it would be sub. Sorry. You're on. Subparagraph K would be added um, right under subparagraph J. And it would say the city council shall establish by resolution such fees as may be required for the review and processing of an overnight parking permit. Okay. This is a bit. Yeah. Thank you so much. Motion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's <laughs> make sure we're do using the queue before we speak. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember yeah, I mean, Davis. Well, yeah, I want to address actually that. So we wouldn't be setting the fee tonight because right. we can't do that. Right. What it said is we could set a fee, but it would have to go through the fee study that we do in connection with Correct. the budget. So it's not like there would be a fee next month. Right. right. But you don't have to include the amount in the ordinance. You said you set the fee. You say we will charge a fee. But we will set the, the amount of that fee by resolution. So right. any given right. council meeting, you can set right. And the fee. and like all of our other fees, it can only be cost recovery. Cost. Right. Yes. So it would only have to do with whatever the cost of administering correct the permit was. Right. What so it's so you'd have to do a study to determine what that is. Right. Okay. Thank you. I I have a oh, council member Zwick. Um, I, I don't know exactly where we are still in this discussion, but I like the idea of including that, and I would uh, propose that we move this item with an amendment uh, to include um, a fee. It's been moved by Zwick. <laughs> it has been seconded by Council Member Tarosis. And I had a question. Um, I know, I don't think we've looked at this, and I don't know if we want to, but Council Member Tarosis brought up a really good point. Are we exiling homeless people out of our city? But if they are, wait, 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 if they uh, have an oversized vehicle and are unhoused, 
right? They're card, but not housed. Have we ever really asked staff to look at the possibility of an, a, a parking lot somewhere in the city that could house campers and vehicles as LA has done and some other cities? David? So I don't believe we've received that direction from council in the past. I would comment that um, in the context of our um, work to address homelessness, that has not been one of the more pressing or present issues we face. It's been more of uh, different types of encampments throughout the city and people uh, sleeping in various parts of the city. The issue of RVs hasn't been top of mind. Um, so as I know in my neighborhood, there are two campers, one of which has been there uh, painted pale blue uh, off Georgina between uh, usually Georgina or 4th Street um, north of Montana has been there at least two, two and a half years. And someone's been living in there. So I, I periodically get questions about that camper van and another van, another camper in the area. And maybe we should think about providing a safe place off our streets for those campers. I'm in the queue. Council Member Davis. We actually did have a discussion about that several years ago. And I think what we decided, and I think we heard it tonight, was that the cost of setting up a safe parking site with all the services that it entails is actually quite expensive. And of course, Whose neighborhood are you going to set that up in, right? People are not going to be happy if you say, all the people in homeless vehicles are coming to your place. So what we did do was set up a program to refer them to the city, the sites that were already existent within the city of LA. I believe there's one at the VA parking lot. And I think there's another one, but I can't remember where it is now. So I think that's what we made the decision to do at least several years ago was rather than sort of take on that burden was to work with people. Um, so if there are people parked in the neighborhood that are in homeless vehicles, I think we have, and we determined that, we do refer them to the safe parking sites where there's services, there's food, there's uh, showers, what they're able to process whatever the waste they need to process out of their vans, that sort of thing. So we did have that discussion at one point in time. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Uh, I'd like to place a friendly amendment to your motion, and it would be that we have staff research a potential safe parking area in Santa Monica. Rather than an amendment, that's added direction. Would that? Yeah, that would be fine. I might, I might recommend in context we are developing a homelessness strategic plan for the city council, so. Um, as opposed to sort of uh, directing our efforts away from that activity that maybe we could save that discussion for when we bring that strategic plan in front of you um, because that will be looking at the totality of our work to address homelessness. Um, it might be a good opportunity to weigh pros and cons and trade-offs about put, 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 you know having staff focus in different directions once you see the totality of the work that we're doing. Can we include that discussion in that? Thank you. Yeah, the, including it as part of our comprehensive uh, review makes sense. So I, I think that makes the most sense compared to doing it right now. Yeah, that's fine. I withdraw my request. Uh, let's call for a roll call vote. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. Councilmember Terosis? Yes. Mayor Proton Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Parra? Yes. Councilmember Zwick? Yes. And Mayor Brock? Yes. And that motion passes unanimously. We're on to. We're on to somewhere. 16. 16A. No, it's 10D. No, 16. 10D got pulled, right? 10D was pulled. Yes, so we're at 16A. Item 16A, appointment to one unscheduled vacancy on the Landmarks Commission for a term ending on June 30, 2026. And we have two applicants for this position. For the record, this seat is earmarked for an applicant who is an architectural historian. Um, 
of the two applicants who have applied, who have applied, only one applicant has self-identified as having this credential, and that's Pam O'Connor. And I would now open the floor for nominations. I nominate Pam O'Connor. Any other nominations? Council Member Para, or Council, well, Council Member Delatore or Para. I have a, yeah, I, I can go first really quick. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, former Mayor Pam O'Connor. You know, uh, I know she has tremendous talent and experience. But looking at the, um, you know, just all the, there's a lot of openings and different commissions. Um, I see a, a, a resignation of Kathleen Benjamin. And and I know that we, we you know, we're, we're talking about how do we diversify, how do, how, how do we practice diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, in our commissions. And I know that there's, there's uh, you know, a lack of representation. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I, I haven't seen, I know that the, um, the uh, city clerk was working on, you know, a, uh, a report to, to council on, on the current commissioners and sort of breaking down race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, all those, um, all those areas so that we, we can, so that we can see where we have gaps. And I really feel that, you know, we need to do that, especially on these very important commissions. Um, and, and anyway, I'm, I'm uncomfortable, you know, continuing to appoint people, even though, you know, I, I, I know, um, uh, Ms. O'Connor is, is very qualified and, I think I think she'd be she'd be a, a you know someone that that would be strong on on the uh, landmarks commission. I just feel like um, one is when are we going to get sort of a full report you know, to council regarding uh, you know the diversity or lack of on the various commissions that we have, and then two, what would be sort of a strategy to you know diversify you know those commission appointments right uh, in terms of outreach. Uh, retention strategies and so forth so anyway that, that's that's that, that's my overall concern and um, I would I would I would feel more comfortable getting that report and, and figuring fit you know and getting and getting some just some guidance on how we might be able to di di diversify before we make further appointments anyway that's my 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 uh, my, my request my position mr. mayor if I can just respond to council member uh, daily Tories yes question. of course um, so the annual report that you're speaking of, um, council receives that every year um, and when you do the annual appointments for boards and commissions. So that's an annual report. Um, and then as far as diversifying, um, I know that when we discussed this three, four years ago, I've lost track of time, um, but um, council had the discussion about how we could diversify the boards and commissions. And at that time, um, I remember specifically um, Mayor Putin Negrete you felt that um, council should take that upon themselves to be the conduit to reach out to community members to get them to join. Um, again, we will be reviewing the boards and commissions uh, program. We do it every five years, so next year will be the next review. So that is something we can take under consideration at that time. Um, but obviously under council direction, you could also direct us to maybe find ways to look into how we can diversify. Thank you. Council member Teresas. Oh, I'm sorry. You had taken your name off. I don't know how I got. Okay, go back. Yeah, you're you're in. I apologize. No, that's okay. Um, no, so I just had a quick question. When did we um, an start announcing the landmark vacancy? I would have to go back in our records. I don't have that. Has it been a while? Um, I don't remember when the vacancy became. I, I don't. I don't know. Um, I know the information's online uh -huh. because we have to notice it. Um, I can pull it up. But I, no, I I'm just wondering. Just because I, my feelings was what I was going to propose is if we could maybe open it up for another thirty days, just be, just because it was the holidays, what have you, and I think a lot of people were out of town. And because we have quite a few vacancies, and so I thought it might give us an opportunity to advocate for it a little bit more so that we have more potential candidates um, to apply for these positions. And um, and now that you reminded us that we said that we would help to be the conduit to advocate for um, these commissions, um, I'd be more than happy to assist with that. So I just wanted to put my two cents out there. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, we literally, this is our first time back here, 
you know, in, all, in over 30 days. Um, and so I really would love the opportunity for us to try to go out and not only as council members, but as a city um, to request um, some some candidates to apply. So thank you. Council member Tarosis. Sorry, just so that we're in order here, um, is someone making a motion to like delay this? Because I'm, because it seems like the motion on the floor is that we have Pam O'Connor. I nominated Pam O'Connor. Right, so that's why I'm like wondering. I we usually don't do discussions on the nominations. That's why I'm just. I didn't get a chance. She did. She went. And, I was going to try to ask a question, and that's. Got it. I'm just trying to figure out procedurally what's. Yeah, happening. this is this is a little bit different, okay. but uh, we have a number of people who ask questions. And so we need to honor the questions in between. Okay. So. Or I think we need to honor okay. the questions. So are we making like blanket statements about all of these like that pe folks are wanting to pause or should we, it sounds like we have a nomination on the floor. I guess I'm just confused. I know you're up, Jesse. Council Member Zwick. Well, I, I guess my first question was going to be, I, I think, akin to what uh, Councilmember Trost has asked, which is, do we, are, do we, as a matter of course, comment on the people that we're voting on? Is that a rule or just a custom? I, I think it's, I think it's a custom that you nominate uh, as many people when you take a vote without comment. Yeah, but but I don't think that's a rule. I think we can adjust that. This is different in that a bunch of people ask questions. So okay. I'm going to honor the questions. Okay. Well, if we're going to have a take the vote. If we're going to have a discussion in that case, uh, the applicants applied in August um, and September of last year. Um, I don't know how many architectural historians are clamoring to have this position and I don't understand why we would delay it beyond the nearly six months it's been since these applicants have applied. Council Member De La Torre. Not sure if it's been six months um, for for this one. I, I, I just want to reiterate my position that um, we should strive, you know, to, you know, to do what we can to have diversity on all of our commissions and I would like to see the the current status of the commissions now sort of the current makeup I don't think it would take you know too long to get that report to council so I'd like to uh, postpone all of these uh, commission appointments until uh, so I want to make a motion uh, to uh, postpone all of them until uh, next month I mean next meeting Second. okay we have a motion and a second to postpone all commission appointments to the first meeting in February or the second meeting in February? To give them enough time, second meeting. How about that? Second meeting in February. And, 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 and to get a report by then of the current status, uh, race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, at least those categories of the current commissioners in, in every uh, city commission. So that so count. It, it's, we have it. Yeah, and I, I don't know the current no, current current, current. we just did it six months ago or seven months five months ago the last time we did appointment so it is fairly fresh not have a, not a lot has changed I mean we obviously had a lot of resignations such like and such but we haven't had a terrible amount of appointments since we did annual appointments in July I think we did annual appointments so the report that we have is uh, fresh I can provide that to you to council um, we could put it out ag again. I mean, tomorrow I can ask staff to do that. Um, I would advise that the only caveat to that is that it is self-report. It's not, it's optional. We cannot force anybody to answer this questionnaire. It's completely voluntary. So, you know, it's the results are never going to be pure. You know, we can strive to get as many responses as we can. We try to push, but at the end of the day, um, it is voluntary. But we do, like I said, we do do it in June every year when we put out the Boards and Commission report. Um, I think Council Member Davis is next, and then you. Sorry. Well, 
two things. One is we asked for an annual report. We got an annual report. There hasn't been tremendous turnover in the boards and commissions since the last report we got. Two, these commissions need people on them. I mean, the, the whole, you know, I mean, to Council Member Zwick's point, Mr. Keller applied in August of 2023. Ms. O'Connor applied in September of 2023. These are not, stay, you know, people who applied in the last two weeks. And quite honestly, and, and this has been an issue in the past, but we do have as part of our Landmarks Commission certain designated positions, and this one happens to be, must be an architectural historian. There are not, to the extent there are people who are architectural historians, they are aware of this, they work with our Landmarks Commission, you know, they know what's going on, they pay attention, they didn't apply, in large part, a lot of them, because they actually do work within the city. I mean, so I don't know why we would not appoint to this important commission that has ongoing work to do on a regular basis, because we're going to wait for an update of a report we got five months ago, which isn't going, as Ms. Newsom points out, uh, isn't going to, I mean, we ask people to self-identify. It's not 100% accurate because not everyone does. But on top of that, we'll get another report in five months. So, I mean, we, we are getting these reports. As Mayor, Vice Mayor, I apologize, Vice Mayor Negretti pointed out, as Ms. Newsom pointed out, it's incumbent on us. It's, it's not as if this wasn't on the agenda. Everyone knew this was coming up. This has been on the agenda for a while. I mean, and people can apply at any time. There doesn't have to be a vacancy for people to apply. These, so, you know, if we want to go out and get people, we should have all been doing that. We can't wait until, oh, there's a vacancy, so now you should apply. I'll, I'll just be honest. I'm going to say this. I think this is personal against Ms. O'Connor. This hasn't come up in any other board and commission appointments that we've done. And I just think that's really unfair. She's qualified. I've nominated her. I mean, we can vote on the motion to postpone it. And if it passes, it passes. But this has not come up. We've been doing over the last few months appointments to various committees, and no one has raised this issue until Pam O'Connor's name came up. And I just think that's frankly disgusting. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Negrete. Um, okay, so quick, quick question for you, Clerk. Um, do we, what other questions do we ask? Do we ask in that questionnaire, is it just based like on sex, race, age, or do we also ask, have you served on other commissions and boards? Or is it just really to figure out diversity from the stance of ethnicity? Yeah, it's strictly a demographic report. So to dovetail on what uh, Council Member Davis said, um, I'm going to highlight and agree that this, I think this is less about maybe personal to Ms. O'Connor, I, I don't know, but I do think that I'm just going to point out the obvious, like we're tiptoeing around it. I think this is more about creating diversity, and maybe I'm wrong, on these commission and, and boards, not just from an ethnicity standpoint, but there's like a group of people who have consistently, and that's just how things happen. It happens in PTAs at schools that tend to be the ones that are running things all the time, right? And so um, it may look a certain way, Ethnically, I don't know. It may look a certain way um, in terms of social status, but I think that's the issue here. I think that's what we're tiptoeing around. And I personally will admit that I don't look at all the vacancies all the time to know when I should be marketing things out there. And one of the biggest things about getting people involved, whether it be on a school campus or in volunteering your time in commissions and boards at the city, is it's a cultural thing. It's like not cultural as... I don't mean that in an eth ethnicity way. I mean that like culturally, like if you weren't born and raised in a family, I'm speaking for myself, where your parents had the time, luxury of time to volunteer their time because they were working, you may not know that. So we have to go out and do that work. And I think if we're asking to extend this just because we want to take notice and say, you're right, this is a very specific role and there's probably not maybe a ton of people to pull from in this role. Um, but I think what we're talking about here, since we're pointing out the obvious, we may as well just be open about it, is that we want to diversify these boards and commissions, and we would like to get more people to apply. We're trying to figure out how to make 
applying for or even reading any city news as sexy as possible. We've got a new person out there trying to do, you know, Instagram and Twitter and trying to get it out in all the different modalities. But I think it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to take some time because it's going to be a cultural shift and we're going to have to really lean on our community partners to go out into the community and say, what does it mean to be on this board? I mean, maybe we do have someone who's never thought of it that's out there that does you know, meet all the requirements, I don't know. But I think what it is is, you know, well, oftentimes we see the same names over and over and over again. And those are the same people that once they're on commissions and boards, you know, that's the sort of pathway into higher leadership, whether it be city council and so on and so forth. And so I think that's really the discussion here maybe, right, that we're looking at creating a more diverse population on these commissions and boards, not just from a... Um, race standpoint, but really just giving other people opportunity who wouldn't normally have it. So, I mean, I'm not against giving more time because I don't think there's anything crucial. So if there's nothing crucial that these boards have to vote on and we give it, you know, a real good college try to get out there and um, do some marketing and try to find other applicants, then at least we can say we did that. So I'm open to that. Mayor, if I may, I'm, I'm C12. That's, that's why I was one. I was looking, going. Someone just appeared. Yeah, that's me. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to add that diversity and inclusion was paramount, or one of definitely one of the pillars of when we were uh, discussing this matter again three, four years ago now, and um, that is why there is in the resolution a, a cooling off period, so that anybody who did serve on anybody for a certain period of time. Um, which there are limited now. There is a term, you know, there are term limits for these boards and commissions. They have to sit out for, and I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head, but they have to sit out for at least, I think, two years before they can then reapply for another board and commission. But in this example, I don't know, Pam was mayor and on council many years before applying for this commission. I get that, but I just think, you know, I think that might be part of the issue as well. And I mean, unfortunately, we've picked a particular commission that's probably been historically difficult, right, to find qualified individuals. So this isn't really the best example, but I just wanted to make that point. Um, can I, Councilman Delatory, are you going again? How, how, what's the outreach strategy that we have to, for historically marginalized communities? Like, what, what is the strategy that we have for the Latino community, African American community, and so forth? Like, is there is there a, a specific sort of protocol that we are working with to outreach to these communities? At this time, at this time, I can't say that there's um, an actual protocol or strategic plan. Um, again, this is something that we revisit every five years as to how we can more diversify the board and commission program. Um, we, you know, we, we are required by law to make certain postings. We do put it out on social media. We notice it in the paper, it's on our website, all those sorts of things, but we do not have a specific um, outreach program as of this time for, to recruit new members. Okay, so that's a little concerning because every five years, you know, staff's looking at this and we haven't, for example, you know, churches, for example, you know, how do we access, you know, schools, churches, I mean, the PTS, PTAs, PTSAs, uh, there's there's a wealth of, of leaders that are out there in our community. We have to have a robust outreach strategy. And then the other part is like the retention strategy. I mean, I see, you know, I know who Kathleen Benjamin is. Um, and I know there's been others, you know, people that, that resign. And, and I don't know the reasons, you know, but it'd be good to have sort of an exit interview, right, for us to understand sort of what happens to, you know, people of color who do join, um, these commissions and what's their experience and how can we improve that experience so that we we can have staying power right um in any case we don't have a specific outreach plan for historically marginalized communities uh we don't have a a strategy to retain people or to or really to even understand you know why people are exiting you know their appointments or and so forth so i i i just feel like you know, we can't say we want, you know, we want a diverse, we want DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then, and then not, 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 not give ourselves some time to try to uh, attain that, you know, and, and, and so I, I just feel that it, it would be responsible for us, 
and then the other thing, the other reality is our first meeting coming out off of the holiday season is very difficult. And I don't know when, when all this was posted, when the opening was posted, but I, I think it would be good for us to give us some more time to see if we can put it out there and see it and see it and see if we can, you know, start developing some strategies around outreach to historically marginalized groups. If we want to get people to participate, we're going to have to use unconventional methods, you know, uh, to get people to, to know that it's that that what it is and how to participate and so forth. Anyway, I just I, I just want us to do that so that we can feel good about you know the the the, the strategy that we're using to diversify these appointments. Council Member Para. So I just wanted to say for the record that I resent the accusation that this is personal, and that's why I said what I said. I was supporting my fellow colleague who wanted to give instruction to try to diversify. We've had a lot of conversations on this dais today about DEI, and yet here we go <laughs> arguing that just be so just because you didn't get your way because you wanted your person up on this dais. And so I resent the accusation um, that, that you are trying to imply that this was personal. All I was trying to do was try to bring forth something that would be a little bit more equitable up here. Um, so that we can have more of a pool. So I'm sorry if you felt that that's what we were trying to do here or what I was trying to do here, but um, that was not my intention. I don't know Miss O'Connor. I've never met her in my life. I've never had a conversation with her in my life. So um, just thought I'd clear the record. Um, just to, to add something before... Uh, Councilmember Davis goes. It we are dissolving right now into a he said he said she said and a whole bunch of personal attacks that are coming. I, I'd like us to be respectful of each other as a city council, please. Councilmember Davis. Well, I think we should just vote on the motion, um, which is pending on the floor. But I do want to point out that I can't speak for anyone else. I routinely talk to people throughout the community from different neighborhoods, from about you should apply for this commission, you should apply for that commission. This was the whole discussion we had. I don't wait for there to be an opening. I talk to people, you should apply for planning commission. We really need your voice on the disabilities commission. So if there, I think it's unfair to put it off on staff that somehow staff hasn't been doing outreach and that's sort of the implication. We had this discussion and the discussion was that we were going to take responsibility for that. So I, I think we all should take responsibility for that and I'm not opposed to coming up with better strategies to do outreach when we look at boards and commissions. I, I agree we need more diverse boards and commissions but right now we have an appointment in front of us for a very specific person for a very specific commission that requires a very specific expertise and I don't know if there's anything important coming up on the Landmarks Commission agenda between now and the end of February or March or whenever. I can't speak to that. I, you know, so I think we should vote on the applicants that are before us tonight, but we still have to deal with the other motion, and if it passes, then it passes. Okay. The discussion is done. Let's uh, vote on the substitute, well, on the motion on the floor right now. And Council, that motion, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's a motion to continue items 16A and 16B for until the second meeting in February, right? Second meeting. I thought it was a motion to continue all appointments, all appointments. until the second meeting. Well, those are the only two. Well, well there might two. be some who come up on the first oh. meeting in February. Okay. So it's a motion to continue all right. appointments. All of them, right. correct. Okay. And 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 to and to have well the the month the re, have the report updated. It was done six months ago, but let's have that report to council updated. Maybe there might be a slight change, and then also to collectively. I mean, maybe there's four or five ideas that we can have in terms of outreach, so that council then has uh, our marching orders. You know, so if I need to go to St. Anne's Catholic Church and give a uh, you know talk to someone over there to say, hey, are, do you have any leaders, you know, that might be good to, you know, apply to any of these openings? Uh, here are the lists. I'll do that. I'll take responsibility to do that. But uh, 
if staff has other ideas on how to do it, uh, I'll, 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 I'll partake in whatever strategy is, is going to be the best to, you know, get to as many people, especially historically marginalized populations. Uh, I'd like to make maybe an editorial comment. I don't want to prolong this evening more than it is right now. But Pam served the city for 40 years, I think, 35, 40 years. Um, I've had numerous disagreements with Pam on policy since 2014. But she started her career in the city on the Landmarks Commission. She is probably the only architectural historian that lives in Santa Monica. Her career has been as an architectural historian. She comes in and gives expert opinions on projects throughout LA. My, cons my only concern was something different, uh, that Pam had checked off lobbyist on her application. Now, I understood she was going to check with the city clerk and had said to me when I, and I talked to her this afternoon in, in full um, disclosure, and I asked Pam if she had served as a lobbyist. She said she has never served as a lobbyist, doesn't serve now. That would be my objection, and I've been, I, I think when Pam's first two or three terms on the council, I thought she was great and then my confidence in her dissolved. That happens, that'll happen with me too. What I would regret is 10 years from now, when I'm older and I come back and say, I'd like to be on the Recreation and Parks Commission again. And everyone looks at me and says, you know what? You were an asshole half the time, so I'm not gonna vote for you, pardon the language. So honestly though, that's my concern, is that for all of us on this dais, we're going to do things some people like, some things people hate. Pam was no different. I'm no different. Gleam is no different. We all try and vote our conscience. Sometimes we err. Sometimes we do good things. I, I am concerned because even though my first instinct when, and, I, and I'm honest, when I saw Pam's name last night, I went, I was originally horrified. But Pam and I have been talking. We served together on the Southern California Association of Governments. She knows more about city government and more about preservation than I'll ever know. So as much as I've had disagreements and many people in the city have had disagreements with her and many people in the city love her, I, I don't, I, I, I will Vote to confirm her as a Landmarks Commissioner if that comes up tonight, and I will support her because my job, all of our jobs, is to work for the entire good of the community and the entire good of every resident, if they agree with me or disagree with me, and that's the same standard for all of us. It really is. I have said I'll talk to anybody on any street corner in the city, regardless of whether they voted for me, voted against me, it doesn't matter. So I, I'm sorry to take that moment of privilege, but I do want us to know that we may be saying a really poor example of when I walk up here on my cane 10 years from now and ask to be on a committee or commission and, and Gleam is right behind me trying to be on a separate commission. Yeah. I'm hitting you with my yeah, Well, yes. And, and, well, that I expect. But, uh, and it's not really levity, it's really serious. But I speak from my heart. And, and regardless of disagreements, Pam and I are talking. For the first time in eight years, we've been talking. And I appreciate her outreach. And I believe my duty is to outreach to her. So let's take a vote on, oh, no, we can't. Well, first we have um, a motion Mr. On the Mr. Zwick wants to speak. Oh, sorry. 
I can I can see it. I, I, I appreciate your comments, Mayor. I think uh, it's uh, wise and magnanimous. Um, I think we have to vote first on the substitute yeah. motion. Yeah. I'm sorry. So we got the substitute I, motion. Oh, it is the motion. It's the motion on the floor right now. There's one motion on the floor. And can we have a roll call? I, do we need a roll call vote? We don't need a roll call, but I, I just need to clarify. So the motion on the floor is to postpone all appointments um, until the second meeting of February and that the city clerk's office bring back a report, um, I'm assuming, at the, set, the same meeting. That's what the motion is. Yes. Right? Okay. And I'm sorry, who made the first and the second? Oscar, Oscar and Para. And, and Para. Christine. Okay. So, um, you know, I think it's better if we do a voice uh, a roll call vote for this. Yeah, and, and the report would be to look at diversity, equity, and inclusion in uh, commission appointments. So the only thing we can do the report on is based on, uh, it's a screenshot of what the current makeup is right now. Um, it, there's a two different things that you were asking for. What about, like, outreach strategies? Can you, can... Uh, we know. Can we put a few outreach strategies into the report? In a month. I, I can't commit um, our office's time and say that we're gonna, we can have that um, by the second meeting in February. Okay. So the, the motion is without the uh, outreach strategies, but everything else has been included. Okay. Okay. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilman Ruswick? No. Councilmember Rapara? Yes. Councilmember Davis? No. Mayor Potem Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Tarosis? No. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. And Mayor Brock? No. Oh, that was four to three? No, it lost three to four. It lost four, three to four. Three to four, I'm sorry. Well, I nominate Pam O'Connor. Are there any other nominations? No one else is qualified and applied. Okay. So by acclamation. No, I don't know if everyone. Oh, I see. So uh, can we do this by uh, just a voice vote, or do we need a roll call on this one, too, since it's been disruptive? No, typically we do it by roll call. I think so. Okay. Councilmember De La Torre. I mean, I, I want to stick to my guns, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm, gonna I'm abstain. Councilmember, De, uh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Tarosis. O'Connor. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete. O'Connor. Councilmember Davis. O'Connor. Councilmember Parr. I'm abstain. Councilmember Zwick. O'Connor. And Mayor Brock. O'Connor. Congratulations, Pam. You're back on the Landmarks Commission <laughs> that you first started on, I believe, in 1989. Hmm. Okay, let's move on. What's our next item? Human Services Commission. Next item is appointment to one unscheduled vacancy on the Human Services Commission for a term ending June 30, 2025. And we have three applicants for this seat. Zoe Montaner, Matthew B. Sussman, and Giselle G. Il, I'm sorry, Yilmaza, Yilmaza. And there's one. One vacancy, to have only one appointment. Do we have a nomination? Let's go around the room, starting with Mr. Zwick. Sorry, hold on, apologies. If you can pass. I'll pass for now. Anyone? I'll nominate Ms. Yil, Yil Mazir. Anyone else, any other nominees? Seeing no other nominees, do we we don't need a roll call on this one. If there's no other nominees, yes, by acclamation. By acclamation? Wait, hold on. No. Hold on. Give me a second. This is for the human services,
Are we good, or do we have another nomination coming? Hold on, my, I lost my sheet, so give me a second, please. Since I'm not on the website and I can't get in here, who are the applicants again? Zoe Montaner, Matthew B. Sussman, and Giselle G. Yomazer. Yomazer, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it as it is. Thank you. Okay, uh, Giselle Yomazer, and I'm probably butchering your name. I apologize, Giselle. Uh, all in favor? Hi. Hi. And Giselle, congratulations. You're a new Human Services Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your application and thank you for being willing to serve. Item 16C, recommendation to accept Kathleen Benjamin's resignation from the Arts Commission and authorize the city clerk to publish the vacancy. Move to accept, move to accept with great, great gratitude and also sad to see her go. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you so much for your past service, Kathleen. Item 16D, recommendation to accept Deborah Sinopoul's resignation from the Housing Commission and authorize the city clerk to publish the vacancy. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second from Delatore, motion by Vice Mayor Negrete. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 16E, request of the Disabilities Commission to declare Kara Hindler's seat vacant due to absenteeism and lack of communication with, from the incumbent. Um, Motion by Tarosa, second by Delatore. All in favor? Um, Aye. Aye. Item 16F, request of Councilmember Davis, Councilmember Tarosa, and Councilmember Zwick that the City of Santa Monica acknowledge the one year anniversary of City Council's adoption of the statement apologizing to Santa Monica's African American residents and their descendants by one, agreeing annually to acknowledge and read the statement at the beginning of the first City Council meeting every November, two, allocating $10,000 in City Council discretionary funds to the City, I'm sorry, the Santa Monica High School Black Student Union to provide financial support to seniors aspiring to attend college in the form of application fees, scholarships, and other costs associated with the transition to college. Three, direct the city manager to explore the installation of the statement outside of the city hall so the statement can be publicly accessible for all to read. And four, direct the city manager to survey reparation efforts in other jurisdictions and direct the city attorney to identify any potential legal issues and report back to the city council within 180 days. I'll jump in. Uh, Vice Mayor Negrete. Well, no, I'm, I let them introduce them. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll, no. I'll jump in. I mean, it's fairly self-explanatory, um, and I want to appreciate everyone who come out and spoke in favor of it. I do want to point out a couple of things that I think are really important. Um, this is a baby step. This is only a first step. I don't want anyone to think that we have um, exhausted our obligation to the black community with this, but sadly, I think as everyone in this room knows, our current financial condition is such that we can't take bigger steps. I wish we could. I think everyone wishes we could. And so I really think that, uh, you know, at least making this gesture will be very important, particularly um, allocating the $10,000 to the Black Student Union to assist students to uh, uh, who aspire to college to, and, and we did try and make it flexible because we understand that there are various impediments to students, um, from historically marginalized communities. It's not just all about how do you pay for college, but how do you pay for your SAT fee? How do you go visit a college? That sort of thing. Um, can you get some counseling? That sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, directing the city manager to survey reparations efforts. We know that other communities have undertaken this work. Um, some have been successful, others have not. And so I think before we start to sort of strike out on our own, it's important for us 
to uh, to see what is happening in other communities, take the best ideas. We, the smartest people, always steal the best ideas, um, and and get a report back. I do want to make two comments. One is we did hear about expanding the number of languages that the apology would be available in. I think that's great, but obviously there are more than I believe. 1,200 languages spoken in the world. We're not going to have 1,200 plaques. But I think we can do a couple of things. One is we can have a QR code that links to many different um, uh, languages, even if we do it maybe in, in a couple of obvious ones. But two, um, and someone did mention about where it would go, I think it's important that it be in front of City Hall. This is, this is something City Hall is taking the responsibility to, but again, I would hope maybe through a QR code or some other um, visual representation, we could direct people to do perhaps what I would call a, a thoughtful or a reflective tour where they could start at City Hall, walk through uh, uh, the artwork around um, historic Belmar Park, um, and sort of contemplate uh, where we are in the world and where we need to go. And I think making that part of a contemplative opportunity for people I think is really important. But it's really key to me anyway that the apology be outside of City Hall, that it's available to people on weekends, that it's available to people. And I would, I'll just throw this out there, I would personally hope that when City Hall is open that there will be charcoal and parchment paper available so that anyone who wants to come and do a rubbing of the apology. I think that would be a lovely thing to allow people to do. So that I will leave it to Council Members Wick and Tarosis to add on to that. I think I've, Phil, who's next? Council Member oh, sorry. Uh, Tarosis, do you have anything to add? Sure. Yeah, so I would just say that um, I want to acknowledge everyone who has given feedback over the last year since I've been on Council. Um, I also really want to thank the Committee for Racial Justice for continuing to push us um, and, and everyone who helped give feedback uh, for our strategic plan for equity and is continuing to do so. This is just one small piece, like I, like um, Councilmember Davis said, uh, and we need to do more. And I would just say that the resolve of the Black Apology, I just want to quote it, is to take responsibility for personal and direct contributions to discrimination. Um, and I just want to say as a white person, it's imperative that those who benefit from white supremacy take a personal stake in anti-racism and equality. Um, and so that's why I've, you know, taken upon myself to continue learning um, on my anti-racism journey. And I think this is our annual reminder of Santa Monica's racist history, quite frankly, that is hopefully going to propel us towards progress. Um, I just want to say one of my uh, favorite people, Toni Morrison, famously said that the function of racism is to waste your time. Um, <laughs> and I can explain that more, but this, she has a really great quote about how uh, the function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving to them that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. And somebody says that you have no kingdom, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. Uh, Santa Monica should never again have to waste time arguing about the history of the racist policy in our city and the ways in which the systemic racism continues to plague our community today. Um, we know that uh, the Viceroy Hotel, and I've said this publicly and I'll say it again, is sitting on land that was taken uh, from the Ebony Beach Club and from uh, black residents here in this city. And I think we have quite a bit of work to do uh, to acknowledge that, commemorate that, and continue. Um, and so I just, I think this is important. I hope that everyone will vote in favor of this. This is one small step. One other thing I want to say, um, someone outreached to me that we should make the uh, scholarship for the Black Student Union also available to homeschooled students. I understand there are some homeschooled students who uh, are no longer at Santa Monica High School because of, of incidences that they've faced. Uh, and so I don't know if there's a way to give direction to the city manager when we when and if we do um, pass this to make sure that when we give this money to Santa Monica High School that they do allow for homeschooled parents to apply for it. But I just wanted to uh, make that additional request. Thanks. Council member, uh, Vice Mayor Negrete. Sorry, I'm fading. 
Um, oh, sorry. do you want to keep? We're not in there. No, oh. Well, no, it was. But he's I, one of the proposers. I took it out of order because we were one of the proposers. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I won't add much. Um, Councilmember Chiros was very eloquent just now. Um, I'll just say, you know, when the black apology happened um, and um, I was uh, running for office, I was asked about it and the, 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 the right to return policy and I said it's a really good first step, um, but it's clearly not enough. Um, these policies uh, I hope to be a really good second step, but are clearly not enough. And um, I, I think it's it's clear that there's just a long road to go, but I'm happy to be reaffirming our commitment and uh, to do so annually going forward. So thank you. Okay, now Vice Mayor Negrete. Um, on that note, as we mentioned many times that this isn't enough, but we do have discretionary funds and we're putting forward 10,000. As someone who's had two kids go through the application process, SAT process, and have one that it's about to be going through, and I can tell you right now, given that there's 70 students in BSU, this is not going to cover more than two, and we are, I'm part of the CTE program that the high school, we're talking to kids about applying for more than three, you get the one free, and this is not, wouldn't even cover taking a test. So. On the note of it not being enough, I would propose, if we can, to make an amendment to increase it. As somebody who's given way more money towards, and admittedly towards music programs for the school to send kids um, off to amazing countries to represent us, um, also important. But this seems like a small amount for more than just a one-time experience. Um, this is an opportunity of a lifetime to change um, generational outcomes, and so. I know we got a little bump, I think, or we're getting one in our discretionary funds, I heard, maybe, city manager. <laughs> I don't know if we have the room to increase it by 5,000, but I, that was what I wanted to propose. Well, you do have um, discretionary funds that you could increase it uh, today, and then, yes, as part of the mid-year budget, we will be making proposals to council to increase the discretionary account. Well, that's my proposal because I'm doing the math and I'm just telling you from recent experience, it's hundreds of dollars to apply and the worst position to be in, um, being a student or a parent in need, is to have your sit down with your kid and tell them, okay, we need to narrow down your dreams and your options. And so um, in an effort to not have to do that um, and this not being enough and 15000 also not being enough, um, I hope to propose to also help to find some um, community um, sponsors to help support that, maybe even match it. But in the meantime, if we can increase it to fifteen thousand, I'd like to propose that friendly amendment. Uh, yeah, I think I, I don't think anyone here will argue with that. <laughs> What's happening with the New York Santa Monica fund? Is that a source? No, let's go on to other stuff. It's already okay. been allocated. Okay. okay, I forgot I asked that. Um, well, I, I, we can't make an application. I don't think we can as staff, but I think we could maybe talk to the student union about making an application to it. Yeah, applications are roughly sixty to a hundred dollars each. And, yeah, and not it would depends on the school, and some are fifty three, most are a hundred, a lot are in the eighty dollar range, and then there's the SATs. Um, prep courses, and there's a lot of waivers, but they don't apply for the help that you need to take, you know, to learn how to take a test. So there's a lot to be done, um, and I'm, I'm grateful that there's all, a lot of things in here that that it seems to be covering, but it feels like if we could put more, and I'm happy to help make connections with community partners that I've had help most recently that I'm sure would help maybe do a match. Council Member Para. So um, I'm happy that my colleagues brought this forward and that it's going to be an annual apology. I think we all shared this moment a year ago, and it makes me emotional just even thinking about it because, um, you know, just as a person of color as well, I share your pain. You know, we've lived in, you know, living in the Pico neighborhood. Um, that's why I'm here. Um, that's what brought me here is because for 
almost 25 years I've, I've been fighting City Hall. And you know, um, and there's just been so many conversations around change, right? And being, you know, being equitable. And look how many times we talked about it today, right? And we talked it around, we, we spoke about it today around, you know, the black agenda and our black brothers and sisters and about reparations. And I'm thankful and grateful that we're having these conversations openly and in a safe place, you know, but it also hurts me, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of our brothers and sisters that were misplaced, you know, by the freeway, you know, and so there's a lot of groups, other groups in this community that have been harmed by this city. And so when we talk about, you know, reparations, and I don't want to take away from, from our, our, our black brothers and sisters, African American brothers and sisters here in our community by any means, but I really would love to have an opportunity you know, as we move forward to have a greater conversation about um, moving forward and healing. Because I can tell you, I can tell you, you know, that on a daily on this dais and in closed sessions, there's a lot of stuff and conversations that happen up here, <laughs> you know, that we really need to have that DEI training <laughs> and conversations because people just don't get it. They just don't get it. And it doesn't matter how many times that I, I get frustrated and try to point out inequi inequities, um, just don't get it. So today is a good day. It's a great day. What a blessing. I'm so thankful that we can offer this $15,000 um, to our kids and um, in our community. I think it's a wonderful opportunity, and it's a start. And it's a start. And whether I'm on this dais or not, come 2024, I will always be a partner. So please count on me. Thank you. Council Member Delatory. I support the item, you know, but um, in terms of the, um, the apology, you know, in, in, reading, in reading the apology, we talk about systemic racism and 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 for me you know i think about like the hypocrisy you know of this government of this city council in particular you know spending millions against voting rights california voting rights act you know millions of dollars that we spend uh to deny you know latino voting rights in particular but in the Pico neighborhood, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's black and, it's black and Latino residents sharing community space together. Any benefit for any group is, is a benefit for, for all that live in that part of the city. And, you know, part of the, just part of the reasoning even, I just read, I read one of the briefs and it's, and, and it's, and our lawyers are saying, you know, there was no racism back in 1947 when we switched <laughs> to the at-large election system. Uh, there's no evidence of that, and then and then and then I just read another report that came out months ago that says no, that's exactly what governments did. They used the at-large election system to marginalize people of color, in particular African Americans. Um, so it's it's hard for me to believe, you know, that that didn't happen in the city of Santa Monica. You know, when you look at all the in the apology, it says 1920s. You know, there was a group of white homeowners here in the city of Santa Monica that created an organization and passed an ordinance just to make sure, you know, black entrepreneurs didn't open up a, a music hall or, or a venue, you know, for, for, for people to, to enjoy. Um, racism existed back then very strongly, you know, and, and so anyway, I, it, it, it just, it's just, you know, as a, as a Mexicano, Mexican American, Chicano, Latino, uh, resident of the city of Santa Monica who grew up in the Pico neighborhood, you know, and with my black brothers and sisters, you know, in solidarity, I mean, obviously I'm going to support this, but it's also, we, we can't just look at racial justice, you know, from sort of the white black binary, you know, we need to, we need to expand on that. I mean, there's Japanese Americans here in Santa Monica that were displaced during World War II, you know, sent to concentration camps, Manzanar and so forth, right? Um, we look at, you know, there's a long history, you know, with 
Mexican American, Mexican, Latino people, you know, have experienced a lot of discrimination here in the city, and and um, so 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 we have to expand on that. And and I don't I don't want to I, I don't want to uh, come off as 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 hating on oh the you know this group's getting this and and I want it too. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you know this should serve as inspiration for us to think on how we we create more unity, you know, by acknowledging. <laughs> you know, all historically marginalized groups in our city and have an apology to all those groups as well. So, you know, I plan to work with staff to bring something back, you know, to do that because I think we should have a statement like that. I also don't want four, you know, four apologies at least, you know, uh, or maybe more outside of City Hall. I think that, you know, we should think about one apology um, that's all encompassing. And I understand that, you know, we're not there yet. I mean, this is part of our development as a, as a, as a government, you know, and as a people and as a city. And, and I'm thankful to, you know, my black brothers and sisters that, that have been moving on these issues, you know, because it, it, it we could learn from it, you know, we can be inspired, you know, to, to expand, you know, on, on what's, um, on what's before us today. So I, I don't want to just say that, the, you know, we're saying, well, this is the be this is the beginning of something. It's not the end, and I, I know we're saying that, but um, we should be thinking, you know, not just like the beginning and the end, you know, in recognizing one group's oppression, but to look at all groups that have experienced oppression at the hands of our city, so that we can heal. I think there was a, a very important word that Councilwoman Parra said: is healing. How do we come out of this? You know where we can heal from the past, right? Because obviously we can't change it, but we can do something in the present. And and part of that has to include healing. And the other part has to be unity. You know, how do we come out more united? You know, so that, because I hear it all the time, you know, I'll vote on this, support it, and then someone in my community will say, well, what about us? You know, and I have a friend who's Native American, right? And he's Tongva, and he, 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 he his bloodline, he says, man, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Like, you guys act like, it's like Chappelle said, you know, like, yeah, you, you all were part of, I read about you in social studies or whatever, you know, you made a joke about it. It's, it's kind of funny, but people are still here, you know, the Native American community is still here. Indigenous people are still alive here. And, um, and, and, and to not have any recognition, I mean, for the oppression that they've experienced also, I think, is not being, is not being, uh, we're not, we're not, we're not fulfilling our promise, I think, to, on these issues, you know, and, and so, in any case, uh, I, I'm going to support this. I'm going to recommend that we give $18,000, uh, so $3,000 more, because I agree. I mean, I think, okay. I, I think, I think we need to do more. And, and I and and, 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 I, and I'm inspired by Council Councilwoman Negrete, you know, saying, you know, I thought about it, and it's like 70 students in the Black Student Union. That doesn't go a long way. I just, I, I think, uh, I want to recommend that we do 18. Um, and then, you know, with the whole issue of reparations, I mean, it's a big discussion. I'd like to learn more about sort of what other governments are doing. So I think that's great. But um, I, I just want to make sure that today we plant the seed also, and then we get we get ready to think about sort of how do we how do we come full circle with with something that's more inclusive, right? Uh, uh, this is a great start, but we need to we need to think about how we how we close the loop on that on, on this issue so that all groups that have historically been harmed by our policies or our leadership or lack of leadership uh, we can we can give that apology and we can we can have uh, we can start the healing in those communities as well so if I can plant the seed in a positive way around this conversation is um, one uh, at the next council meeting, um, I'm excited that we'll be bringing forward the results of the deep work that was done around the murals in um, the lobby of City Hall, which, you know, Councilmember De La Torre, Councilwoman Parra, you were behind a lot of that work. And so you'll see the fruits of that labor um, come forward and I think, you know, deepen um, our work. And then secondly, which I think I really appreciate the comments tonight and we'll be bringing forward to over the course of the year, um, under the leadership of Lisa Parson and our team, um, you know, the results of the engagement to develop a citywide equity plan, which is really meant to be centered on a lot of the principles that have been talked about tonight about bringing our community together and healing. And so I hope that, you know, this conversation comes up again in a very real way when this work comes in front of uh, the entire council to really help inform um, our work for years to come in this domain. So I just wanted to acknowledge that there's more 
um, to happen over the course year in which these conversations will definitely uh, come to life in tangible action oriented ways. So uh, I'm taking a moment. Um, I, I want to let our black community know that I am with them 100 percent the way I always have been. I think the only mistake I was thinking about this a few minutes ago and thinking when I was in the first black studies class at Santa Monica High School with my white teacher. Hey, but it was a black studies class and we were studying Langston Hughes and everything else. This was 19, my teacher was about to go to the Olympics for the fourth time to win his fourth gold medal. So he left us for a month during the semester. But I was exposed to so much in his class and I grew up thinking that Santa Monica, we were one of the most ideally racially mixed communities in the state. In fact, we played uh, Santa Barbara in basketball in 1970. And Keith Wilkes, uh, Jamal Wilkes, who's one of my clients uh, now, was on their team. And there was a newspaper article that said Santa Monica and Santa Barbara are the two communities in the state that are most ideally mixed. And then in the last couple of years, I started reading about the injustice that was done to the black community in our city. And uh, my friends were the first BSU presidents in San Juan, Val Lyons and people like that were in my classes. And I appreciate all of them because I grew up at the boys club playing sports and having friends with everybody. But I didn't realize how bad it was in Santa Monica. When I heard that they burned the community down just west of here, just the west of where we're sitting, they didn't even have the respect to demolish it. They just burned it down to erase it. I, it was horrible. I'm proud that the, that the park I worked for for 20 years, Belmar, is the only park in our city that really shows the history of the community. I'm, I'm proud every time I walk in that park and the plaques. We need more. As Council Member Delatore said, it's, boy, you can look at any racial group in Santa Monica and find out they were wronged. It's all over the city. So yeah, we need to do more for all racial groups in our community. And we recognize some of the injustice done to Japanese residents a few years ago when we named Ishihara Park in, in uh, Christy and Oscar's community in their neighborhood for them. And we recognize Joe Gandara across the street from there and at Woodlawn Cemetery because he's a symbol of our community who was wrong, not by our community, but wrong by the nation. Wrong by the whole nation. And then I, I walked over to our assistant city manager about 20 minutes ago and I said, we named Tongva Park and we recognized they were the first residents of this land. And then I asked Susan, do we have a plaque for Tongva Park? Do we have a plaque outside City Hall or in the park recognizing the first residents of the city whose land we're on? I don't think we do. And, huh? Carolyn? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not chastising you, I'm asking. I don't think we do either. I don't think we ever did crap other than we named the park. Damn it. Let's start correcting those wrongs, not only for our African-American and I'll say brothers and sisters in this community, but for the other people who are wrong too. Uh, tonight, we're going to adjourn in a couple of minutes, I hope, <laughs> in, in uh, memory of Ernie Marquez, a longtime resident of this community, went to Santa Monica High School, spent his life, really a lot of his life, looking at the history of early California. His, the cemetery that the film at the start of the meeting talked about 
is only there because of his persistence in recognizing his ancestors. All of us in this community need to recognize this community's ancestors. And, and I, I support everything that I heard tonight. I'm sorry I was being wordy. Council Member Davis, it's your floor. I'd just like to move the item with the amendment that uh, we direct uh, the uh, city manager when dispersing the money to the Black Students Union that we make sure to include uh, students who may be homeschooled and that we raise the amount to 18000 assuming we have that in our bank account and you're nodding yes. So that's the motion. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion about this motion? I would just, See, uh, I, I would just say um, I appreciate everyone on this diocese comments, um, especially um, Council Member De La Torre. Um, I think there's no question that the um, African American experience was unique, and there's a reason why there's a national conversation around reparations. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of other injustices that, that need to be righted, and I would look forward to working with you on whatever it is that, that you are working on. Okay, let's take a vote. Has to be a roll call, because there's money involved. And I'm sorry, I'm fading too. So that we're increasing this to 18,000, uh, 18, and the maker is Councilmember Davis, and I'm sorry, who made the second? Swick. Councilmember De La Torre? Yes. Councilmember Tarosis? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Negrete? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. Councilmember Parr? Yes. Councilmember Zwick? Yes. And Mayor Brock? Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Let's move on to 16G. Item 16G, request of Councilmember Parra and Vice Mayor Negrete that the city manager continue to work in collaboration with Downtown Santa Monica, Inc. to expand entertainment offer offerings to attract residents and visitors to support the city's continued economic recovery. More specifically, the city manager is being asked to partner with DTSM to identify and evaluate opportunities for an entity to operate a roller skating rink for a specified period in 2024 on city-owned property in downtown in a manner that is similar to the popular ice at Santa Monica. Um, okay, so both Councilmember Parr and I enjoyed, um, I think we were doing the lighting of the menorah, but this is something I brought up one of the years when I think the machine was broken and I brought up the idea of why can't we do a roller rink two years ago when it's not a nice rink. Um, and those of you who may not know, um, Council Member Parra still has her roller skates, but um, roller skating roller skating has come back with a vengeance. Um, personally, I did an event out near PV that was really successful um, in the height of COVID that got family members out on roller rink and it was very successful all ages, opportunity to do multiple events around music and whatnot and incorporate the community. So um, we just both were there. It looks really great. It's much bigger now, the ice skating rink, but there's no reason why we can't enjoy it year round. Um, and there was some interest around um, kids taking lessons and after discussing it in great length with the company that does ice, it's really simple for them to use it in that format and just easily switch it over. So. We just thought what a way to continue to have some activity in the downtown area and also it would help spill out over into our business district. It gives opportunity for small vendors to come and sell their food and their products. There's just a lot of opportunity for collaboration. I don't know why I'm talking to you, Nikki, but I feel like I'm just, we're just making eye contact. I'm like selling it to you. I'm sold. <laughs> um, but we, we just thought it would be great to see um, the activity we see during the winter all year long. Council Member Para. Um, yep, so exactly what she said. Um, just a lot of, you know, opportunity there, um, you know, just to, to be able to create some family friendly opportunities in downtown, um, to drive people down, I mean, to Santa Monica, you know, envision like roller boogie, disco parties, you name it, special events, kickoffs. And yes, I do have my 1980s, 90s brown suede roller skates in the back of my car that, that I've been driving them around for two years because I need to get them like oiled up so that I can actually attempt to use them. I kid you not, I could show you them right now. Um, but we're, <laughs> we're really excited about this. Um, we've been talking to city manager, DTSM. It totally looks like it can work and still be able to service uh, downtown uh, Santa Monica 
merchants and what have you. So we're just asking for city manager and staff to um, help us with direction to see if we can make this a reality for summer 2024. And it could very easily transition into ice for um, going into fall. Um, and I'll end with some trivia for you guys. Um, back before La Monica Ballroom on the Santa Monica Pier was torn down in 1962. And for those of you who don't know uh, what La Monica Ballroom was, La Monica Ballroom was opened in 19, oh shit, wrong glasses, in 19, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> in 1924 on the Santa Monica Pier. And it was capable of holding 10,000 dancers, and it's over 15,000 square feet. After a major storm in 1926, it was almost it was almost destroyed the pier and the ballroom, and it needed uh, major repairs. However, you know they did repair it, and uh, before it was torn down, it served as one of the largest roller skating rinks in the Western United States. So it was a roller skating rink on the pier called La Monica from 1958 to 1962. So I say we open La Monica 2.0 at the ice site. Yeah. So I mean, we lost Culver City ice skating rink, um, and a lot of people do rollerblade lessons during off season. Because a lot of people asked about, like, why not just make it an ice skating rink the whole entire season? Well, it's hard to keep it as uh, an ice skating rink when in the hotter months. But yeah. I'm just really happy people are excited about it. Because two years ago, there was everybody, like, everybody, everybody uh, yeah. was saying no, yeah. including DTSM, yeah. about it needs to be a parking lot. So um, I'm just glad that tonight, hopefully, we can get this passed. That's it. Thank My you. mom used to go dancing at La Monica Ballroom. I, was say, that's where Lawrence Wilk played. Mm -hmm. I don't think she listened to him, but yeah, I, I hope she. I hope she didn't. I used to watch my mom. <laughs> dance. My my grandparents used to listen to him. Okay, uh, Council Member Zwick, uh, do you have? Are you're the roller king? And <laughs> <laughs> you have show us your skates. Oh damn yeah, it. I, 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 take me a second to get my sea legs on roller skates, but um, I just wanted to thank the makers of the motion. Um, I think, you know, large surface parking lots in our downtown are, are our dead zones, and, and we want to be filling them with life. And, uh, you know, as, as of now, that's what we have, and this would be a, a really welcome alternative. I'm excited about the work that's been done and, and hope to see it realized. Um, and maybe uh, Mayor Brock can 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 do uh, an item on La Monica in a future session. You can do that. Yeah, that's cool. That's, my mom went there on her second second date with my dad, and then my dad was a security guard there for a while when he first came to LA after he got out of the Marines. Okay, uh, can we vote? On what? You need a motion. I always have little stuff. Is anyone making a motion? Both Council two. Member Negretti or Council yeah. Member Para? Second. Okay, Council Member Parra made the motion. Count, uh, Vice Mayor Negretti seconded the motion. Can we have a, do we need a roll call? No. Uh, oh, thank mind. God. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Okay, we have one more item, or unless we have more. I have one in memoriam that I'd like to give. You guys cannot leave till I finish the in memoriam. Just saying. It's uh, 20, 30 minutes. I don't know. Plus, you're going to hear a Brock and your block episode in the middle about, hey, 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 about Ernie. Uh, we're adjourning in memory of Ernie Marquez this evening. It is with great sadness that we adjourn this council meeting in memory of local historian Ernie Marquez. Ernie devoted much of his adult life to the research, documentation, and preservation of the area's rich local heritage including that of his own pioneering family in Santa Monica. Ernie passed away on January 6, 2024, after a short illness. He was 99 years old. A descendant of Mexican land grantees who owned the 6,700-acre Rancho Boca de Santa Monica, Ernie compiled over 10,000 photographic prints, rare negatives, postcards, and other media that recorded the development of the region's development from the 1860s to 1980s. Ernie Marquez was born in 1924 and grew up in Santa Monica Canyon on a small portion of his family's Mexican land grant. 
He attended Santa Monica High School and enlisted in the U.S. Navy after graduating, serving for four years on an aircraft carrier in the North Atlantic during World War II, battling German U-boats to protect the supply lines to Europe. After the war, he moved to New York, where he became a freelance magazine cartoonist. In 1952, Ernie married Lois Burke, and shortly thereafter, the couple moved back to Southern California. Ernie then began his decades-long career as a graphic designer in the aerospace industry, but also became obsessed with local history, amassing his prized collection of photos and writing or contributing to six books. By the 1980s, Marquez, long interested in his heritage, was ready for another act, retired from his job to dive into his new career as a self-taught researcher and historian. This quest led him to libraries throughout the West, to the National Archives in the nation's capital, and the Hall of Records in Los Angeles. It meant translating documents from Spanish to English, making sense of legalese from centuries past, and researching the provenance of the images and text he found. All this in search of the truth. He had a keen eye when it came to collecting, buying items from thrift shops and other stores across the region, items which were vital to his work. Ernie published six books, including the 2004 book Santa Monica Beach, the 2012 book Memories of Canyon School, 1930 to 1936, and Rancho Boca de Santa Monica in 2021. As for the photographs he collected, Ernie found a home for a vast swath of them in 2014 when the Huntington Library in San Marino acquired 4,600 images he had amassed over a half century, which were described by the curator as the best and most comprehensive collection of its kind in private hands. Ernie was also instrumental in saving his family's cemetery in Santa Monica Canyon, now a historic landmark. It's one of two pieces of land from the original rancho still owned by the Marquez family. Ernie brought a singular focus to preserving his history and still visited the cemetery even in, his even in his final months. In 2019, he received the President's Award from the Santa Monica Conservancy for his commitment to the preservation of Santa Monica's early history and that of the families of the Rancho Boca de Santa Monica. Ernie Marquez earned the respect of academic historians for his work and was described as a self-trained, one-man research library of an archivist and historian. Marquez was predeceased by wife Lois Marquez and son Tommy Marquez. He survived by children Ellen Bonaducci, Monica Marquez, and Ernesto Marquez, as well as two grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. We have lost a great local icon. On behalf of the entire Santa Monica community, we would like to extend our support and deepest condolences to the Marquez family during this difficult time. And I have to add, because I always have to add something about our history, when I was a sophomore at Samohai, going back to Samohai again, uh, he visited his nephew's uh, Spanish class. Forrest Freed was my teacher, and Ernie Marquez spent an hour with us talking about Santa Monica history. It was a marvelous hour. And then four years ago, five years ago, I went to his house and spent four hours with him and recorded a Brock in your block, which, yes, you can still find on YouTube. But, uh, but it was marvelous just to see those memories and see his face come alive as he showed me a postcard or showed me a picture. So I think our entire community will miss Ernie Marquez, and I hope... There are historians doing this for every ethnic community in Santa Monica because we have a rich, cultural, diverse history that we need to celebrate. Thank you. We're adjourning at 1245 AM. I'm sorry I didn't make it out before midnight. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you in February on? February 13th. Huh? February 13th. Before the day before Valentine's this year. Last year it was on Valentine's. Uh, yes, I remember that.